Nana Raguha. Electricity is always there. We don't worry about it. We don't think about it. Never do we think about an attack on the power grid. It is like this all over the world. It is like this in Finland. Turku Energia supplies electricity for hundreds of thousands of people. Because its operations network was independent from IT, an attack could have found its way into the grid and no one would have known until it was too late. By extending the IT network out to operations, Cisco was able to help secure the entire system, both now and in the future. And with Cisco IoT technology, the new virtually fail-proof system is as reliable as it is secure, one unified network. It's why tonight in Turku, Life will go on like it always has and always will. Between on and always on, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every day, every night, everywhere. People are living on the streets. We see it. We all know it's a problem. But what can we do? In Brisbane, Australia, two young mates decided to do something. They would start small. They decided not to call them homeless. They would call them friends. Then, they outfitted a van with a washer, dryer and a shower and hit the streets of Brisbane to wash their friends' clothes. Orange Sky was born. One van quickly became two, then four, then 20. The operation, staff, logistics needed to scale and quickly. So Orange Sky found a partner. Cisco tailored a Meraki network that can grow as they grow. Intuitive dashboards at the head office and robust Wi-Fi in every vehicle let Orange Sky monitor vans and onboard devices remotely via the cloud. Cisco WebEx connects leaders in real time with staff and volunteers, whose energy and enthusiasm is essential to the model's success. What happened? Something wonderful. While friends waited for their clothes to wash and dry, they talked. A simple connection, joining a community, perhaps for the first time in years. If one load of laundry can do that, who knows what's possible? Between cleaning clothes and creating a community, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Electricity is like the air we breathe. It's always there when we need it, which is always. Evergy serves nearly two million commercial, residential, and industrial customers across Kansas and Missouri. Farms, hospitals, businesses, and homes all rely on Evergy to keep the lights on, the food cold, their families warm, and their data safe. So Cisco CX partnered with Converge One, and together they worked with Evergy on a truly radical solution, completely redesigning and revitalizing their network infrastructure by combining Cisco DNA and Cisco ICE. And what typically takes three years was completed in just 18 months. One thing that really stood out is the way Cisco stayed with us through the project. It wasn't just a design, implement, sell, and then move on, but it really was about working together with the teams. Converge One and CX's expertise gave Evergy the stability and flexibility their business demands today, while setting them up for the future with an easier-to-manage infrastructure featuring improved reporting and monitoring. Ensuring electricity and security is there when we need it which is always between lighting the way 
and leading the way. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. I have a lot of ambitious dreams, like making the best tea in Japan and sharing it with the rest of the world. This is Namiki Ishiyama. She grows tea with her family in Ibaraki Prefecture, Japan, on their farm established in 1871. Namiki sells her family's tea online at the marketplace created by Rakuten, a global leader in internet services. Namiki's ambitious dreams may come true sooner than she thinks, because the world is about to change. Rakuten has partnered with Cisco to do something that has never been done before, to build a new mobile network, cloud-based, fully virtualized, and optimized for the coming 5G revolution. This is Tarek Amin, CTO at Rakuten Mobile. My belief is this platform is gonna change everything. This is 5G. More data, more power, new tools we can't yet imagine. Artificial intelligence in the palm of our hand. Making connectivity affordable. I think Rakuten and Cisco is going to do that, and that's going to change the ecosystem of telecommunication in this country and across the world. What will 5G mean to Namiki's tea business? Rakuten and its partner Cisco are excited to find out. My husband and I are sixth generation tea farmers. My son will be the seventh generation. That is my dream. Between tradition and transformation, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And if I didn't find a donor, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I'm Dylan and I'm 22. Three years ago, I joined the registry at Be The Match. It was simple, just swab your mouth and send it in. Be The Match is a global database of donors. To save more lives, they needed to make more matches. So they consulted with technology integrator E+. The solution, cloud-based management made possible by Cisco UCS. Now, Be The Match team members use Cisco WebEx and Contact Center to collaborate with patients, donors, and their critical career network. And their data is secure, protected by Cisco Umbrella Security. Knowing what Max had to go through, what I had to do was easy. One person in the world was a match to me. It's pretty special. The Cisco network allows Be The Match to make matches faster than ever. And that's just the start of what's possible. I am excited to meet Max. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's always going to have a number one fan. Me and Dylan are DNA twins. <laughs> Dylan's like my brother. <laughs> Between a life-threatening disease and a life-altering donation, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. When someone asks, where were you when golf history was made, you don't want to say, at home on my couch. You want to be there. You want that connection. Not just watching history, but part of it. Welcome to the 2019 U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. The first U.S. Open championship in history to bring fully secure course-wide Wi-Fi to fans, players, broadcasters, and event organizers. We're not just talking about players' scores and ball positions. This is intent-based networking, the power of Wi-Fi 6 and data analytics in concert. Delivering super-fast connectivity, real-time video, sharing, wayfinding, and top tracer technology. For any event, any size, anywhere, this is Cisco's legendary network expertise to go. Now everyone, on the course and at home, can be part of the moment. Where were you when history was made? Between the game and the game as you've never known it, there's a bridge. 
Cisco, the bridge to possible. April 16th, 2018. This is Tokyo. This is Rakuten. These are Cisco executives invited to a meeting with Rakuten. This is Tarek Amin, CTO of Rakuten Mobile. This is Prakash Suthar, team leader from Cisco Customer Experience. Namaskar. Good morning. This is a story about doing something that's never been done before. Prakash, I need someone to help me build the world's first end-to-end -end cloud native network. We need a partner. Let's do it. In order for this to work, it has to be optimized for 5G. We'll design it from scratch. Fully automated. Fully virtualized. Cloud. Core. Transport. Virtual RAN. Everything. everything. It will be the first of its kind. Oh, yeah. You can figure it out. We can figure it out. This is their idea. It's an ambitious idea. An unprecedented idea. It's true. But this is what industry executives called it. Impossible. 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 But that didn't stop them. That just made them hungry. So Prakash, how about developers? We'll create a platform. Different systems. Different partners working, working together. together. What else? This is the plane that took the Rakuten team to San Jose. OK, so it takes three weeks to implement a traditional radio site. With automation, we can do it in 10 minutes. And more secure. Zero touch. Zero defect. Ready for 5G. Just upgrade the software. This is Tarek's impressed face. This went on for months. We're going to need new hardware. Then we'll partner with your vendor. But our design? You got it. Then Tarek said. And we want you to manage the whole chain, oversee the integration of vendors and partners. We're on it. February 3rd, 2019. This is Rakuten and Cisco and their impossible idea making their first call. Oh, my God. And the world just changed. Rakuten and Cisco customer experience. The right solutions, the right technology, most importantly, the right people. Between ideas and invention, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every once in a while, an opportunity comes along. A really big opportunity. As in six trillion dollars big. Because that's how much business is shifting to the cloud-native countries and the companies that are capitalizing on Wi-Fi everywhere with security. Like the Netherlands, where smart ports and connected highways are helping alleviate one of the most dense transportation networks in the world. In Italy, performance cars faster and safer. Cisco is digitally transforming their business, the way they work, think, and interact. At Rakuten in Japan, who partnered with Cisco to build the first cloud-based, fully virtualized mobile network, a model for the future of telecommunications around the world. Oh, my God. The hyperfast connections and the wildly transfigured networks they will spawn is going to change everything. And only Cisco has the knowledge, the experience, and the solutions to make it happen. Between the internet that's here and the internet that's coming, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. My name's Ami Tank. I've been at Cisco for 20 years. Grace Girls Home is a girls orphanage in Sri Lanka. We have over 40 girls right now. They come from really difficult backgrounds 
tremendous circumstances, yet they have resilience, you know, they've got passion, and they want to grow up to help others. We provide them with housing, care, food, nutrition, doctors, mental health care, dental visits, and all of that. I am the chief of staff, and I manage the board. There's so many ways that technology can be used to end poverty, to help these girls. One is through online education, but we need a way to track it, to manage it, to work with the girls, and to continually kind of improve on it. When you allow a girl to stand on her own two feet, either through education, opportunity, exposure, whatever, you can raise a community. My mom, who has just recently passed away, she lived and grew up in pure poverty. She always persevered. Before she passed away, she said, you've got to continue to give in life because that's the purpose of life. That to me is really what inspires me. One girl said to me, promise me when you leave here, you'll be my voice. And I told her, I said, when I leave here, I'm going to tell everybody about you. Between Sri Lanka's lost girls and a future full of opportunity, there's a me tank. My name is Roy Vessel. I've been at Cisco for 12 years. Outside of Cisco, I work in teaching cybersecurity and cyber defense to youth through a program called Cyber Patriot and through the United States Air Force Civil Air Patrol. I took the team over and fell in love with it. We start at the age of 12, work all the way through high school. I want them to know how to take care of themselves and protect their information, protect themselves, protect their families. We've got kids that have graduated through my program that are now working for the government. Uh, I've got folks that are working in corporations looking for cyber threats and how do we prevent them. Cisco's been heavily involved. If you have something that you have on your heart um, or passion that you want to reach out and do, talk to your manager. The satisfaction of seeing uh, these kids grow, uh, seeing those light bulbs go off, that's my payment. Between curious kids and the future of cybersecurity, there's Roy Vestal. My name is uh, Lucy, uh, it's uh, my English name. A Chinese name is Xiu Fan. I come from Beijing, China. Uh, I have been uh, working in Cisco for 19 years. I'm a sales manager in customer experience team. I think Cisco is really a great company. Cisco support us giving back live days. We have some energy, we, we have the eager from the heart. So everybody, when they, when they know what I'm doing, they, they just uh, raised hand. Lucy, <laughs> give me a chance, I want to join. I can make something happen. I work for the Green and Shine Foundation uh, since six years ago. They had a lot of program, but the major program is support rural uh, teacher and the rural children for the reading program. The children really need resources to support them and to get the learning capability to support their future. We actually leverage Cisco some technology like WebEx. Uh, we, we provide some training to the teacher. They can, you know, improve their skill and their reading knowledge, and they can know the world better. I think the together uh, we have a big power. Is uh, not only one or two children can benefit from that. I'm proud of that. Between rural school kids and a universe of learning, there's Lucy Guo. Okay, give it a try. Between wisdom and curiosity, there's a bridge. Between ideas and inspiration, trauma and treatment. Gained a couple of more pounds since last time. That's good for the baby. Between the people and their leaders. It's been very busy. It was busier today than yesterday. When are you going to come back? Collaboration. And we have, like, in the center. And creativity. You don't want that sketch to compete with the image. Between the moments that make us who we are. Now we and keeping them safe. 
private That's great. and secure. There's WebEx. Welcome back to Cisco Live 2020. You're here on the Innovation Channel with me, your host, Reginald Lige, and my co-host. Hey, guys. This is Stephanie Chan. It is super nice to see everyone again. So, guys, over the past day, we've had over 124,000 people gather with us online for the first day of our first ever all-digital Cisco Live, the largest ever only global Cisco event experience that we've had, oh my God, in what, 30 years? I mean, we've had people from all across the globe. We have 53 people registering for Cisco Live for the first time. So welcome back to all of our newcomers. We've recently unveiled our new purpose, which is powering an inclusive future for all. And it has never been a better time for that. I mean, when we think about what's happening in the community with the COVID-19 pandemic, how the world around us has changed overnight, Businesses have gone from working on site to working remotely. Hospitals have been overrun and Cisco has been at the forefront of enabling a new tomorrow, a new future. With our donations over $500 million towards COVID-19, Cisco has planned to see it as a leader in this pandemic. And not only that, but seeing how our world has been shaken underneath us, or at least revealed to us with all the racial injustices happening across America with the Black Lives Movement. And how Cisco, once again, because of our, our new mission, our always mission, we've stepped to the forefront as a leader there. And it really speaks to the heart of what Cisco is, a company of a diverse group of people powering not only technology, but the world around us. And Steph, this means so much not only to me being a black man in America, but I know it means a lot to everyone around the world because of what it represents for the company. What do you think? It really does. Um, I mean, more than just the funds that Cisco is putting out, it really is the public stance that Chuck is taking, that Cisco is taking, that the employees are taking every single day to push for equality. And Cisco actually uh, just recently committed another $5 million to fight racism and discrimination to places like the Equal Justice Initiative, NAACP uh, Defense Fund, Color of Change, and even Cisco's own fund for fighting racism and discrimination. Um, and all of this even ties into Pride Month. Uh, right, Reggie? Yeah, it does. You know, this month is Pride Month, and not only does it matter because Cisco's new purpose is about power inclusive for all. And Cisco has always been at the forefront of being a representative and an ally of the LGBTQ community. And this is apparent every day with how Cisco shows up and powers an inclusive future with our technology and with our well, you can put it at our heart. I mean, I don't want to get all savvy and touchy filly, but <laughs> that's what it is. So, but Steph, we want to get to what else is powering Cisco, which is the keynote today, which is the new world is now. We have Todd Nightingale, Jonathan Davidson, Lisa Tony, and Avio Barrios. And they will also be covering another session, which we'll have in Meraki, applications, app dynamics, discovering how machine learning and AI will improve customer experience, and more. And not only that, but we have some special performances that we can't tell you about just yet. But Stephanie, how can you tell us how the people can stay connected? Um, you guys are all at home, but there are plenty of ways that you guys can stay connected and stay involved. Um, take our Q&As. Uh, the live Q&As are on the website. They're do happening during the live sessions. And once the session is over, you can head over to the WebEx team space, keep asking your questions, trivia and polls. You can use your social media account to play trivia games and test your knowledge on all things Cisco Live and Cisco. Of course, take our surveys after each, each session because feedback is super essential for us and participate on social media using hashtag Cisco Live on Twitter and Instagram. 
Um, and yeah, we are going to join right now to the keynote. This is with, of course, which Reggie said, Liz Santoni, Jonathan Davidson, Alvio Berrios. Um, we are going to be hearing about the new world is now Todd Nightingale as well. Um, and this is all about the new norm, which we can all definitely relate to. We will see you guys right after. Please enjoy the session. Are you ready for this? Spark is lit. Yeah. With your wit. Keep it fit. It gets faster. More demand. It never quit. New ideas need the right partners and the right toolkit. Mm, let's connect. Get empowered. Groove in every dialect. Let's inspire. We can help you take it higher. That's legit. Ooh, this is it. Possibilities. Inspiration hits. Spark is lit. You're about to change the world with your wit. New ideas need the right partners and the right toolkit. Who lets you net? Get it power back in every dialect. The ID inside possibilities. This is it. day two of Cisco Live. We are so excited to be with all of you here virtually at our very first ever fully virtual Cisco Live US. We're honored you've spent, you've chosen to spend your time with us today. We have an exciting agenda for you. My name is Todd Nightingale. I look after the enterprise networking and cloud group here at Cisco, and I'm excited to get to share some important technology updates and customer stories with all of you. As you know, we are still social distancing, and, and I'm here in my house in San Francisco on my rooftop, sheltered in place. It's beautiful, and, and San Francisco is a city I love and, and, and I live in, and, and San Francisco is, in fact, Cisco's namesake, so maybe it's important uh, that I am presenting from here today. Uh, but San Francisco is also one of the many, many cities around the world which, is, which have posted rallies and protests to fight for social justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. At Cisco, this conversation has become incredibly important as we demonstrate empathy and support for all of our communities, especially the historically disenfranchised. Two weeks ago, Chuck postponed Cisco Live. Chuck postponed this event, our most important annual event. And I truly believe that was the right thing to do. With so much turmoil and pain, it would not have been right to have Cisco Live on that day. Instead, we've been having weekly check-ins with the company to discuss social justice. And those discussions have been enormously valuable in bringing our community together and giving people a moment to reflect on what matters most. I believe the most important thing we can do right now is to care deeply for everyone. I believe technology can be a democratizing force in our communities and an empowering force for our teams. I believe that is why it is so important to focus on Cisco's purpose, just as we heard from Chuck yesterday, to power an inclusive future for all. To realize this purpose, I think we have to understand that this is a new world with new challenges. In the wake of the COVID uh, pandemic, Cisco sent its entire company home in just days. And we've continued to operate in that virtual model ever since. It was an enormous, enormous feat, and Cisco's technology groups made it possible. And to be honest, many of our teams are operating just as efficient, if not more efficiently now than they ever have. And for, for all of us, really, these changes are not just personal, but they're professional as well. On the, on the professional side, you can see at Cisco, we've been having check-ins with social justice experts, and there's a picture of that up here on the slide. On a personal front, my team, we've been having virtual happy hours. We have wine and WebEx Wednesdays. I even met my nephew for the very first time over WebEx, and, and there's a picture of him up there too. There's this enormous change that we have to enable in technology groups around the world. And in IT, we all know we do not have the luxury of moving fast and breaking things. We have to move fast without breaking things in order to enable the schools and governments and companies that we all support to do their very best. And over the past few months, I have seen remarkable feats from technology groups around the world. Your teams have truly risen to the occasion. 
Regions Bank has more than 1,500 locations across the country. And after just a single service rep tested positive for COVID-19, management made the decision to move to a purely virtual environment. They worked closely with Cisco and leveraged the Meraki uh, VPN and SD-WAN portfolio, deploying thousands of MX68s in order to run a purely virtual extended home office practically overnight. The simplicity of the Meraki platform made that possible and, and real effort from the region's technology team made that a reality. Uh, I think it was a really remarkable feat. There have been heroics uh, across healthcare, across healthcare workers and healthcare groups around the world. Um, but I think really one of the most remarkable ones I saw uh, was at the UK National Health Service, where they've been popping up enormous hospitals, what they call field hospitals, uh, in order to serve COVID-19 patients. In fact, the NHS Nightingale is a 4,000 bed field hospital where they deployed the entire hospital in nine days and they built out the network in only seven days. And it was a hospital built at the London Excel Convention Center specifically for COVID-19 patients already on a ventilator. It was a remarkable solution. They were able to build it thanks to all of the catalyst networking technology and DNA to deploy the network. Um, they provided guest portal and uh, really best in class connectivity, both for the patients as well as the healthcare workers. I think this type of agility, this kind of reaction 4,000 bed field hospital developed in only seven days. Is It's a remarkable feat of technology. It's the kind of uh, passion that technology groups around the world are, are really demonstrating and, and a unique way to leverage Cisco technology. As we look at the way our teams are reacting, we realize that it's not just the reaction to this pandemic, but it's preparing for what comes next. This is not just a moment in time. We're not going back to the world of yesterday. There is a new world ahead of us. And I've seen companies making enormous strides in preparing for what comes next. Fannie Mae is an amazing example. They know that they need to move their business to the cloud, and they've been shifting to Office 365 and WebEx and OneDrive in order to do that. And they were struggling with the traditional hub-and-spoke MPLS WAN. And by using Cisco's SD-WAN technology, the Vitella and vManage portfolio, They've been able to shift their entire organization over to broadband and get dramatically better performance. They were able to shift their applications and their user experience over to zero trust model using Duo. And now they are really set up as they do come back to the office to run in a much more efficient and cloud first world. And this is one of the most interesting examples uh, I've really seen to date. And that's at Caterpillar. Caterpillar deploys some of the most sophisticated networks in the most rugged areas in the world. These are networks that have to be truly, truly reliable and redundant in every possible way because these industrial sites are becoming more and more autonomous. These are dangerous places. And by running these sites with fewer and fewer people, they can really dr drive a much, much better safety record. That means having the most reliable networks in the world. At Cisco, we just recently announced our acquisition of Fluid Mesh Networks. And by using Fluid Mesh, Caterpillar is able to deploy a dramatically, truly best-in-class, most reliable network in the world. The Fluid Mesh technology is incredible. And really all of Cisco's industrial networking technology, it is the most reliable, most hardened networking technology in the world. Caterpillar is really pushing the limits on how to deploy this stuff. And I hope you all get to go and, and see some of the industrial networking uh, innovation from Cisco. I think there's this, there's this reality about what comes next. For years, IT groups and technology groups, yours and mine, we've been measured how, by how powerful and how flexible our solutions uh, can be. But I believe this is a new world and the new IT superpower is agility. How fast can we re react? How reusable is the technology that we're buying? This agility is really built a real combination of insights and automation. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I'm really excited that we just announced the acquisition of Thousand Eyes at Cisco just a few days ago. Thousand Eyes is a really remarkable company, I think, that in really embodies this idea of agility. Thousand Eyes provides really best in class internet intelligence. It can allow us to have unique insights into what's happening across the entire internet, across public and private networks. 
and it can really drive the employee experience while they are working at home or back in the office or traveling abroad. Thousand Eyes provides technology that's truly agile, and I think it's really, really unique. Uh, we just announced this acquisition, so I'm very excited to show you more of this as we close the deal and, and move Thousand Eyes into Cisco. But today, I'm really excited to show you Cisco, homegrown Cisco technologies that are making a difference and really providing insights and automation, best in class agility. I don't wanna to try to do the demos up here, so I'm gonna head downstairs to my dining room and we'll uh, do the demos from there. Let's do it. Right now, I just wanna take you through a, a small taste of what we're gonna be delivering and what we're gonna be announcing through Cisco Live. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about it, so let's dive in. The first one is Nexus Dashboard. It's our data center portfolio all of the management, all of the analytics, all of the automation and insights have come from a host of different Cisco products, Network Insights, uh, Multi-Site Orchestrator, a whole host of different platforms. And today we're announcing Nexus Dashboard, which brings all of these different platforms, all of these different products together into one cohesive platform. Nexus Dashboard represents the state of the art, the most powerful data center networking management platform ever created. It is a incredibly exciting uh, release for us here at Cisco because it brings together so much, so many products and so much functionality and really delivers these insights and this ability to automate your data center networks around the world. Okay, so let's dive in. Here is the Nexus dashboard, a single platform to manage all of my data center networking uh, management technology. Now, I can log in, I, I quickly see everything that's new in this version, which is, uh, which is great. And I can see there's quite a, quite a bit that's been added recently. And immediately I get a complete view of what's happening on the dashboard and all the sites that are being managed. And it is um, super easy to get this, including utilization on CPU and memory and all of that stuff. I can take a look here at the different sites being managed and you can see I've got uh, easy access to them as well. Information about the sites uh, comes up quickly. And of course I can add sites uh, for my different data center managers to be able to manage all through Nexus dashboard through all of the modules. Uh, it's incredibly easy. It's a single platform and it has a whole host of functionality behind it. In fact, I can go here to the apps and I can see all of the different modules that I already have installed. I have multi-site orchestrator, network advisor, and network resources. So if I launch, multi-site orchestrator, you can see I'm, what I'm gonna get is a quick view of the, all the fabrics running. I only have one right now, but just by uh, hovering over, I get quick information about that fabric. And you can see how powerful this stuff is. It's all available in one place. And I quickly can see different types of critical events, major, minor, warning, etc. The orchestrator, of course, gives amazing ability to push out configuration, to push out operational, uh, control to all the different APIC controllers and DCNM controllers around the world. And interesting, what, what's really funny, one of the number one questions I get about data center management is in firmware management, and all your firmware management can be done right uh, from multi-site orchestrator, part of Nexus dashboard. You can add images here and push them out to all of the uh, different uh, fabrics around the world. Uh, Nexus dashboard has a whole host of other functionality and I really want you to make sure that you go back, take a look at the Scott Harrell demo because the functionality in this stuff is amazing. You can see in Network Insights Advisor, different information about all of the different uh, technical advisories on all of the different fabrics you have around the world, all brought into one place, all available on Nexus dashboard. So please take a look. It's incredibly, incredibly valuable information here. Next up, SD-WAN and, and cloud security. And I think we have one of the most exciting releases at Cisco Live coming on in this space. For years, we have had best-in-class secure SD-WAN with AMP and, and full security uh, features available both on the Meraki MX platform and on the Viptela platform on ISRs. But right now we are linking in a really unique way, our cloud security suite with Umbrella and SIG, Secure Internet Gateway, and our Viptela suite. And we do that by building a full, full tunnel from your SD-WAN appliance from, uh, through vManage and the vEdge uh, functionality out to Umbrella and SIG. And this is a really amazing way to give complete automation in setting all of this up 
and then real amazing insights from that umbrella uh, functionality on the security side and of course the vManage stuff on the network side. So let's take a quick peek. If I flip over here to my vManage dashboard, you can see, of course, on vManage, I get incredible insights across the board. And I can see that I have a, a very healthy network here. So demo team did, did a great job setting this up for me. It's very nice. But if I wanted to provision my uh, San Jose headquarters for direct tunnel to Umbrella, and I want to run my security policy on Umbrella, it is really uh, incredibly easy to do. I can come here and bring up the templates. And then on the feature template side, I can quickly look up those SIG templates. Now, uh, there's only two templates I have to deal with. I have my credentials template and my tunneling template. And they're, they're very straightforward. In fact, if I go here and open up the credential template, you can see that I need just you know, my basic credentials uh, to log in here. But I actually don't even have to copy and paste these from anywhere, pull them over. I can get those templates right off of my smart licensing system and pull those credentials down so that I, you know it's the most secure possible way and it's also easier to do if i the other sig template is uh my tunneling and the tunneling template is also incredibly powerful in that i can very easily come here open this up and set up my tunnel direct to the umbrella head end and it gives me a primary and a backup uh tunnel for doing that which which makes for really a very reliable connection. And that's what we want, right? We want all of our sites to be tunneled back to Umbrella in the, in the simplest possible way. And here you see, I've got a primary and a, and a backup interface, which is exactly what we need. So this is what gives me that tunnel out to Umbrella. And if I, if I then go in and log into my Umbrella dashboard, then you'll see that this site, the San Jose site is now fully connected. It's on board and I can start to get full visibility from the umbrella dashboard and I can even see this fabric online. So here in the overview on the umbrella dashboard, you see all of the uh, data coming in. I can see all the DNS requests and proxy requests, everything that I would expect from my umbrella security uh, deployment, but I get this really interesting uh, visibility. So number one, I can see the tunnel that we just created from our San Jose campus. Here you see San Jose headquarters and it's just coming online, so it should be active any second. And the second thing is now that that is active, I get access to all of this deployment health and all of this data straight off of the Umbrella dashboard. It's very exciting. And I, I think this automation between, this really clean automation between Viptela and the full tunnel to the Umbrella Cloud give us best-in-class SD-WAN and best-in-class security. And the last piece, the last piece I wanna talk about is the Meraki dashboard. We all know of Meraki as the simplest possible infrastructure to deploy uh, best-in-class networking technology and, and cloud management. Um, but there's still levels of insights that we can be adding to this portfolio. And, and it's really, it's important that we do. Um, our IT groups, especially in these times of change, are constantly being asked to ensure that our connections, our VPNs, our, our clients, our, our, and our users are being cared for in the best possible way. In order to do that, we've over time, we've built out Meraki Wireless Health and Meraki Insight, really SD-WAN Health. And now, for the first time, we're really talking about client health and network-wide health embedded right into the Meraki dashboard. I just want to show you just a small piece of it, and please go take a look at Chris Story's uh, Meraki session at Cisco Live because there's, there's so much more to see here. But... Here is a, a simple Meraki network uh, that we set up just for Cisco Live. And of course you get all the data you would expect to see, all of the overview, you've got how much data by each client, how much data for each application. I can see how much WebEx and Netflix are running on this account. I don't know why there's so much Netflix, but so be it. But if I get a call from a user, uh, let's say Jason just called me and he's having a problem with his connection uh, I can quickly pull up his client and, of course, see what's going on. You know, th this, this client view has always been there, but there's a key addition uh, which was just added recently. Of course, I get all of the basic information you would notice about the client, but here in the current connection, I can actually see that his client is connected to this access point, is connected to this switch, and each step along the way, I can see that his connection is fine. In fact, I get the green checkbox and I know that it's working. Now, if he's having a problem or he had a problem and everything's working, uh, it must not be happening anymore. And this is a very common problem that people have. If I click here into the history though, and this is the new tab, which we're just releasing now on the, on the platform, 
you can see not just the status right now, but what has happened in the past. And you can see, in fact, he did have a problem, a failed connection um, in the gym lobby, a failed connection in the gym area. And if I double click, I can see, you know what, that was an SNR problem, signal to noise problem, which means almost certainly I have a coverage issue down there. And that's what he's dealing with. He's not able to connect every, in every part of his building because we don't have perfect coverage. And that, that's his really amazing insight. It's historical. It, it pulls all sorts of data and analytics to drive just the insight you need. And this is, this is the key here, is driving this kind of insight so that we can provide the best type of automation in order to help resolve it. And we can really bring this infrastructure in the most agile possible way. I hope you go and take a look at all of the other sessions, all the technical sessions and deep dives into data center, into SD-WAN and Umbrella, in, in, into Meraki. I want you to know that at Cisco, we are truly committed to providing you the most agile, the most flexible, the most reactive infrastructure in the world. And we believe that we can do that by providing best-in-class insights through all of our platforms and best-in-sight automation to allow you to adapt. I can't wait to see what you and all of your teams do with this amazing technology. And thank you so much for the time. And now I'd like to hand things over to Liz Santoni, someone who I've worked an amazing amount uh, with oh, in just the last couple months in my new job. And I, I can't even believe I haven't actually seen her in two months. Uh, here's, here it is, over to you, Liz. Thanks, Todd. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Santoni. I run our Emerging Technologies and Incubation Group. You know, life's quite different than it was just even a few months ago. It feels like we're living in this all digital, all the time world. So it's become even more critical to be able to deliver the best end user experience. It's like our digital connection is almost as important as the air we breathe. But before I go down that path, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the incredible work that you've been doing. Because almost overnight, you've enabled so many of us to work remotely. You've kept critical infrastructure up and running. You've ensured business continuity. And for that, we want to say a big thank you. And at Cisco, we've been privileged to be able to work side by side with you, like we've done at Skylakes Medical. They're a hospital in Southern Oregon that actually services a 75 mile radius. And when this pandemic hit, they had to scramble to set up new critical care services. And their IT team was instrumental to help them be able to do that. And at Cisco, we brought along our Hyperflex solutions, Cisco's networking and Cisco's collaboration technology to help them do that. Another example that I'd like to talk about is that of geographic solutions. Now they manage unemployment benefits across four states and overnight, they went from 1,000 users a day to 60,000 users a day. Their IT department had to help them scale. They used Hypoflex as well as Intersight, which is our management as a service platform. We're proud, we're privileged to work side by side with you. As we shelter at home, there are so many things that we expected to do in person, like going to the doctor, going to the grocery store, seeing our friends, celebrating birthdays, seeing new babies. We're almost used to doing that digitally. And even as businesses open up and we think about going back to the office, we expect that our dependence on digital services and applications is going to continue to grow. And just four months ago, we were talking to you about these stats. Applications are going to grow by about 50% in the next two years. Half of those applications are going to be built using microservices. And an application today has about 20 dependencies. Last year, that was about eight. And we were debating, is this two years, three years, or is it one year? Fast forward to today, one in three of you are telling us that you're gonna be spending more on app development and the cloud. And how apps are developed, how they're deployed, is continuing to change. This image that you're seeing in front of you is a service mesh of 1,600 microservices that are communicating with each other over a multi-cloud infrastructure, over 9,300 unique connections. This is an application of a fully online bank that has no brick and mortar. It is disrupting an entire industry. It's the face of a modern business. 
And the cloud powers so much of that because the cloud brings in scale. It brings in this agility. It brings in flexibility. It brings in velocity of new capabilities. The cloud powers a lot of new possibilities. But we all know that it takes more than that to be able to deliver the best end user experience. It takes your entire environment on premises, in the private cloud, as well as the public cloud. So it's not just about a place. It's not just about a destination. We believe it should be about an operating model, an operating model that actually gives you visibility from the application all the way down to the infrastructure. So you can address issues before it impacts end user experience. Your teams don't have to work in silos anymore. They're connected because they're seeing the same data sets. They're talking the same vocabulary, but still using the tools that their jobs require them to do. And IT is seen as actually delivering business outcomes. And I want to show you how we're actually doing that by using a couple of use cases. To do that, I'm going to go to the App Dynamics dashboard. Now, App Dynamics is our industry leading APM solution. Here, App Dynamics is monitoring the next gen financial app, which is a fictional app. Now, like all businesses, this business is using a web and mobile app to be able to sell their products and services. App Dynamics monitors all the critical pieces in that application. And here, as you look at it, you see that there's some issue with insurance codes. And a double click actually takes us down to the issue may be in discount services, where you see while discount services overall is showing green, there's an issue with next-gen financial VM3 and VM4. Now, if you recall, these were the same VMs that you could see in the AppD dashboard. Now, with most other APM tools, this would be it. There would be no more visibility. And it's most likely that fingers would be pointed at the infrastructure operations team. But we've actually resolved for that. We've integrated AppD along with Intersight. I'm going to go into the Intersight dashboard. Now, Intersight, as I've talked about before, is a management as a service platform. And what you're seeing on the left is a dependency graph. I'm in the workload optimizer view of Intersight. And that dependency graph actually shows you the relationship between the different entities from the application all the way down to the infrastructure elements. A couple of double clicks actually will get me to the next gen financial application. Now, so how does Intersight Workload Optimizer build this dependency graph? Actually makes API calls to each and every one of those entities, learns its nearest dependency, so collects, connects, correlates that information, and builds out this comprehensive dependency graph. And here, while it's showing me that the business application is green, there's yellows on both the app server and the VMs. This is because the Workload Optimizer also has a very powerful recommendation engine, which takes into consideration performance and capacity constraints. It looks at historical information and actually can flag potential issues. So I'm going to click on the VMs to understand what exactly is the issue. And here, what it's showing me is that both VMs have memory congestion issues, and it actually makes a recommendation of increasing it by 1 GB to bring it back to optimal performance. So I'm going to go back to the AppD dashboard. And here, as we see, it's all green. Now, that was just one use case. I want to take us to another use case around how do I optimize my resources in a hybrid environment? And for this, I want to go back into the Workload Optimizer tool. So I'm back in the Intersight Workload Optimizer view. But this time, we're looking at a hybrid view of the dependencies that span across on-prem as well as the cloud. I want to double click on the VMs. And what it shows me is there's some actions that are associated with it with different levels of criticality. A double click on the yellow actions, I'm going to pick one that's related to the cloud. And here it's providing a recommendation that changing the instance type will actually help reduce cost. Now, we all know that optimizing for the cloud brings its own set of challenges. For example, there are so many new instance types that come out. And they're curated for storage bandwidth, network bandwidth, storage capacity, compute capacity. And you have to make do with what's available. Now, you pick for the most optimal environment when you're deploying your application. Workload Optimizer 
helps you keep that optimal environment through the entire life cycle as your application changes as well. Now, these are just a couple of examples that I showed you. There's a lot more capabilities that helps your app teams and your infrastructure teams come together in a closed loop operating model. It's like we've made the infrastructure dynamic to meet the needs of an ever changing application experience. Now we also know as apps are distributed, so are the IT teams. So we took Intersight and have now have a mobile app version of it. It's available in demo mode, both in the Apple App Store, as well as in the Android App Store. Please check it out. We're bringing visibility. We're bringing insights. We're making recommendations so that you can simplify your environment, move with speed, and optimize your environment through the ever-changing needs of an application. We're living in a world of shifting conditions where we lack predictability, but we're gonna be there side by side with you. So now I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Liz. I am Jonathan Davidson, and I lead the Mass Scale Infrastructure Group here at Cisco, which is responsible for mobility, optical, cable, routing, automation, as well as optics for the whole company. I'm very excited to be here with all of you today at Cisco Live, and I'm very excited to be able to share with you all of the great innovations that the MIG team has been building over the past several years. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump right in because I got a lot to share. Before we can get into that, though, I want to share a little bit about what we've seen happening over the past several months, specifically since the pandemic started and people have been sheltering in place or quarantining. We have seen a dramatic growth in public peering traffic around the growth, anywhere from 13 percent all the way upwards over to 30 percent uh, across the globe. And in fact, we've seen even upwards over 30 percent in certain parts of the world. Now, certain customers have shared with us that they have seen dramatic growth. Cox shared with us that they saw a 15 to 20% increase in downstream traffic on their access network, but they saw almost a 40% increase in traffic going up from our homes out into the internet. Facebook shared with us that they saw over a thousand percent increase in video calling and video messaging. Well, our partners at Verizon share with us that in a single 24 hour period, they had 9 billion text messages. That's a lot of messages. Now, we see anecdotally across the world the fact that humans are using the network in all sorts of new ways to stay connected during this pandemic. And a huge thank you out to all of the first responders for everything you're doing to keep us safe. What has become really apparent is that what we're building here as service providers, as hyperscale providers, is critical infrastructure. It requires massive scale. It requires that it be completely trustworthy. And this is not just for the service providers and the web scale and hyperscalers. This is for those in finance and healthcare because we want to be able to do telehealth from home, those in the government and transportation. It's critical that we have trustworthy communication capabilities to make sure that we can stay connected during this time, not just for business, but for virtual birthday parties and virtual cocktail hours, which I know have been really important for me to stay connected to my family and friends as well. Now, we have been innovating for the past four years. In fact, we spent over a billion US dollars over the past four years to build this innovation for you, specifically around silicon, software, optics, as well as the systems which pull all of these technologies together. So let me share with you a bit about first Cisco Silicon One. I could not be more excited to share with you this building block, this fundamental building block that's going to power the future of the internet. You know, the team started with a completely clean sheet design. They wanted to take the best of switching silicon and the best of routing silicon. The best of switching around bandwidth, maximal bandwidth capabilities, as well as serious power efficiencies. They wanted the best of routing silicon. Specifically, they wanted to be able to cover these big buffers as well as massive feature sets, bring those together 
with two times the bandwidth and three times the packets per second of our next nearest competitor. That's exciting. Not only that, but it's the first routing silicon to completely break through the 10 terabit per second barrier. Very exciting technology that we're able to share with you. We completely reimagined iOS XR7 because we knew this new piece of silicon needed a new reimagined and rethought out iOS XR7, which is the world's number one network operating system, which powers the majority of the world's internet infrastructure. But we knew that it could still be simplified. It could be modernized with new open APIs and new access to cloud enhancement. And third, we knew, although it was already the high bar for trustworthiness and security, that we knew we could raise that up and create a whole new level of trustworthiness. What did we achieve? Well, we achieved a piece of software that uses 50% less memory, 50% faster boot time, and 40% smaller image sizes. This is real outcomes that you can take to the bank. And so we knew that we could enhance iOS XR7 with the cloud. And the way I like to think about it is XR7. XR was used to build the first version of the cloud. The cloud actually is now being used to build the next version of the internet with iOS XR7 and these three new key cloud technologies. The first of which is Cisco Crosswork Networks Insights, which tracks over 300 million BGP routes in real time. So you know what's happening across the global internet with simply a click of your mouse. Second, you can understand what's happening with your network in real time with regards to trust with Cisco Crosswork Trust Insights. And then third, Cisco Crosswork Qualification Environment helps you qualify new hardware and new software utilizing cloud-based technologies. And let me share with you a little bit about each of those technologies. Trust Insights has three key use cases. The first is to help you understand the security capabilities and software reporting of every single XR element inside of your infrastructure. The second is it helps you understand the trustworthiness and reporting and auditing in real time inside of your infrastructure. And the third is you can have an immutable source of truth forensically to identify what's happening for the entire life cycle of your hardware. Now, most of our customers are keeping their hardware in the network for seven to 10 years. So what's happening with that blade in year one, year five, and year seven? This product will help you understand that. And it comes with iOS XR7. Third, last but not least, is crosswork qualification environment. One of the big pain points I've heard from our customers is the amount of time it takes to qualify a new software version before they can get it into their network. But well, we wanted to dramatically reduce that time, which I call time to value. And we did this by enabling you to upload a live configuration that you're running in your infrastructure, and we will dynamically build you a test plan, which you can then run in the cloud, or you can actually tie it back to your own lab and run it on your own infrastructure, which means that instead of manually testing things and perhaps missing what might be a bug causing an outage, you're actually able to test it in real time utilizing our cloud-based service. So you have the confidence to deploy software very rapidly, which brings us to pulling all of these things together into an entirely new portfolio, which we call the Cisco 8000 series. It is a series of fixed platforms and modular platforms. The fixed platforms completely break the amount of bandwidth per RU, 10.8 terabits in a single rack unit platform. Also, we are able to get up to 260 terabits in our 18 slot platform. That's 14.4 terabits per slot. Amazing accomplishment what the team has been able to do. And I'm humbled to be able to share it with all of you today. Now it's one thing for me to talk about it. What I'd like to do is play a video from Kevin Smith, who's the VP of planning at our partner Verizon. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. It is a very exciting time to be part of the network team at Verizon right now. Verizon is in the midst of leading the fourth industrial revolution. We are rapidly deploying our 5G network across the country, enabling new capabilities that will drive the need for unprecedented capacity and next generation architectures. These new capabilities are leading us to relook at scale, reliability, and programmability across very diverse locations like our access, edge, and core facilities. 
While Verizon continues to drive unprecedented scale and capability, we are also driving an overall simplification of the network. This includes things like optimized photonic connectivity and centralized path computation. Cisco has been a strategic partner of Verizon for many years and continues that tradition with the introduction of the Cisco 8000 platform. This new platform takes into account many of the key attributes of the network of the future, which includes scaling from very small to very large locations, cost per bit, and advanced routing protocols. Thank you, and back to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that and for the continued partnership with Verizon. And with that, I would like to go ahead and pass the baton on to my good friend, Alvio Berrios, responsible for CX here in the Americas. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, hello, Cisco Live 2020. It's great to be back here with you guys. Uh, my name is Alvio Barrios. I lead customer experience at Cisco for the Americas. And I was actually here last year talking to you about transformation. So at Cisco, we have been on this journey to help our customers through their digital transformation on our own by providing a lot more proactive and predictive services to our customers. The objective is to improve the overall customer experience. And when we think of digital transformation, we think of many things, but the, the top things that come to mind are, you know, operational efficiency, business agility, new business models, new customer experience, new revenue models as well. Uh, it could be many things, but ultimately, or all of them, uh, by a matter of what, by a matter of fact, uh, ultimately we're focused on three areas primarily. One is how do we give you more control of your network? And the way we do this is through insights and analytics, whether we do it through our cloud capabilities or through our you know, software controllers in the networks. Number two is how do we help you transform? And the way that we do that is through automation. So that we actually give you more time for you to innovate and drive your business models. And the last area that we focus on is about time to value. And the third one was about life cycle services and how do we help you accelerate your time to body. COVID-19 happened and we're still going through it as the world is going through it and definitely has accelerated this journey to transformation because business is not as usual anymore. Across every industry, IT strategy is now the business strategy. And winners and losers will be determined by how quickly they can adapt to take advantage of the new challenges and opportunities. And to succeed in this area, we must have flexible IT infrastructures, find valuable insights in data and applications to improve experience and performance, and proactively deal with cyber threats as well working remotely and over digital. Ultimately, it's about cloudification of our businesses and providing a rich digital experience anytime, anywhere, and on any device. The trends accelerating this business transformation, we're all experiencing them whether we're working remotely or telemedicine and remote learning, which are now a reality, and ultimately moving our apps and workloads to clouds and leveraging automation to do that efficiently. And it's about connecting a user to an application in a secure way. We have been working with many of you during this period of time on deploying and implementing many of these solutions to address the needs of the current situation. But I want to share with you a specific experience that we had with University of Maryland Medical Systems. If we do nothing, the numbers are catastrophic and the curve goes straight up like this and it overwhelms the healthcare system. We have 13 hospitals under our care. We needed a partner we could trust like never before. Lives depended on it. We asked Ben, what do you need? We pulled in teams across the company, including sales, customer experience, the business unit, and partners. But we only ever worked as one team. There is a sudden spike in coronavirus cases in With Maryland. Seven, we're hearing from some of the doctors who are treating patients inside this Wow, what an achievement. But that's just the start. We had so much more to do. Baltimore opens its first field hospital, which is the now. Maryland Medical System will operate 250 beds to help those who are recovering from COVID-19. Having Cisco CX at the front end of everything we were doing was absolutely critical to success. Thank you. 
Goodbye. We were there supporting our partnership, but just as important, our community. It's simply our culture. It's who we are. Cisco stood side by side with us for two months. Trust was everything. Between a safe distance and a required connection, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. That is amazing work that, you know, University of Maryland is doing with your 14 hospitals. But many of you are doing great work uh, in similar situations. But as we went through it and we created specific offers to help with the solutions around remote workers, about telemedicine and e-learning, remote learning, we also had to revisit and redesign our CX portfolio of solutions. And we have five areas that we have focused on. The first one is about support, which is about how do we make sure that we de-risk your environment? The way we do this is we leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence to give you more insights about your network. And how do we support environments that are multi-vendor so that we provide solution support for hardware and software solutions? In terms of transformation, our area of focus is about guidance. And our flagship offer is business critical services. We focus on optimizing your current network through advice, guidance, best practices, and insights then we focus on the transformation piece of the network with, with design support, architectural advice, risk management, and ultimately adoption capabilities so you can adopt the solution much faster. And we extend that as well with specialized teams that use agile methodology to drive automation and continuous improvement. And we also realize that we have the, the challenge that our teams have to come along in this transformation. So enabling them through skills development is critical. And we have combined our Cisco Learning Academy with DevNet to make sure that we're able to support DevOps and SecOps capabilities and training. Our advanced services team are there, of course, to assist you, whether it's an implementation, migration, or automation services. And finally, we created offers that will help you operate your network. And we focus on three areas, on collaboration, SD1, and security. And we deliver these capabilities through our partners. Now, what's different about the portfolio is the new digital experience that we're delivering to our customers, to you. And we do that through our CX Cloud, which is powered by collaborative intelligence. And we call it collaborative intelligence because it's truly a collaboration of insights and telemetry from our experience, our partners' information, and as well, your specific inputs from your networks. This digital experience on CX Cloud is enabled through what we call CX success tracks. And CX success tracks get all the capability that we have in those offers that I mentioned and deliver them to you through digital assets, digital journeys. But as well, you have the option to engage expert support if needed. And we add contextual learning as well as we go through the specific use cases in that solution. And finally, we have DevNet Marketplace, which we use to co-create with you through open APIs and automation and ecosystem exchange so that we can build solutions together with our third-party apps. All of these capabilities delivered through our fantastic partner ecosystem. Now, I talked about collaborative intelligence and the digital experience, but it's probably best to see it than for me to talk about it. Let's take a quick look at a demo. What does it look like when Cisco accelerates your success with the right expertise, insights, and learning at the right time? Introducing Cisco Collaborative Intelligence, an intuitive digital experience fueled by telemetry and actionable insights. Expert guidance for your most strategic use cases. Proven life cycle best practices for faster business outcomes. Contextual learning to turn innovation into competitive advantage. All powered by AI, ML, and Cisco's intellectual capital to transform your technology into business value. Through Cisco Collaborative Intelligence, you'll get use case driven guidance every step of the way. Proactive notifications and intelligent recommendations and incident and case management and actionable insights. What does it look like when you get the right experience at just the right time? A faster path to value. Accelerating your success with collaborative intelligence. That's Cisco's customer experience. Between the human experience and the digital experience, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. As you saw, that was only a glimpse of all the capabilities and all the power 
behind that digital experience. So our CX Cloud portal basically has all the assets, all the information about your network and recommendations so you can improve the performance. But it also has detailed descriptions of all the use cases that you have deployed in your network. And those usually are embedded into our success tracks and all the content that is enabled so that you can be successful in moving along the journey and making sure that you achieve faster results in the life cycle of that solution. Now, at Cisco, we reimagine how customers experience our journey together. We develop a life cycle approach to performing and transforming technology. This infinity loop, we like to call it a racetrack, because it's all about speed and it's about time to value. And in that racetrack, we have many stages that we actually accompany you with and give you assets and value so you can accelerate. We call those pit stops. So if you look, for instance, at the stage of adoption, whether you're onboarding, implementing, using, or engaging or adopting a solution, we provide you digital assets and expert support along that journey to make sure you get to that value proposition much faster than before. And you get the ROI that you were expecting when you invested in that solution. So for us, it's all about life cycle. It's not about a moment in time. The new reality requires faster transformation and business outcomes. And we support you through the entire solution life cycle with context-rich digital experience. With your commitment to transformation, our Cisco solutions, and our customer experience team, we're making possibilities realities. Thank you for joining us at Cisco Live 2020. Welcome back, you guys. You are joining us after that last session called The New World Is Now. You were hearing from Todd Nightingale, Liz Santoni, Jonathan Davidson, Alvio Barrios. They all did a great job. And the keynote really stressed that now more than ever, businesses need that agile infrastructure, simple solutions, and trusted customer experience. It was also really great hearing from Todd. You know, he was talking about what Cisco is doing to help during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, even building surge hospitals from the ground up, and even what the company is doing right now in preparation for what's next. Um, so a lot of great stuff. I know you guys are home. Hope you guys are enjoying right now. We do have a little bit of housekeeping so that you can, um, you know, keep engaged, keep connected. We do want you guys to have your voice heard. We want you to ask questions and get those questions answered. Um, so check out the session scheduler. You can go to ciscolive.com slash US to view the live agenda and also plan out your agenda for the rest of this day. These sessions will go to your Outlook so you can keep track of all the sessions that you want to attend. Surveys are only available in the mobile app, but they are pretty essential for us in terms of feedback. So make sure to fill those out after each session. Um, there is a live Q&A available with a panel of experts during the session. Um, if, there, um, if you have more questions, you can go to the WebEx team space afterwards to continue asking your questions. PDFs of the slides are available in the scheduler, mobile app, and WebEx Teams. And there's the Gateway. You can keep the conversation going by joining the Cisco Gateway, which is our inclusive customer community with over 17,000 members who are passionate about Cisco technology. You can check that out on cisco.com slash go slash the Gateway. If you missed any sessions from Tuesday, you can catch them in the on-demand library starting tomorrow. So you can check out all of those amazing sessions there. And of course, last but not least, like Reggie was saying, hashtag Cisco Live. Honestly, we love reading your tweets and it's it's been amazing what you guys have been saying on Twitter and stuff. So please you keep using the hashtag uh, Cisco Live on Twitter, Instagram, all of your social medias, all of that good stuff. Whew, okay, done with that housekeeping. That was a lot. Um, Reg, I know... Um, we have some musical guests coming up. Can you, uh, we had some yesterday as well, but we have some fantastic ones today. Are you super excited about what's coming up? Uh, you have no idea, Stephanie. So I'm ready. I'm geeked. I've been jamming to these artists all week, just in anticipation of them for Cisco Live 2020. I can't tell you guys who they are just yet. I, I really want to, but uh, I got to hold it in. You guys are in for a treat this afternoon. We have some chart-topping artists coming to you live from wherever they are. Are they, are, they, are they in my backyard? I don't know. Are they at your house, Steph? I'm trying to figure out where they're at. I don't know where they're performing at, but it's going to be fun. But for up next, we do have 
Cisco Meraki. So we had Meraki leader Todd Nightingale talking about Meraki, and now we have a session from the future of Meraki with Meraki's GM and SVP Chris Story and VP of Product Management Lawrence Wong. And they're talking about the shift that workplaces and businesses have had to make, such as accommodating thousands of employees to work remotely. And in order for all this to work and be successful, you have to be able to stay connected to your colleagues, clients, and customers. IT managers must be able to be flexible to extend the network beyond just a physical location. And Meraki is an expert with the future of the workplace. So it will be really great to hear what Chris has to say about working remote right now. Uh, Chris Talk will also include Chief Information Officer at Regions Bank, Amala Dugarala, to talk about her experience. And later, VP of Product Management, Lawrence Wong, will do a product overview. So let's go over to this session now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the virtual Cisco Live Meraki session. My name is Chris Story. I lead the Meraki business. Uh, I'm very excited to be with you here today. Uh, today, we're going to be focused on three different sections. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the future of Meraki and the digital workplace, what we're focused on, where we're headed with the platform. Uh, then I'm going to bring up Amala Dugarala, the Enterprise Chief Operations uh, and Technology Officer at Regions Bank. She's going to talk about how Regions Bank has responded to the COVID-19 crisis and how the Meraki platform uh, has helped them uh, in this crisis. And then we'll bring up Lawrence Wong, Meraki's Vice President of Product Management. And uh, Lawrence is going to be speaking about some of the new features and functionality that we will be releasing uh, soon in the product and uh, in typical Meraki fashion, we'll be giving a demonstration. Uh, as this is the first time that I'm speaking to you as general manager here at Cisco Live, um, I wanted to take a moment and introduce myself. Um, so as I said, I, my name is Chris Story. I'm the general manager of Meraki. And I joined Meraki back in 2012, just prior to the acquisition by Cisco. And um, you know, before I joined Meraki, I was a consultant with McKinsey & Company. Prior to that, I was an engineer focused on large-scale infrastructure. And uh, prior to taking the general manager job at Meraki, I was Meraki's COO. And I helped us scale our business from when I joined back in 2012 um, uh, up to today. And you know, I, I sat in the same chair that you are sitting in. Uh, albeit often not in a virtual setting. Um, I, I sat in that same chair, you know, evaluating vendors that we needed to choose in order to continue to scale our business uh, over the past eight years. And um, one of the many reasons why I'm so excited to be leading Meraki is that a lot of the qualities of what I looked for in a vendor is exactly what Meraki offers. You know, we really do look to deliver a customer experience that is not just about the product, it's the entire way that you experience the product. And for me, when I was picking a vendor, that was so important because the product is critical and it has to meet the needs and it has to perform the way we want it to. But the entire company coming along and helping me to grow my business is almost as equally important. And when I looked at vendors that were able to not only provide the product, but provide a customer experience end to end, uh, that's what really differentiated me, uh, uh, differentiated uh, uh, products that I wanted to use at Meraki, because I knew that not only could they meet my needs today, but they would scale and uh, grow with me tomorrow. Now at Meraki, everything we do is driven by a clear mission. We simplify powerful technologies to free passionate people and teams like you to be able to focus on their mission. And uh, this mission is so important to us because the technology is powerful. And we know that by simplifying it, that you know, we can make it easier to use, we can enable you to move faster. And this mission though, while it does drive the product, 
It does drive that idea of an end-to-end -end customer experience from how you learn about the products, how you buy the products, how you, know, you install the products, how you operate the products, and ultimately how you are supported and how those products evolve for you. And uh, uh, at Meraki, we wrap up all of that by focusing on this clear mission because if we don't provide that differentiated end-to-end -end customer experience, uh, we know that we're missing something and we know that we could uh, uh, better unlock how you're able to operate your business by taking that end-to-end uh, -end approach. And for Meraki, you know, this simplifying powerful technology, you know, really started with cloud management, but now it's moved beyond that. And we look at how can we provide data? How can we provide insights to be able to achieve your mission? How can we actually uh, provide the automation such that we can free up even more time for you to be able to use the product to achieve your mission. And our work in moving into digital workplace is a great example of that. And I'll be talking about that a little bit. Now, as many of you know that are uh, uh, familiar with Meraki, we have a comprehensive cloud platform that focuses on the IT network as well as the digital workplace. Um, our first purview or our first move into that digital workplace uh, really was the MV uh, security cameras and MV smart cameras. Um, and, you know, we view that by taking all of these products, wrapping them up into a single management platform that you can manage through a single plane of glass uh, browser based uh, 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 tool or through our powerful APIs, uh, it gives you a level of ability to span across all the different products that Meraki has to offer, as well as create tight integrations between those different products that enables a better together story for you and for your business. Now, in terms of where we take Meraki, this comprehensive cloud platform is what we will continue to build on. And where we really look is, is where we see complexity in the IT network and in the workplace and where the dashboard, the tooling that's available, this single pane of glass, the uh, uh, features and functionality that we have, if those things can solve that complexity and we look at those things coming together, that's where we will continue to drive the evolution of the Meraki platform. And we know that by continuing to simplify those hard challenges that you face, we will be able to help you achieve your mission faster. Now, we know that this is working because when we look at, uh, you know, in the last eight years, how we've scaled out, we've scaled out to a tremendous number of customers. We have over half a million customers today that are on the Meraki platform, you know, basically in every country around the world with 7 million Meraki devices checking into the dashboard every single day with, you know, hundreds of thousands of monthly and daily active users on the platform. And, you know, we've really seen tremendous, you know, uh, exponential growth in our API requests and, and over 45 million API requests coming into the dashboard every single day. And, you know, that journey that uh, I've been on with Meraki over the eight years has not only scaled out across the customers, but it's also scaled with our customers. And just to give you an example of that, one of our largest customers now has over a quarter of a million active devices. You know, they operate across 8,500 sites in 21 countries throughout the world with 5 million clients connecting on a daily basis with over 15,000 terabytes of data flowing through their network every week, uh, all that built up on the Meraki platform. Just goes to show how this platform can not only scale across verticals and industries, but also scale with companies as they grow and uh, as they uh, you know, find new use cases that they want to use the Meraki platform with. Now, we all know that COVID-19 has created a new reality. And over the past six months worldwide and, you know, three plus months here in the U.S., we've seen a tremendous amount of different transitions. 
you know, from industries having to move into remote work, from restaurants and retails having to move to curbside pickup and deliveries, from uh, healthcare providers needing to move into telehealth, from education moving to remotely, from manufacturing sites needing to pull more data such that they can reduce the number of people that are actually coming into their sites. Uh, you know, it's been transformative across every industry, um, uh, uh, across every function. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud and excited to see how our customers are using the Meraki platform to really respond to this. And, um, you know, we, we've, we'll get into some, some customer use cases, but looking at these new ways to work for us is something that we were set up for success for. You know, traditionally, Meraki has been extremely strong in branch sites, in lean IT, um, in distributed sites. And, you know, really, when you look at what COVID-19 and, and remote working has, has shown us, you know, your IT department may not be in the office today. Even if you maybe are critical and you still have people coming in, your IT department might actually still need to be remote. So uh, being able to manage the, your network through the dashboard, being able to pull those insights out is extremely important. And, you know, for these remote workers, these workers that uh, are working from home, you know, there's a whole host of challenges that the Meraki platform is perfect for solving. You know, first and foremost, how do we make sure that the productivity of those workers working in a remote situation doesn't fall? You know, you need to be able to have the visibility and management tools that Meraki provides you in order to make sure that their uh, applications are performing properly, that they can access those SaaS applications in the same way they did when they were in the office that they have the video uh, QoS settings done right such that you're prioritizing the traffic for their uh, um, uh, voice and video conference needs. And while you're doing this, the uh, challenges on the security front have also grown exponentially. You have so many new ways that you're connecting to the network on a daily basis. You need to make sure that the security of that is up to your standards such that you don't have data breaches and you can continue to deliver uh, on your company's mission using that uh, remote work uh, configuration. I'm going to bring up Amala Dugarala here to talk about remote work. Now, um, as those of you that are familiar with Meraki uh, know, you know, Meraki is great at that branch site, at that uh, lean IT model. And that's really what remote work, one of the biggest challenges of remote work um, presents to our customers. You know, you have a large number of people working remotely with a huge number of new connections. You know, how do you, again, make sure, make sure that they are as productive as possible? Um, and really the Meraki technologies here allows you to move fast. And um, uh, what Amala will talk about with regions really does uh, exhibit how they were able to move extremely fast uh, using that Meraki uh, platform. And so with that, I'd like to invite Amala Dugarala to the conversation here today to uh, talk about remote working and how Regions Bank has used the Meraki solution. Um, Amala serves as the Enterprise Chief Operations and Technology Officer at Regions Bank. Uh, Regions Bank is a Fortune 500 uh, financial services company headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. And um, Amala oversees all aspects of application architecture, development, corporate computing, uh, information security and technology governance at Regions. Uh, she also leads the enterprise operations, uh, fraud and cash operations, payment operations, card and ATM operations, loan operations, loan servicing, collections, and the contact center uh, for regions. Prior to joining regions, uh, Amalo served as the executive vice president of software development at ACI Worldwide. Uh, Amala has received a number of awards, including uh, Payment Source has recognized her as one of the top 25 influential women in payments. And uh, This Is Alabama has honored her with the Women Who Shape the State Award.
So with that, welcome Amala to Cisco Live. So thanks, Chris, for that warm welcome. Um, let me share a little bit about Regions Bank. Um, Regions Bank is a 133 um, billion asset bank. We operate in um, the Midwest, South, Midwest, and Texas, 15 states. And then we are a full service bank providing retail, consumer, commercial, and capital market services. Um, and we have about 2,000 ATM and 1,500 uh, branch network across our footprint. And we have about 20,000 plus employee base, including some um, development slash uh, center of excellences in India also. Fantastic, thank you for that. Uh, I think that really helps set the context of you know, not only the regional, but uh, the, the scale that you are really operating at. Um, and so with, with that scale in mind, can you give us uh, a brief overview of the situation you were facing when the crisis hit? Absolutely. I think, Chris, uh, the crisis did hit all of us. It changed the norms for all of us in the industry. I think when the pandemic was hit, our business continuity team pretty much took over the leadership and then started implementing the social distancing practices. Um, I would say within one week or two, it became very apparent that some of our highly dense teams, like let's just take example of our contact center team, you were talking about 900 employee base working off of Pensacola, Memphis, and Birmingham contact centers, um, highly dense teams, right? And um, we were implementing quite a bit of a social distancing by moving them into different office locations, um, you know, putting the six feet distance between the team members and doing quite a bit of an effort. But as the cases in these cities raised, it became an extreme concern for us, for our employee base and for our customer base, because as you guys can understand, contact center is a very heavily used comfort for our customers during this pandemic time. Um, and then, our associates, we were worried about our associates as the cases kind of started raising in the in the city. So one of the aspects that triggered this conversation is how can we actually enable as many employees to be able to work from home and still maintain the same customer service and same productivity all across um, is how regions responded or that is the primary area where we got affected is how do we serve our customers the same exact way by pretty much working from home as much as possible. Mm. Thanks, Amala. So as you start thinking about how to better manage these contact centers and, and get folks to be able to work from home, you know, what what did you look at as kind of the immediate uh, immediate things you needed to tackle for your network in order to be able to uh, provide this and, and uh, have the productivity you need out of your agents? The immediate aspects that we needed from our uh, telecom or a network is all about our ability to move a mass of employees, not only contact centers, our internal IT help desk employee base, our, uh, our consumer collections teams, you name them. Our primary need was how quickly can we move all these employee base to be able to work from home, but do not compromise on our security, our risk controls, our quality of service controls are the three aspects is what is a combination of a telecom network and security solution that will enable me to move pretty much close to, I would say, um, 2000 employees as of right now, instantaneously work from home. And you have to, you have to understand that we already had a VPN solution for working from home, but when you move contact center solutions around, you actually have to have an integrated solution. I would say a VPN hub kind of a solution that helps us bring our security dimension, our voice controls, our recording controls, our risk controls all together going from a single node. And that too, for all the employees who are not technically savvy to do this um, by themselves at home. That makes a lot of sense and, and how security really permeated your thinking. Can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, what did you do immediately in order to actually be able to make this shift um, for your uh, employees to work at home then? 
So um, we, within the matter of two to three days, I, I would say the, the actual effort that we had to take was we were ideating on the solutions. Within the matter of two to three days, we were able to um, zero in on the Meraki devices solution. Um, I would say about three days, we were able to design the network solution, the security protocols, the, the testing that we had to do, the pen testing, the in-test testing that we had to go through, um, the control compromise, our risk teams were involved and we were made sure that none of our recording controls, none of our security protocols are compromised. Um, our routing, the telecom routing uh, facilities, even when the employees were working from home, were all tested. And then I would say in a period of one and a half week, we pretty much mobilized close to 700 employees to be able to um, take the phone calls from home. We were able to provide them move their monitors home, their desktops home, the devices home, the VPN um, home, and then make the connectivity work. Uh, I would say it is a miracle. And then the best part is we never compromised on our um, average handle time, our responsiveness, our customer satisfaction scores while making this transition in phases across our employees within a period of seven to 10 days, um, Chris. It's a real testament to your team and to everybody involved there at Regions to be able to move that quickly. And, it, and it's really inspiring. I, I heard a really amazing story about, you know, just how hands on everyone got when it came to uh, uh, being able to do this for employees. Could you, could you share a little bit about that with us? Can I just tell you a little bit about how Regions culture and then our environment, it speaks a lot to our culture itself, Chris. Um, when we came about this this uh, solution, the decisioning, the, the speed at which our executives, our executive leadership team were able to make a decision on zeroing on the solution, ability to lock down and secure the devices. I think it was a great partnership between the, the Cisco team and the regions team. Our executives made a call within 24 hours. Our chief operating officer actually flew our corporate jet to pick up these devices from the the location from the, the Cisco's location. And then a lot of our employees, including your employee base and our employee base, actually moved these devices into their cars, their SUVs, and then moved them into our facilities. So all this while wearing the masks and you know the, the situation that we were in during the pandemic. I think um, not only we showed that during when there is a need, we will be able to decide fast, implement fast, provide a technical solution and take care of our associates, our employees. But also we showed an extreme amount of agility in how we went about the solution. We were we were not ready to wait three days for FedEx to deploy our devices. I think we put 50% of our devices to FedEx and then rest of all, we carried ourselves to our locations because the speed at which we need to operate and take care of our associates and our customers was just very high. Uh, and then that's what the region's uh, leadership team and the teams have demonstrated that agility during these tough times. So. I mean, that is such an inspiring story to hear. And and really, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the partnership that we, uh, the, the Cisco account team and, and the region's bank team had in, in delivering that. Um, you know, you, you talked about how you were able to recover so fast and you were able to hit the SLAs and everything. Um, you know, how do you think that, I mean, it sounds like it's working well, but, but what is working well and what is not working well for your workforce in this remote working environment? It, I think uh, that's a great question, Chris. I think uh, what works well, what doesn't work well is pretty much beyond just the scope of, um, you know, um, the, the contact center, right? I think pretty much 90% of regions employee base approximately are working from home right now and we are able to keep up with our customer satisfaction scores our slas um, except for the associates that require the physical touch like um, cash operations lockbox operations um, those are the areas where we are having some employees come to work our branches are all appointment only for some time now and we're seeing a quite a bit of a success rate there it is an amazing thing to observe that in spite of so much working from home, we kept up with our uh, customer touch points, our advice in wealth, uh, our commercial 
uh, touch points with our um, commercial customers, uh, um, you name it, our contact center. I think in the end, all our experience is extremely positive. Our ability to keep up, we felt like, um, you know, we do pulse surveys with our employee engagement levels, our engagement levels have increased. Um, the, the shifting into this remote um, uh, style of management where we actually have to have a more interactions with our employee base, more conversations with our employee base. Um, we felt like in and all, it really worked for agents very well. We felt like our engagement levels are high, our ability to understand our employee needs is high, uh, our technical um, solutioning on how to come up with the, with the absolute solution is, is high, our operations are able to keep up, our SLAs are able to keep up. In and all for regions, it's actually a very, very positive work experience. Um, I think we are figuring out how to increase and maintain that engagement in, in, in this continued um, time frame. But otherwise, I would say this is a great positive experience for us, Chris. Great experience. I like that. Um, so that that's super inspiring for us. You know, I mean, banking plays such an important role right now in the recovery, in the economy, and how we will move forward. And, uh, you know, for you to be able to adjust like that is is really great. But as you now start to shift your thinking, maybe towards more uh, return to office, obviously as an essential business, as you pointed out, there are a lot of people who still do need to come to the office. But as you think about expanding that, what are some of the thoughts and, and plans that you guys are thinking about at a high level? So thank you, Chris. Um, I, think, I think the topic is more generic about what is the new norm that every organization is actually getting to. So if you think about it, regions is in general, regions culture is a continuous learning and continuous evolution kind of a culture. Um, we as a management team have numerous conversations about things that we have done. Our risk teams and our technology teams are actually, these are the decisions we made. And then how we were able to accomplish these quick decisions without losing our control environment and security posture how did we accomplish this? So we are all, as a leadership team, thinking about what is a new norm um, that we would like to uh, go to? Uh, how do we design that new norm? What are the lessons we can learn from this experience and opportunity to go into that new norm? I think that is where a lot of our thinking is, a, is, is, um, is evolving because we are really enjoying this, the agility, the focus, the prioritization, the engagement, um, I, I think we are, we are kind of appreciating all of these things together, um, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the importance of maintaining the social distancing during this pandemic situation. I think from, I think from your answers, it's pretty clear that Regions Bank uh, is pretty amazing in its ability to move very quickly. Maybe if we think about separate from COVID, you know, how are you thinking about your role and, and your team's role in driving your business transformations that you need to get done? Excellent. Um, Chris, I think, um, you know, I'll speak a little bit about regions business transformation in general, apart from this, uh, this um, COVID. We actually have been through an intense journey of a transformation, I would say a good four to five years for now where we as an organization made a lot of shifts around our uh, agile working principles, our prioritization, our technology transformation, um, operations. There is a quite a bit you, you heard about our simplify and grow and continuous improvement initiatives where there is an extreme amount of focus on um, keeping the customer in the middle and being extremely customer centric and then thinking about initiatives that will make a life of a customer, experiences for our customer, life of an associate, and then life, you know, and then still be profitable, and then um, for our our stakeholders, correct? So, we've been through this journey over the last four to five years. Uh, technology and operations is in the the epicenter of that transformation. There's a quite a number of initiatives where we are exploring um, our um, artificial intelligence, robotics. Um, you name it. I think uh, there's a huge technology transformation, process transformation, and a cultural transformation and tools transformation that Regions has been embarking over the last uh, four to five years 
which has positioned as well for today's environment of ability to quickly jump into what we got to do and then how we actually have to tackle. Even if you look at it, we actually um, made a decision to go to Virginia with our one of our contact centers. We actually have our disaster recovery in um, Virginia right now, which actually helped us build a more resilient solution, even with the Meraki devices and how we actually configured it. So you actually can see our transformation over the last three to four years as positioned as well for today as an organization. That's great to hear. And I, I think, um, you know, that customer focus, that customer centricity you talk about is, is something we at Meraki also really, uh, you know, try to live every single day. Um, maybe one last question for you. Uh, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, some of the broad technologies that are going to drive, you know, this trend for you. Um, for the uh, attendees here today, maybe you could speak a little bit in more detail about, you know, when you think about the network technologies that are going to be available for you to do this, could you just speak more about how you're thinking about some of those networking technologies? So Chris, going back to the broader um, technology evolution in regions, as I said, over the last four to five years, we've been through into technology transformations. I will classify that into three categories, correct? The number one is the engineering culture and the development culture. What can we do to increase the speed in which we actually can pro um, produce software to the market, the modularity in coding, agile development practices, uh, full stack engineering, um, how do we structure our development practices, DevOps. So you actually can call that one category where we actually made a lot of progress. The second category is the continuous investments into our core uh, technology system. So when we call it a core modernization, core evolution is what we call it, where we are making a huge investments into um, modernizing our core technologies. As I said, Regions has been continuously investing into these technologies and you can see us continuously investing over the last three, next three to uh, six years into our core technologies. We made a lot of strides in our digital and online. As you can see, in spite of this pandemic responses, um, our customers you know, were uninterrupted with their digital because there were quite a bit of a digital eruption. Our online account openings consistently stayed up. Um, we see a huge change in traffic patterns into our online and mobile platforms. So that investments into digital remains our primary focus and will continue to remain our primary focus. Um, now, coming into network technologies, the speed at which we respond to, it, as in the pandemic, I think it becomes more apparent and more interesting for us that our telecommunications, our network evolution, and our security protocols will remain extremely intrinsic to the fabric and the design of how we are articulating our solution. And then, like, you know, the, the decision we made with the Meraki device, we are actually imploring into actually having a Meraki device in quite a bit of all of our internal and external facing employee bases, the contact centers, internal IT help desk or, or any of our um, um, employee solutions where the telecommunication security and VPN have to come together. We are quite a bit investing into our network and uh, telecom solutions over there because um, the speed at which our network responds and the resiliency with which our network responds when you have um, contact centers all across the and agents now working all across the um, across the footprint, and also um, our branches sitting in uh, across uh, 15 states and 1,500 different locations, um, investment into our networks will be continuous, and then we will be um, quite a bit looking into that going forward. Also, press. Well, Amala, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think you shared a lot of really great insights for all the attendees at Cisco Live. And, uh, you know, really thank you for the partnership that we've been able to work with together. And, and uh, you know, for me personally, the, the stories that you've been able to share about, you know, how Regents has really responded and, and how we were able to work together is, is pretty inspiring. So thank you so much. Chris, um, thanks a lot. Um, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity. I have to say this, um, from a region's perspective, having a network solution with high availability, high connectivity without compromising on security has been the, the criticality for us. 
and then the the Meraki device and the Cisco solutions that we actually have right now in the bank has made us look really, really um, good and then confident in providing these opportunities. So I have to say thank you for you guys for helping us and then the partnership that you and your team has exhibited in getting us to this end state where we are right now. Appreciate that and look forward to working together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amala, for joining us. It was really great to hear your stories and how Regents Bank has responded to this crisis. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence Wong, Meraki's Vice President of Product, who's going to take us much deeper into some of the offers that we have coming out. Hey, thanks, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm excited to have the opportunity to spend some time with you today to share our vision for the Meraki portfolio and how we're thinking about the future of the digital workplace. Once again, my name is Lawrence and I look after the Meraki product management team. As Chris shared, we always start with our true north, the Meraki mission of simplifying powerful technology to free passionate people to focus on their mission. Now, the Meraki mission is the cornerstone for how we think about our strategy and the products and solutions that we bring to market. We know that simplicity means different things to different people. And for some, simplicity means being able to manage, configure, and troubleshoot their entire switching, wireless, and WAN networks across thousands of locations from Meraki's dashboard. And for others, simplicity means being able to use our API endpoints to build automated and integrated solutions on top of our platform to streamline DevOps workflows, such as when you take Meraki specific modules and use Ansible to manage your deployment, or you take alerts from dashboard and use webhooks to integrate it into solutions like ServiceNow. And ultimately, simplicity really is about giving back time so you can focus on what matters. Now, when it comes to our vision, we are building a simple, secure, and intelligent platform to enable a self-healing, self-driving network. And we believe that these attributes, simplicity, security, and intelligence, they're not three separate things, but they feed virtuously into one another. Meraki has expanded far beyond our heritage and wireless, and we don't lead with our wireless products. You know, our value, it's in the cloud, it's in automation, it's in that intuitive user experience. And we know that a simple and secure system will really help drive more adoption of more components of that digital workplace and ultimately enable you to accomplish more and deliver on your mission. Now, the way we actually deliver on the vision of the Meraki platform is through you know, some of the foundational elements, starting with dashboard. Dashboard is the foundation of uh, the, the platform. It brings together unified management across different interfaces so that our customers can interact with the platform from their preferred interface, whether it's mobile, uh, web, or APIs or more. And on top of this, it really is a Meraki drive value of a product portfolio that works better together. It is an open platform built on open APIs that tens of thousands of developers can build on top of, including a rich ecosystem of partners. Now we know the cloud does provide real-time analytics that can enable a better customer experience, such as when we proactively monitor for anomalous conditions throughout the year. And finally, I believe the future of this platform and the continued value that we can deliver is to build data powered products. At Meraki, we spend a significant amount of time on both short-term and long-range planning. And at the start of our fiscal year 2020, we came out of the planning cycle and identified the most important things our product development teams are gonna focus on heading into this year. And for anyone who's been following Meraki for a while, many of these things should come as no surprise, right? So deeper Cisco integrations with platforms like the Meraki MS390 built on powerful Cisco switching technology, which does enable powerful micro segmentation uh, solutions uh, with features like adaptive policy. Expanded assurance capabilities because customers, they are, they are drowning in data and starving for insights, and we can help bring clarity to our customers. You know, SD-WAN, it is the future of branch routing, and this is evolving faster than any other technology vertical we track. And all of these and more have been what the team has been working on until mid-March. Now, one of the things we obsess over is using the power of data to understand trends and derive insights. And at the start of March, COVID really was a faraway threat that didn't factor into how I thought about our priorities and our business until I did. In fact, by the time we actually started sending our team home, it really was a matter of days before the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic, and we saw our local health officials start to issue shelter in place orders. We saw similar mandates being rolled out across the globe in fast succession, 
and the impact really was dramatic. And it really was the fastest contraction of global enterprise network traffic that we have ever seen. And across our global deployments of millions of APs, enterprise Wi-Fi traffic decreased by two thirds in a matter of three weeks and has only begun to just start recovering. So the question we're asking ourselves is now what? When I think about the hundreds of conversations I have with customers each year, there really are consistent themes that emerge that really fall into three categories. It's about reducing costs. It's about digital transformation uh, to improve or enable new experiences and ways to work. And it really is about mitigating risk and reducing costs because budgets and teams, they're really not getting any larger and the mandate for greater efficiency isn't slowing down, accelerating that digital transformation to enable new use cases or even streamline existing ones and finding your edge against your competitors, it's more critical than ever before. And mitigating risk because we know that security breaches, they're scary, they're costly, and the networks of today, they're no longer simply the command and control model of the past and really exists wherever your employees are. And the amazing things about these themes is how universal they are, no matter which CIO or senior leader I talk to, and no matter what industry they're in. So the question my team and I were asking ourselves is, do these things still matter during these times? My perspective is that everything has changed, at least in the short term, but we should stay the course in the long term. And I believe that our mission of simplifying powerful technologies so our customers can focus on their missions, it's as relevant today as ever before. And I believe that our strategy of building and delivering on a simple, secure, and intelligent platform is incredibly relevant today and well into the future. I also believe that we need to be flexible in the short term and be willing to make those micro adjustments in our execution so we can be the best possible partner to each of you. So let's talk about some of those near term adjustments and what we're doing to support you. Remember when I told you we obsess over data? Well, we immediately put it into action. And one of the things we live and breathe at Meraki is making the most of the continuous feedback loop where our support, engineering, customer success, and sales teams really do work closely together to surface both the good as well as the areas that need to be addressed. And as companies started sending employees home, one of the use cases that drove, uh, rose dramatically once shelter in place took effect was really client VPN. And the number of client VPN tunnels grew exponentially, nearly four times uh, our base. And this corresponded to a similar spike in support cases tied to client VPN. Now, we've had a project in mind to improve the UI for our climate VPN pages for a while now, but never rose above the cut line during our planning cycle. But we realized that we actually have an opportunity to take a shovel-ready project for client VPN and turn it into something that can immediately benefit our customers. So we rolled out several changes. First, with improved visibility so admins can quickly see who is currently on the client's VPN page. Second, with enhanced context, for settings embedded directly in the dashboard. And third, we also add a, added a set of frequently asked questions gleaned from our support data on where our customers were getting stuck that helped answer common set of questions. So in a matter of two weeks, we had the changes developed and pushed into production. And we quickly saw a rapid decline of 50% in the number of support cases for this feature. Now, I mentioned earlier, the Meraki platform is the foundation that others can build on including your team, as well as leveraging our ecosystem partners. We quickly saw a surge in interest in COVID-focused use cases, so we wanted to do our part. And that means first and foremost, doing no harm, focusing on use cases that we're confident in that can be enabled by the technology through our ecosystem partners. Our API and ecosystem team, they quickly went to work with our partners, to develop solutions that are relevant in these times. So for example, if you want to understand social density and determine how many customers are inside your store right now, you can use our wireless based macro level tracking based on the number of pro clients to do this. If you want to do this in real time, you can now leverage our MQTT feed. And if you have Meraki cameras, you can use our camera based people counting feature as well. Now, perhaps you actually want to answer the question of where your employees are at this given moment. And you can accomplish this with employees that carry BLE based trackers, whether it's a badge or any other BLE active device. We know that the rise in curbside pickup and mobile ordering solutions, it was a trend before COVID, but simply accelerating. So using Wi-Fi without developing an app, it allows you uh, and your customers to order 
uh, with contactless payments. And for curbside and delivery management solutions, this is uh, you know, possible through building custom splash pages for check-in for delivery drivers or customers who want to check in upon arriving at a given location. Now, as uncertain as these times are, we do believe that our long-term commitments and investments are still the right thing to do now and into the future. So let's take a closer look at three areas we're investing in, deepening Cisco integrations, expanding our assurance capabilities, and our investment in SD-WAN. The example I shared earlier of our deeper Cisco integrations with platforms like the MS390 and Adapt Policy, which allows you to create policies that's, that is abstracted from the network topology and seamlessly integrate it with your Catalyst and ICE infrastructure, it's only the tip of the iceberg. We've been integrating best of breed security technologies into our MX security appliances for years now, in addition to enhancing our security offering across our portfolio by seamlessly integrating DNS security powered by Cisco Umbrella into our wireless APs. Now, one of the most exciting additions to this part of our product strategy is an expansion of the visibility that our customers have come to rely on. Our team has been working on integrating Cisco's network-based application recognition engine, or MBAR. And this is really a world-class application recognition engine that massively increases both the fidelity and the library of applications that we can natively classify. And this technology, it does take our baseline traffic analytics engine and upgrades it to support new classification techniques, such as behavioral classification, as well as statistical classification powered by machine learning. And the result really is a 9x increase in the number of applications we can classify. And here's an example of what this would look like once we run MBAR and we're trying to update a layer seven firewall rule for email. I think you can agree the results, they're pretty dramatic. And we're gonna be making this available starting with our MR Wi-Fi 6 APs and rolling this out to our other parts of our portfolio over time. Now, in addition, the last time we met, we introduced you to our MS390, which is really our next generation access switch built on the foundation of powerful Cisco switching technology paired with the Simplicity dashboard. This is one of the foundational elements of our simple, secure, and intelligent platform. Now, a large part of the attraction of this platform is a feature that we're bringing out called Adaptive Policy. It's a way to easily micro-segment and secure your network without having a deal with the complexity of traditional IP-based rules. And this feature is really built on security group tags, inline tagging. It's only possible because we built this platform on Cisco switching technology. And this is now available in beta, starting with our MS390 and our Wi-Fi 6 APs. Now, to make adaptive policy relevant to more deployments, we know we need to support a multi-domain architecture. And that's why we've been working to integrate this into a Cisco TrustSec domain with integration with ICE for policy sync and integration with Catalyst. And this powerful end-to-end -end multi-domain architecture does allow for that seamless definition and enforcement across Cisco's TrustSec and Meraki's adaptive policy domains. So now let's talk about our expanded assurance capabilities. We all know the cost of complexity is real. You intuitively know there's a cost to it and analysts have actually put actual dollars behind it. We know that ultimately downtime means lost revenue, it means potential damage to your brand, and it means time away from focusing on your customers and your mission. And that's really why we started investing in network assurance to reduce that complexity. So about a year ago, we introduced wireless health. It's a tool that gives our customers a quick, holistic view of wireless connectivity issues across the network. And wireless health, it does an incredible job highlighting those connectivity issues, but a user really can have a degraded wireless experience that isn't simply due to connectivity. In fact, when we think of troubleshooting wireless issues, it's not usually one thing, but it's a combination of connectivity and performance that matters. And wireless health intelligently aggregates the most useful connectivity metrics at a network level, while the performance metrics customers care about, they're scattered in different places in dashboard today. And our vision and our goal really is to build the most intelligent end-to-end -end network health capability in this industry. And that's why I'm really excited to introduce you to Meraki Health. This really is an end-to-end -end assurance solution that's powered by intelligence that highlights the most important things you should care about. So if a user has an issue with association, highlight it. 
If someone has an issue with the misconfigured port, we'll show it to you. And if the cloud application is down or degraded, send an alert. And really this is, you know, to augment what we built with wireless health and the deeper insights. And the way we're gonna get there is augmenting what we started with uh, and focusing on that wireless uh, health expansion. And this is really rooted in our ears and of expertise in wireless. And we're gonna start combining relevant health metrics from the view of a client, an access point, and a network. So we're gonna jump into a demo. Let's take a closer look. So we're now logged into dashboard. And we know that whenever someone's having a problem getting onto the network, maybe it's a slow web page, maybe it's unexplained drops, they generally provide very little information to the help desk. And the reality is, even if someone thinks the problem is a wireless issue, the problem may actually lie somewhere else. And so with Meraki, you can easily search for a uh, client like Safety here, which is a MacBook uh, Pro client, and you could quickly see relevant and important information. First, you could see the client details, which AP is it connected to, how is the device authenticated, and now we have an end-to-end -end visualization of how the client is connected to the network and now through the WAN. So in this example, we can see this client is connected to an AP, a series of switches, and finally out through the security appliance. Now, while this person may think they're having a wireless issue, perhaps their poor connectivity is actually due to a bad ethernet cable, in which case we would highlight that if that were the actual issue here. Luckily, this client looks like it's uh, doing pretty well here. But what's really powerful about this view is that we only surface relevant information. So if your device only connects, let's say via five gigahertz, we would only show you details for the five gigahertz band when you hover over that AP. And the same thing is true for other information we display, such as port numbers on the switch, which is based on how the data is flowing. Now, what if someone actually has an issue or they complain they can't connect to the network, but it really only seems to happen in a particular part of the building. And this actually happened to me. You know, at Meraki's headquarters in San Francisco, we have over 80 APs deployed across our building. And I actually had uh, recently, you know, connecting or connectivity issues. So I asked our team who built this, whether they can help isolate it, especially since these are some of the most challenging issues to get to the bottom of. And so with Meraki Health, we quickly found the client in question we can dive in to see this client only seems to be experiencing this issue on a set of specific SSIDs or APs. And then we can then jump into the AP level and confirm that the connectivity issue is actually isolated to this AP in a given SSID. And if this were a you know, SSID that's 802.1x, we can then check the radius server and see that it's actually misconfigured. So within three clicks, we can identify the radius server as a root cause for why this client was actually having problems connecting in a specific part of the building. Now, what if the issue actually isn't connectivity, but slow performance? We know that slow performance can be due to a variety of factors, including uh, things like coverage, uh, interference, uh, misconfiguration, and more. And oftentimes when someone does report an issue, it's done after the fact and not really in real time. So for teams that are really trying to support these users in these dynamic environments, be able to quickly go back in time and quickly overlay that critical information, such as that signal quality and latency, it really is an effective way to help isolate these issues. So we really designed this so that all the relevant information across multiple APs, it's automatically stitched together, it's color coded, so you don't need to be a wireless CCIE to really understand what all these different metrics mean, whether it's signal to noise ratio, or latency. And what's really powerful is that we give you up to seven days to go back in time. And we're gonna be enhancing this and extending this for up to a month. So in addition, we can show you where there's intermittent connectivity and it's color coded uh, with uh, blue, for example. And so this helps layer on even additional context. And this really is a common issue to troubleshoot, uh, you know, roaming issues, let's say in higher education environments where roaming is very common here. Now, having that end-to-end -end view for how things are connected with relevant information serviced, uh, that correlated timeline with you know, guidance of what good versus bad, it really is a powerful addition to what we offer today. But we're also building towards that more intelligent future where we can provide uh, recommendations here. So when you take a look at the details for a specific wireless client, 
there's a new section that we're showing here called the client timeline. And this is something that goes above and beyond your traditional event log. It really does highlight actual information based on what we detect uh, and what the issue likely is. This, this not only highlights this, but also provides you with recommendations for how you can actually resolve issues, such as if we detect uh, you know, misconfigured password, for example. And we can extend this to other issues so you know, you know when you fail against a, uh, you know, authentication against a radius server, we'll provide you reason codes. Like the fact is this is really only the beginning and in the future we're going to be adding more recommendations over time to make this more colloquial so that you know, we can translate more things into common everyday language. And we will be augmenting these, uh, this assurance information across all our products to really make Meraki Health the easiest and most useful you know, end-to-end -end assurance uh, solution in the industry. Now, the last area of investment I really want to highlight is around our SD-WAN portfolio. Meraki really has been leading the way with adoption and our vision of a secure SD-WAN future. And we have been growing a passionate base of customers adopting our solution. And I believe a big part of the success is understanding the trends and use cases that matter and building elegant solutions to help solve these use cases. We started with being able to easily connect branches to data centers and we evolved that to embed security as a foundational element. And most recently, we augmented our secure SD-WAN solution with WAN visibility with Meraki Insights. Now, the SD-WAN space has evolved over the years from providing a way to reduce MPLS costs to assuring the experience for business critical applications. And really, this transition is driven by the changes that we see in how we're all working today and our greater reliance on SaaS applications to really conduct that work. And the reality is even more complicated in that applications are not living in just one cloud, but many clouds. And the transition is feeling a massive investment that we're seeing across the industry in SD-WAN. And we believe that the future is really going to be around this multi-transport connectivity from the branch, uh, either via cloud hosted or on-prem hosted solution. And we believe the future is evolving uh, our leading secure SD-WAN solution, empowering with advanced analytics and machine learning to provide the performance and visibility really needed to, uh, you know, in tomorrow's world. So to that end, we are introducing Secure SD-WAN Plus, which really includes all the capabilities of our advanced security license today, plus Meraki Insights. And we're building towards a future where advanced analytics, smart SaaS optimization, as well as consistent policies are foundational elements. And we believe this is the next important phase for SD-WAN. The three pillars of SD-WAN really are driven by new emerging use cases that we're seeing and will be powered by this advanced analytics with ML, that smart SaaS opt optimization and those consistent policies. And all this is really built with an eye towards increasing intelligence as well as automation. So taking a closer look at advanced analytics with ML. With Meraki Insights, we extend visibility from the access network out to the WAN and provide you deep visibility into your WAN health, web application and voice over IP health. As we continue to invest in this space, you can expect to see increasingly powerful and automated troubleshooting. So let's take a closer look at these uh, enhancements. So how many times have you come across instances where you've heard from your team that their workload has increased since deploying new web servers, or that they're really being overburdened with calls for application performance and wish that they could alleviate some of these issues? So with Web App Health under Meraki Insight, monitoring and identifying issues related to the performance of applications over the internet has really become a lot easier. And this provides network performance analytics and troubleshooting, including the LAN, WAN, server, as well as domains. And this will really enable you to accelerate your mean time to resolution, really powered by this intelligence. Now, when you go into details for a specific application, we can quickly tell you if the issues related to the LAN, uh, WAN, or server, so you can focus uh, on you know, who the right teams are, who should be engaged. And in addition, we can provide you insight into the reason with supporting data that's critical, especially if you're, uh, the issue is upstream at the service provider level. So what's really next? So we believe while surfacing the right information at the right time is important, so is getting accurate alerts. And alerts are one of the most asked for features ever. And we know that customers really want alerts on more things with more triggering options. But the reality is, even though it's one of our most popular requested features, very few customers actually enable alerts. The reason for that is because alerts generally are pretty terrible. You know, alerts really aren't personal. They don't change with the unique characteristics of the network. 
and users really have to set manual thresholds. And usually what ends up happening is they choose thresholds where the alerts are usually too no uh, noisy and generate a lot of false positives or even get no alerts. And so with this wealth of data that <clears throat> Meraki Insight already analyzes, we're now going to be feeding this into a sophisticated machine learning algorithm that outputs what a healthy network should look like for a given organization. And this intelligence is called thresh, uh, smart thresholds within Meraki Insight. So we're gonna jump into dashboard and take a closer look at what this looks like. With smart thresholds, thresholds can be automatically calculated for the network and alerts become more meaningful. So threat, smart thresholds will give you back the gift of time and really make dashboard even more of a joy to use. So without smart threshold, you can see that there are apps uh, that have a red cross against the WAN or server. And once we enable this feature, you will see it go from red to green. And really what's happening behind the scenes is that the threshold values are now taking into account uh, workloads of each of the network or applications, uh, the type of uplinks at each network to give you realistic values of that application performance. Now, going back to the importance of visibility, with WAN Health, you can quickly identify downlinks, including cellular across all your sites. And this allows you to easily monitor signal strength for cellular uplinks across all locations and quickly isolate sites with underperforming uh, uplinks to make the case for switching to maybe a new ISP or perhaps adding cellular as failover. And of course, this allows you to discover which sites you're most reliant on uh, for cellular or failover. It's increasingly important with the proliferation of both wireless as well as wireless WAN links being used today. Uh, with Voice over IP Health, tracking the performance of those SaaS-based Voice over IP services over all your uplinks. This is really simple to set up. You can add your Voice over IP servers by domain name or IP addresses, and this will allow you to quickly identify the cause of that degradation through a detailed hop-by-hop -hop analysis. With Smart SaaS optimization, we're really building increasingly optimized and intelligent path selection. And that really this evolves from providing you the ability to define and control uh, the path for your SaaS-based apps to augmenting that decision with performance metrics and ultimately with aggregated analytics across your network to enhance this further. So coming soon, we're gonna provide local breakout of SaaS applications to use public internet links instead of auto VPN tunnels. And this will be a seamless one-click setup for your top applications where you choose a preferred public internet path, you load balance across available public internet links, and you apply your global preference. And finally, when it comes to simplifying security policies, what well, we started with the MS390 and adaptive policy, really bringing that micro segmentation to the access network through security group tags, we're gonna be extending this to the WAN as well. And this really means a complete end-to-end -end way to enforce business logic and policies without having to worry about the underlying network architecture. Now, this next phase of SD-WAN, it's going to be an exciting journey, and I can't wait to see this future state realized. So where does this all take us? You know, this is really about the future of smart SaaS optimization based on all available paths. I think the future of SD-WAN is exciting. We're going to continue to see rapid evolution of the use cases in this market. And our mission is to focus on building those solutions and not simply features to address those emerging use cases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for going through that. Um, that brings us to the conclusion of our session here today. Uh, I first want to thank all of you for joining us in this virtual uh, Meraki session. We know uh, you're extremely busy and appreciate you dedicating the time to spend with us here today. I want to thank Amala Dugarala for joining us and talking about how the Meraki technology solutions have allowed Regions Bank to respond uh, to this COVID-19 crisis. And I want to thank Lawrence for taking us through some of the new features and functionalities that will be coming out uh, on the Meraki platform. We know that these features will continue to deliver against the Meraki uh, simple IT and against the Meraki mission of simplifying powerful technology to free passionate people to focus on their mission. Um, you know, we uh, uh, look forward to continuing the conversation with you all please visit us at our website at meraki.cisco.com. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And one final, thank you so much for joining us here today.
Welcome back, you guys. You are just watching the future of the digital workplace with Cisco Meraki's Chris Story and Lawrence Huang. They spoke about the shift that businesses have had to make during this time and even what the future of the workplace will look like, which is all pretty exciting. Meraki, of course, was acquired by Cisco back in 2012. And Reggie, hasn't it been super exciting hearing about all the acquisitions, especially the ones that include intelligence? Yes, it's, it's been absolutely amazing. I mean, like you said, Meraki has been one of our many acquisitions that Cisco has done over the past, what was it, 30 years. And you could think back to from a threat intelligence perspective with Cisco Talos. That came from our source fire acquisition. And now we think about app dynamics and the, the intelligence that is bringing through automation to our applications. And now we have Thousand Eyes, which is providing network intelligence. Cisco has really been integrating intelligence through our acquisitions to really bring us to that network intuitive that we've been aiming to create for so long. So it's really exciting to hear about that. And what's also really exciting is hearing about what's up next, Stephanie. Totally. So what's coming up next? I guess speaking of acquisitions, we are hearing from App Dynamics Chief Product Officer Danny Winokur and also SVP of Emerging Technologies and Incubation Liz Santoni. And they're talking about reimagining your applications. Basically, Cisco is helping IT teams work together across the full stack so that they're able to get the best app performance. Because we're living in an all digital world all the time right now, it's more important than ever to get the best user experience. Of course, there will be live Q&A during the session. And if you don't ask your question, then you can head over to WebEx Team Space, ask your questions over there. Hashtag Cisco Live. Hope to see you on Twitter and Instagram and engage with us on social media. Hope you enjoy the session and we will see you guys right afterwards. Welcome everyone, I'm Liz and Tony. Life's quite different than it was just even a few months ago. It feels like we're living in this all digital, all the time world. So it becomes even more important to be able to deliver the best user experience. It's like our digital connection is becoming as critical as the air we breathe. So Danny Winokur and I are gonna show you how we're helping IT teams to be able to work together across the full stack to be able to deliver the best application performance. But before we go down that path, I want to take a few moments to acknowledge the amazing work that you've done. Because almost overnight, you've enabled so many of us to work remotely. You're ensuring business continuity and you're keeping critical infrastructure up and running. You're our IT heroes. You're connecting our medical professionals, our first responders, our governments, our communities, and so much more. And so we want to say a big thank you. Now to better understand the challenges and changing priorities that technologists are facing during the COVID-19 pandemic, our APT teams interviewed more than a thousand IT professionals across the globe, across multiple industries. And here's what they said. 81% actually said that COVID-19 created the biggest technology pressure that they've ever experienced. 74% said that digital transformation projects got approved within weeks, whereas before it would take more than a year. And 71% said that digital transformation projects have been implemented within weeks rather than months or years. And at Cisco, we're working side by side with you to help enable a lot of this. I wanna bring up a couple of examples, like Skylakes Medical, which is the only hospital in Southern Oregon within a 75 mile radius of their hometown in Klamath Falls. They were the first and last line of defense for their community when this pandemic hit. Their IT team had to act really fast 
to help enable some of these new critical care services that you're seeing. They use Hyperflex to power their on-prem apps and Cisco's networking and collaboration technology. And you'll actually hear a lot more from John Gady and the team at Skylakes about their experience during the crisis at the end of our session today. Another example is that of Geographic Solutions. They facilitate unemployment benefits across four states. They went from 8,000 users a day to 60,000 users a day. And their IT team worked with us and used the scalability of our Hypoflex platform along with Intersight, which is our management as a service platform. Our AppD team has been working with the French Ministry of Health, who worked with Noël Asante to develop and deploy an app called Covidon to monitor the health of patients who actually tested positive for COVID-19, but were healthy enough to quarantine at home. And the target here was to be able to run applications for thousands of patients with a response time of under 200 milliseconds. Now, AppDynamics technology provided the insight they needed at multiple levels of the code to get the app up and running in time for its release and also to optimize the application and ensure scalability. Now today, the Covidom app actually manages more than 635,000 patient forms, 320 hospitals, more than 20,000 users, as in users, we're talking about staff and doctors, and 60,000 patients. And they have the capability to manage more than 200,000 patients, even in the short term. We're proud to work together to make this possible. We believe IT heroes are what makes apps run in a multi-cloud world. Now we know your world spans across a full stack, from applications through the virtual and physical infrastructure. Many of the newer applications that you're building are modular with increasing complex interdependencies across this entire environment. On-prem data centers, private and public clouds. And hybrid apps are a reality especially as you look to refactor or modernize your existing apps where the front end say a portal can be in the cloud and the back end of the data sits on prem. Even your new cloud native apps may also need to connect to data that's on prem. Data gravity is real for a number of reasons. We see an increasing number of workloads being deployed in some hybrid form, spanning across both public clouds and on prem. And as the choices increase, so does the complexity. Why? Because we've always optimized to make each domain successful one at a time. And we've optimized for apps that sit on-prem, we've optimized for microservices and serverless apps in the cloud. And each one of the teams operates in their silos and uses disconnected tool chains. This is what we want to solve for. We believe that what you need is an operating model. So you can leverage the best aspects across cloud and on-prem you get to move at the speed of your business and it gives you choice and control. Cisco's portfolio of cloud enabling solutions spans from networking to security to workload and infrastructure management and application and performance management. Today, we're actually gonna focus on those top two layers of the picture and show you how we're giving teams the tooling they need to work together to power these hybrid apps in a multi-cloud world. So let's start at the top and talk about applications. And for that, there's nobody better than our VP and GM of App Dynamics, Danny Winokur. Hey, Danny, I'm going to hand this over to you. All right, thank you, Liz. So, as Liz was pointing out, with everything that's been going on in the world now, applications have, of course, become the very center of our digital lives, 24 by 7, whether it is for accessing healthcare and making an appointment with our doctor whether it's visiting with family or friends or doing a happy hour, whether it's buying our groceries or, or doing any of a number of things that we need to do to take care of our daily needs now, we're doing all of that through applications round the clock. And that means that the cost of downtime for the providers of those applications is unacceptably expensive. We actually knew that from even before the pandemic. This data here was gathered through a survey that we did called the Digital Reflex Survey. And you can see that 49% of users reported that they switched suppliers due to a poor digital experience. And worse yet, 63% of users said that they actually badmouthed an application to their friends and colleagues to tell them not to use it. 
Think of what impact that has to a company's brand. And we also know that there are direct real expenses for companies when their applications go down, with almost half of all downtime incidents costing over $100,000. And we engage routinely with customers that are having downtimes many times every single week, making it just an enormous expense for them. We also know from a recent Pulse survey that we did to update a prior study that we did called the Agents of Transformation, that during this COVID-19 pandemic, the digital experience has become even more essential to the way that everyone is living and to the way that IT departments are now having to actually take into account their customer needs. We have 88% of IT professionals saying that the digital customer experience has become the priority for their organization. And 85% have said that innovation is more important than ever for them to emerge strongly when they come out of this pandemic. And finally, 66% say that this pandemic has in fact exposed weaknesses in their digital strategies. This is something that absolutely has to be addressed because it has massive competitive implications. If you look at what Gartner, one of the leading analysts has said, by 2021, the organizations that have taken advantage of the pandemic to really get into a digital mode for doing commerce are going to benefit next year by 30 percentage points in sales growth over the competitors that weren't able to do that. So with digital becoming so essential to the way that every organization is doing business, it begs the question of how to actually make the shift and accelerate it more than ever. And that, that brings in the fourth major generation of technology that we see our IT organizations having to leverage, cloud and microservices. We've gone through mainframe, we've gone through client server, we've gone through the web, but cloud and microservices offers the unique opportunity for our teams to accelerate their velocity, break down applications into smaller components that can be released much more frequently. Now, why does that matter? It matters because in a world where your brand is your application, your company is represented inside that app, you have to be able to achieve the best experience in the app. And the only way you can achieve the best experience is to iterate very, very quickly and measure and iterate and measure and iterate. That's what creates the winning experiences. So cloud and microservices becomes essential. However, we can't throw away and discard all of those prior generations of technology that we've invested in over the decades. And so the reality in most of our environments is that we end up with hybrid multi-cloud environments that look something like this, where we have mainframes and traditional application architectures in the data center paired with the latest and greatest technologies from the cloud. Usually those cloud and microservices are prioritized first and foremost on the front end where the need for that highest velocity of iteration to achieve the best and winning experience is most essential. Now, it would be nice if technology was actually the only thing that we had to worry about, but it's not. We also have to worry about the operating model and how our teams and our organizations work inside our companies. And unfortunately, many of our large organizations start from a place that looks something like this where we have separate business, separate development, and separate operations teams that are rather siloed, and they're not used to working together closely or intimately with one another. That creates a real challenge, because in a world of cloud and microservices and iterative, rapid, high-velocity development, the only way that things can work effectively is when these teams work together much more closely, because the business is now encoded inside the app by the development team. And the development team is actually now coding the infrastructure that the operations team needs to run. And so they need to now come together in a much more collaborative model that we refer to as biz dev ops, which simply means that these teams have to actually plan together, make decisions together, respond to issues together. And if they do that, they can actually accelerate the velocity that becomes that competitive advantage to iterate in an experience driven world. So, if we now look at what AppDynamics does, go back to that complex environment. We allow you to actually see through that environment, starting first with what we refer to as a business transaction. Think of the business transaction as a simple building block that makes up the application experience for the end user. And that building block, that, that business transaction, delivers a key outcome to the user. In this case, it might be a buy now experience 
within an e-commerce application to buy a pain reliever. We trace all the way through the components of the application environment, the dependencies and the calls between every component across hybrid multi-cloud environments from the public cloud into the data center, maybe even back to a mainframe. And we give that as the core unit that is now monitored to create a context for when things go wrong. So for example, if we end up in a situation where there is an issue and you get a network policy change that is causing that problem, we can actually root cause that directly within the context of that buy now experience so that you understand what it's causing in terms of user impact and where it's located and how you need to actually fix it. But we didn't stop there. As App Dynamics, we went a step further than that. And we said, hey, the back end business transaction is not the only thing you want to understand. You also want to understand those front end screens, the actual experience that your users are having screen by screen by screen. And we are very proud today to be formally launching the general availability of a feature called Experience Journey Maps that does exactly that. It lets you actually trace screen by screen what your end users are experiencing and correlate it with the business transaction on the back end so that you can see what's important and where to really focus your efforts. And then we have an additional lens that we layer on top of these that we refer to as business IQ. And that actually brings it all the way up to the layer of the business metrics themselves, business analytics, business metrics that are pulled directly in real time from the application environment. So you can see as an IT leader, the things that your business counterparts wanna know about what the technology is delivering. How many searches per minute are occurring? What is the top item in the pain reliever or first aid category? What is the average dollar size for a cart? How much revenue is being generated in a particular time period? These things are now available to you in real time and they're correlated with the experience your users are having and the backend application components that are delivering it. So these capabilities of App Dynamics come together and provide a very strong set of capabilities to address the issues of biz dev ops at the application layer. And it would be really nice looking back at the picture that Liz introduced if things just work really smoothly like that across all of these layers. Unfortunately, that's not the case in most of our organizations. We still have, even beyond the application layer, separate further silos to deal with at the workload and infra level, at the security level, down into the network, where these teams are still very oftentimes siloed. And this has real serious consequences when the work that's being done at the application layer and with the business now has to actually work through the full stack all the way down into these other layers. So when something goes wrong, we end up with a war room situation that will look something like this, where you have finger pointing going on and each team separately saying, hey, my stuff looks good. The developer saying, yeah, my code's good. The operations team for the network is saying the network looks good. And yet the reality is that something's wrong and things aren't working the way that they need to. And across the hall in organizations like this, we'll see a business team having their war room because they're now trying to run a digital business where the business has moved into the application. And when it's not working, they're pulling their hair out, unable to figure out what's going on and what they're gonna do about the fact that business performance is suffering. So we need to figure out a way to actually take these separate siloed teams and bring them back together. And as Liz pointed out, that is what we are committed to doing at Cisco. We have technologies and solutions that allow these different layers of the stack to be brought together with correlated data that becomes a single source of truth across hybrid multi-cloud environments that have components running on-premises and other components, typically the front-end components that might be running in a public cloud environment using those latest technologies where iteration of to create good experiences is so essential. We bring it together, give you a shared data model that we refer to as visibility, insight, and action so that all four of these teams are able to now work together in a coordinated closed loop operating model. So as Liz said, today's presentation really is focusing on these top two layers. And what I'd like to do now is shift into actually showing you a real world example of how we are able to actually create that closed loop model between the application infrastructure, sorry, the application owners, the application operations team, and the infrastructure owners that are managing workload and infrastructure management. 
So if we move into the demo, you're looking now at AppDynamics. This is a screen that has been built within AppDynamics to actually provide a dashboard to an application owner. And you can see that it starts at the top of the screen with business health. This is the business IQ capability that I introduced previously. And it is showing you that within this fictional application called NextGen Financial, where you have typical things you would expect from an online banking or an online financial application, you've got your insurance quotes, your loans, and your bill payment. And those core business capabilities are actually being measured and reported on in real time. And we see that we actually have a warning, $450,000 in insurance quotes being issued is below the baseline threshold of what we would normally expect for this time of day. Down below, we have a bit of additional information. We have a listing of those business transactions that I mentioned before. These are those back end building blocks that make up the key components of an application, each by delivering a particular user outcome. So you see that we have the quoting application, the quotes that are being sent, loan applications, loan approvals, bill payment, and applying discounts. You see there are alarms on a couple of those, right? There's an alarm on the load for quote being, quotes being sent, and there's also an alarm on applying discounts business transaction and its response time. So it would be really helpful now if we could understand what impact was this having on our end users so that we could understand among these different alarms, how do we want to actually prioritize and focus our time to troubleshoot? So if we click on the 450K alarm at the business level, it takes us to the new feature that we are launching today. This is the App Dynamics Experience Journey Map. Now, like I mentioned before, this journey map actually gives you a real-time mapped view into each and every screen that your users are seeing within your application. And so if you look to the left side here, you'll see that there's an entry point where you start naturally with the three primary experiences, bill payment, a single screen where you go to actually pay your bill, loan applications where you have a series of screens to actually go in and, and do your loan. And then at the bottom, the one that we're focused on here, which is the insurance quote. And you see there are a series of screens that make up that quoting experience. And lo and behold, we see a warning there in the middle on the applied discounts uh, screen of that uh, insurance quoting experience. So we can actually go and click on the warning and we will get more information that shows us what exactly is going on from the end user's perspective with performance at that particular stage in their experience journey. And you can see on the purple highlighted square for that screen that conversion is in fact down 39% on that screen. So we've now found where it is that we need to focus our first efforts in troubleshooting the problems that were indicated by the alarms that we had seen on the earlier screen. So to do that, we click on the dashboards and reports, and this takes us to a screen that lets us see what's going on on the back end of the application. So we actually now see the environmental health with our app servers and our virtual machines across our quote services, our discount services, our loan services, and our payment services. These are the back end services that underpin the application. And while there is an alarm on quoting services at the application server level, we know that's actually not something we need to immediately focus on because our experience journey map on the prior screen showed us that our users weren't actually experiencing problems there. Instead, we know that our immediate problem is on discount services. And by looking here, we can see that the problem is actually root caused into the virtual machines that are part of our infrastructure. Now, this is where you would normally get stuck with most APM tools because you would be back in that siloed war room situation with everyone pointing fingers. But due to the integration that we're able to achieve as Cisco uniquely, we're able to create the closed loop operating model between the app owner that gets to this point and now the, the colleague within infrastructure operations who is needed to actually help me solve this problem. And so at this point, I'd like to actually hand back off to Liz who is going to show you what is possible now with a smooth handoff into infrastructure operations to continue troubleshooting this problem. Liz, back over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Danny. So now I'm going to come go into the Interside platform to be able to troubleshoot the problem that you were just talking about. So for those of you who are not familiar with Interside, it is our management as a service platform. You can use it to manage your UCS servers, your Hypoflex clusters and storage arrays. You can manage your infrastructure lifecycle for firmware and OS upgrades. And since it's actually a cloud service, you can connect back to Cisco. 
So when a machine has issues, it can log a service request with Cisco TAC. It can send signatures and logs without much human intervention. It can help you to get to root cause much faster. So here what you're seeing is I'm in the workload optimizer view. And what you're seeing on the left is a dependency graph. The dependency graph actually shows you the relationship of all the components in that stack. And how does it do it? It actually makes API calls to each and every entity on this graph, to AppDynamics, to the VM environment, to the servers and storage. Now, each call that we make gives us information about the immediate dependency of that entity. Now we can correlate, connect all of that data to form this comprehensive graph that you're seeing with 11 business applications, app servers, VM hosts, and so on. Workload Optimizer, by the way, also has a recommendation engine and it looks into performance and efficiency and compliance constraints. It uses historical knowledge to proactively flag issues and also gives options to save costs. We're actually pulling that app topology information from AppD, so joining it with other data sets and looking at all the apps across the enterprise. And as you can see right here is it's not all green. There's reds and yellows in there, and that's calling attention to various actions that come from the recommendation engine that analyzes and correlates all this data. But I wanna to get to the next gen financial app. So I wanna click on the business application ring and it shows you actually a list of apps on the right hand side. And there, as you can see it third on that list is the next gen financial app. So I'm gonna click on that because I wanna to get to the dependency map just for the next gen financial business application which has a view of all the resources that are involved. While the business application, as you can see, is showing green, which means there's no pending actions on any of it, both the app server and the VMs show yellow. And that means it's got some pending action. So I'm gonna click on the VM and it shows that there's some recommended actions. And you can see that both NextGen Financial VM3 and VM4 have memory congestion issues. These are the same VMs, by the way, that Danny showed as yellow in the AppD dashboard. And the recommendation here is to actually increase the allocation of the VMs by just one GB to support optimal performance. All the other capacity stats actually look good to us. Again, all I need to do is hit apply and that's all it takes. So you, you have infra ops teams can actually plan for actions that they can take in partnerships with their app ops counterparts. So let's go back and take a look at the AppD dashboard. It actually looks all green. We have both teams, the app operator, infrastructure operator team that have access to the same data sets. They speak the same vocabulary, but each one of them are using the tools that make sense for their jobs. What I can tell you is no other APM tool or APM product can do this. This is a first and it's actually some pretty cool stuff. But actually that's not all of it, right? I wanna to go to another use case in terms of how do we optimize resources across a hybrid infrastructure? Because when you think about it is many organizations now have initiatives with some applications that are hosted in the cloud, maybe apps with front end in the cloud and the back end and the data that needs to stay on prem. We are operating in a hybrid multi-cloud environment. So let me show you actually what we can do to optimize the components in the cloud with the same tooling and ease that we saw with our on-prem resources. So here I'm back in the Interside Workload Optimizer tool. And what you're seeing right now is this hybrid view. It gives you a view of the resource and dependencies and the pending actions across both the cloud and on-prem resources. So let's pick an entity with some pending actions and I'm gonna hover over this 535 VMs and it actually shows all the pending actions and their severity. And when you click on it, you can see a list of the actions and the expected improvements. I'm gonna select one that is related to the cloud environment and it actually gives you the efficiency improvements. And clicking on that action actually expands it to show you that if you take the action, it shows the associated impact and cost savings. It is using machine learning to make sense of all the data from the hybrid application and its dependencies for both the public cloud and the on-prem infrastructure as well. You know, optimizing for the cloud brings its own set of challenges. There's a constantly evolving set of available instance types that are available. 
And each one is actually tuned for its compute capacity, its memory capacity, its storage capacity, network bandwidth, you get it, with varying prices. And unlike the on-premises environment, we need to actually just use what's available. And while you've optimized when you are doing your deployment, and that's absolutely needed, keeping it optimized in, in evolving conditions is also critical to be able to keep the cost down. Workload Optimizer does exactly that because it gives you the recommendations that accounts for the available instance types and the rate card. And here we see is an example of where moving to a different instance type actually saves your organization ongoing operating costs. To summarize what I just went through, Apti Experience Journey Maps provides a view on application performance to focus on what matters most, the user impact. And it integrates with InterSide Workload Optimizer to give both the app operator and the infrastructure operator a shared view of that correlated data from within the tools that they use that's necessary for their roles so that they can quickly root cause no matter where the issue is within that stack. And with InterSide Workload Optimizer, you can also get hybrid app optimization. We've created this consolidated data set from multiple sources across the full stack, giving you the full dependency awareness. Machine intelligence actually helps us unravel these complex interactions and constraints, and it actually gives you actionable recommendations to solve problems and save costs. And by the way, since we're in a world where IT teams are as distributed, I would say, as their infrastructure, we've actually created an InterSight smartphone app that you can find both in the Apple and the Android app stores. And it has a demo mode, so please download and check it out. There are a lot of powerful new capabilities to help the app operator and the infrastructure operator teams partner together in a closed loop operating model for a world where applications are the business. That's exactly what Danny said. We've made the infrastructure dynamic so it can support the constantly changing demands of an experience-driven application. We're all living in a world of shifting conditions where we lack predictability. We at Cisco are here to partner with you to prepare for this new world. And as we close this session, I'd like to share with you a video from the Skylake medical team. Thank you, stay well, Please roll the video. Skylakes Medical Center is a standalone community hospital. We serve a geographically isolated area of South Central Oregon. Our mission statement for information services at Skylakes is we save lives and we innovate. So we're humming along doing all the work that we normally do on a day-to-day -day basis, and then this pandemic starts. We had to very rapidly scale into different technologies that we had never used before. And what made this possible for Skylakes Medical Center was hyper-converged infrastructure. With Cisco, that was all deployed, ready to go. So when it came to standing up a new model around telehealth, having that bridge between applications and infrastructure, we were able to do it. The applications, I mean, what used to be a nice to have, have really become required. We are utilizing them with every patient. I can't imagine the last eight weeks in the COVID crisis without having highly available and scalable in numbers of applications. Technology allowed us to be agile and to meet the needs of our community. It allowed us to stand up a testing site which actually allowed us to be, per capita, one of the highest testers in the state. We were able to do that not over weeks or months, but over days. And we have larger cities saying, how are you doing that? We had a couple of Cisco outdoor wireless antennas. We set up three carts that have the full equipment, the label printing and the registration, running our electronic medical record epic, all in those drive-through areas. We have one intensivist that cares for the sickest patients in, in our community at our hospital. How do we minimize his exposure to the COVID-19 virus? How do we minimize his use and need of PPE? We've implemented a robot that brings actually the provider to the bedside. And it allows us to minimize exposure to the provider and to maximize communication with the patient. 
We've stepped into this COVID pandemic and really looked at how do we leverage technology to make our processes safer, to deliver better care, to utilize resources in a different way than we ever have. When we have patients that go home after having COVID and we successfully minimized waste of PPE, we successfully allowed all the interaction between a doctor and a patient to happen, that's how we measure success. We have you, Cisco, and all of you that serve the IT industry, thinking outside the box, coloring outside the lines, continue to innovate, you're making a difference. In healthcare, we're grateful for that. Welcome back. So Liz and Danny really spoke about how Cisco is helping IT teams work together across the full stack of the Cisco app performance. And because we live in this all new digital world all the time, it's more important than ever to deliver the best user experience. And these new digital experiences are transforming the way that we live and work. Also, it's very impressive to see how Skylakes Medical apply that for patient care with COVID-19. So uh, right now, we do want to take some housekeeping. We want to remind you guys that we have surveys available after each session. So please plug those in. We want to hear what you think. It won't take you that long. I promise. I really promise. All right, guys, check out the WebEx Teams rooms. That's where you can find the Q&As. And that's where we're here together as a community to talk, to interact, to learn together. All right. And now we want to take the next 10 minutes or so and dive into a little deeper of some of what Danny and Liz were talking about. First up, we're going to do a little more on Cisco Intersight, and we have Brad Tarek for that. He is a data center architect with Cisco. He's going to share with you from a high level how Cisco Intersight works. Also, we're going to give you a teaser before we wrap. We have some really cool testimonials from Retail Bank, Key Bank. So that's going to be a teaser for you guys following up. All right, guys, so make sure that you're logging on on Cisco uh, Twitter. Uh, you can go on hashtag Cisco Live, and you can tag us also on Instagram hashtag Cisco Live. We want to hear what you think. We will, we will be reading your tweets throughout the show. So for those who really say something amazing that catches our eye, we're going to be reading that back to the community. Don't forget we have performances coming this afternoon, and let's move over to the session right now. See you guys. So how does this work? Cisco Intersight leverages the tight connection from the Intersight cloud service to the various device connectors running on out-of-band baseboard management controllers and software endpoints. This highly secure connection is established as a durable WebSockets connection between the device connector and the Intersight service. This logical connection is established when the end device is claimed to your Intersight account. Cisco is responsible for maintaining and updating the software running as part of the Intersight service and the endpoint-based device connector. The end customer is, has no responsibility in maintaining this code. This agile model allows Cisco to utilize a continuous integration, continuous deployment methodology, or CICD methodology, for pushing new capabilities and updates. We can act very fast on customer feedback and requests for capabilities. So Intersight is always evolving and always changing. So we've just talked about what Intersight can do for you. Now let's take a moment and talk about how the parts of Intersight fit together and how all of this works. So we talked about how Intersight is this cloud-based service. It can live either externally in our cloud, or it can live in your data center in your cloud. So I'm drawing this with this pretty cloud here, if you will. And this is our Intersight cloud, where we have all of the, the microservices running that make up Intersight. You know, things like the recommendation engine, automation engine, those things that we talked about earlier. Those all run in this cloud. Now, in order for it to perform infrastructure operations against the devices in my data center, I need a hook in there. I need something that allows me to communicate securely with that endpoint. So I'm going to talk through some examples on how, we, how this all works, and then I think you'll begin to understand how the pieces and parts fit together. So let's just start with a real common example. Let's just say that I've got a C-series C server or a series of C-series servers in my environment. So I'll draw that out here. Here's my C-series server. Now, on each C-series server, I have a baseboard management controller, BMC. We, um, 
sometimes call that an integrated management controller or a Cisco integrated management controller, SIMC. And one of the things that we've started doing with our current generations of servers is we've embedded in the baseboard management controller a piece of software called the device connector. This device connector gets delivered as part of a firmware bundle and it, it gets installed then on top of the, of the baseboard management controller. Now this device connector is responsible for communicating securely to the InterSight cloud. So we go through this process called device registration when we want to set this system up to be managed by InterSight and put in my InterSight portal. I've got a separate video on that. You can go ahead and view that as to how that all works. But right now, this device connector, for the sake of this video, basically establishes a secure connection over port 443, a durable WebSockets connection, if you will, to the InterSight cloud. So it's encrypted. And that allows InterSight to perform services and functions against this system. So I can do things like push policy down to the system, tell the system by talking through the device connector uh, to make API calls to the baseboard management controllers that do things like power it on, power it off, or change a BIOS policy, things like that. So I do that through the device connector. The device connector is sort of the secret hook into InterSight. Well, what about systems that aren't just standalone C-series servers. Maybe I've got a pair of fabric interconnects that are responsible for my blade systems or a bunch of C-series servers wired up through those fabric interconnects. Well, in this environment, I've got UCS Manager running across those fabric interconnects, a device connector. So that device connector goes through the same claiming process that I mentioned earlier and it establishes a secure, durable WebSockets connection up into the InterSight cloud that allows me to perform operations against these systems hanging off of my Fabric interconnects. Well, I could, you know, what, what about Hyperflex clusters? So maybe I've got an HX seri series of HX systems here. Well, embedded in that software, guess what? We have a device connector. So this device connector, again, establishes a secure, secure connection up to InterSight. And as we go on through the data center, there are other data center services, of course, that have device connectors embedded in them. Things like UCS Director, NIA, NIR, APIC. So you can see how this all is going to map into the InterSight cloud and allow us to perform functions through InterSight, talking to these device connectors against these devices and services in your data center. Thank you. back you guys it was so great to hear about cisco intersight from brad turek intersight of course is a SaaS systems management platform as well as a cloud-based service that bridges the gap between infrastructure and applications okay so now that you have seen how it works at a higher level we thought it would be a great idea to see a quick demo on this solution at work so we're going to hear from brad again he's going to focus more on the d cloud environment um, and show you what the console looks like and how you can work with it we hope you guys enjoy this next short session of course if you're watching keep tweeting um, hashtag cisco live on twitter and instagram we love seeing your replies um, enjoy this next session and we will see you right afterwards All right, let's do a demo. So as you can see, I've logged into my InterSight portal and I have three environments that I have access to. For the sake of this demo, we're going to focus on this dCloud environment and notice that it's in a read-only mode. So I'm gonna drill into that and we're bringing up sort of a view of the InterSight environment and we're gonna be able to see information about my, inter uh, about my systems that are being managed under InterSight. I will not, because I'm in a read-only mode, I will not be able to make configuration changes, do things like push firmware and those types of things through this environment. So I logged in and I'm immediately presented with this dashboard that's showing me a whole bunch of widgets that display information about my environment. And it's broken down in various formats uh, depending on the widget that I've selected. So over here you can see I've got a server inventory breakdown. 
of um, you know 182 total systems, and they're broken down by the types of systems that there are. They are looks like B series, C series, etc. I've also got a server health summary and some of those types of things. I can move these widgets around and display this information in any way that seems appropriate to me, or anything, or any any way that seems uh, uh, helpful for me. I can also add a different widget if I want. I'll go ahead and add one of my favorite widgets, and that is these custom metric widgets, because I think this just gives you a view of the power of Intersight. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a custom metric around the top five ports by traffic, and I'll just pick on this first domain here, and we'll go ahead and add that widget to my environment. So I'll close that, minimize that, and if we scroll down to my dashboard here, now I can see these top five ports by traffic, and I can see a breakdown of the actual utilization of each of these individual ports. So this is just a, a view of the various dashboards that I have available to me over here. Now, in the upper right-hand corner, I've got a help option. If I drill into this help, I can see that I can take a tour of the environment, or I can get more help on Intersight, or I can send feedback. I'd encourage you to use feedback to submit ideas to Cisco about how to improve it, or if you find a bug, be sure to let us know through this feedback. These are monitored by real people. Um, but if I want to go ahead and drill into the help, I can get a very robust experience in this help section. It, this help is updated regularly, so with every new feature, we actually update the help so that it's, it's a living document. If I want to see when we release new capabilities or features, if I drill into this features section, it will actually show me a breakdown of what capability was released when. I'm not going to go into that right now, but just know that that's there, and I would encourage you to use it as you're getting familiar with Intersight. Now, from here, I can um, go ahead and use some of these widgets to my advantage. Uh, I want to see a server health summary. Well, I've got seven servers here that are in a critical state. Let's drill into those seven systems, if you will, and figure out what, what's going on. Well, here they are, and sure enough, yep, seven of them are in a critical state. Now, I want to call it a couple of things. I've got a number of columns available to me here that are showing me different information about my systems, um, different information based on what I would want to see about my systems. If I look, there's a particularly interesting one here called the contract status. And if you look at this and you go ahead and hover over the contract status for a given system, I can see that this top system has a contract start date that um, is a few years ago and an end date that's coming up pretty soon. So it's telling me that it's going to expire very soon. And I can even see the service level or the contract type uh, for this given system. So I'd encourage you to use this contract status to see, the, uh, to, to see what's going on with your support contracts. Now, meanwhile, let's get back to what we were originally doing here. We were looking at these systems to figure out what could be going on. So let's go to this first system and see what's going on with this this first system. So I can see that this is a blade living in a 5108 chassis. It is a B200 M3. And if I look at this, I can get a breakdown of some very, of some ba very basic information about the environment. But I know that it's in a critical state. Well, if I hover over these hard drives, there's no, no issues there with the hard drives. And I have chosen to overlay my health status. But we know there is something wrong with the hardware. Let's look at the top view. Ooh, if I look at the top view here, I can, I'm immediately drawn to these two dims that are showing red. So sure enough, I've got two bad dims in this system. And if I look over here on the right-hand side, I can see the alarms that are associated with these two bad dims. So over on the right-hand side, I can see any alarm for specific systems that I'm, I'm currently working with. Now let's go back to the dashboards here. Something else that I want to call out is a capability that we call Intersight Advisories or Security Advisories. So I've just drilled into that and I notice that I've got two advisories here and if I look at them, here's a description of those advisories. Now I can see that I've got 30 affected devices by this top advisory um, and 15 affected devices by the second advisory. Let's just look at this top one and see what's going on. It's sort of a, of a medium uh, security level. If I drill into that, it's going to tell me all about that advisory and what's going on. And if I look down here, I can actually see the affected devices that are prone to this advisory. And from here, I can you know, actually display workarounds and things like that. And with, the, with an environment that's not read-only, I could actually even open a TAC case through this interface. So I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Customers are very excited about this capability. Now, I'll go back to the main dashboard here. 
Now, in terms of how this is laid out, over here on the left-hand side, we've got a list of things that are in InterSight. And with these things, as I drill into these things, I can, of course, see these things, but I can perform actions against these things. Now, because I'm in a read-only environment, I can't do things like push a firmware update or make a mass change, but this is normally how I would do it. So maybe I wanted to, I don't know, push a new firmware update for this system, this system, and this system. So that is where I would do that. I'd, I'd have an option up here to, to make a configuration change uh, through that interface. But anyway, the, the uh, intent here was just to give you a quick view of what the console looks like and how this is all displayed and how you can work with it. Thank you for your time. Welcome back. Great walkthrough from Brad. If you want to dive in a little deeper or see some more walkthrough demos, please visit our Cisco demo zone at www.cisco.com slash go slash demos. Now that you have some good background on Cisco InterSight and how that works, we want to share with you a couple one minute videos on the AppD application performance monitoring solution and the cognition engine that Danny touched on earlier in the hour. And don't forget, we'll have KeyBank following before we wrap. For those out here in the internet land, please check us out on hashtag Cisco Live on Twitter or Instagram, and we'll see you after the video. When you first log into AppDynamics, you're taken to the application flow map. Flow maps are a dynamic visual representation of the components and activities of your monitored application environment. Flow maps show the tiers, nodes, message queues, databases, and other components that make up your application environment. They also show the business transactions that flow through them. In the AppDynamics model, Events represent a change in the state of a monitored application. Health rules let you specify the parameters that represent what you consider normal. And since AppDynamics automatically calculates the baseline performance for your application and components, it can automatically detect anomalies in the performance of your application. We also present an aggregated view of many key metrics plus their dynamically calculated baselines, such as load, response times, and errors. With the AppDynamics agents deployed in your environment, it automatically discovers application components, maps application dependencies, and provides real-time performance data to give you the visibility and intelligence needed to drive application and business performance. People, services, and machines are more connected than ever before by the code you write and the experience it creates. That's why you can't afford to react to performance problems. You have to proactively solve for them. But how do you do that in today's complex application environment? With Cognition Engine from AppDynamics Cisco, an AI-powered solution that drives IT decision-making and business forward. Cognition Engine uses machine learning to understand your environment and create dynamic baselines for application health. Issues and anomalies are automatically detected giving you real-time insight into performance problems, while AI surfaces potential resolutions to both accelerate decision-making and help you avoid war room conflicts. With Cognition Engine, businesses can finally build a proactive approach to performance monitoring that connects business and outcomes. Welcome back, you guys. We just saw two great videos on how AppDynamics gives customers key metrics, automatically detects anomalies in their applications, and provides real-time performance data needed for good app performance. So wrapping up our segment on cloud, as promised, we wanted to share an exciting story from different ends of the customer spectrum. The next video is all about the banking industry and how Cisco hyper-converged solutions can help each bank achieve their goal of improving customer experience. So let's see how KeyBank Retail Banking achieve their goals. And we don't have mindfulness videos today, but take this time to just stretch in your chair and breathe. Enjoy this KeyBank video. We have 1,100 branches and around 1,100 ATMs, 25,000 employees, 140 billion in assets. It's almost a 200-year-old company. I think in the banking industry, you either transform digitally or you will not survive. We are a Cisco shop. We run a lot of Cisco product, including ACI and our 9Ks. And when it came to running Google product Anthos, it was a natural selection for us to partner with you. 
I think Anthos is a true differentiator for us, and I think about it in terms of releases that we can do, right? Where we can have actually releases that if we chose to using our agile methodology, we could have releases on a daily basis. We're excited for Hyperflex, the hyperconverged that we will run Anthos on. And I think it's really gonna be uh, something that's gonna take off for both companies. As I spoke to my engineers that did the work to set Anthos and Hyperflex up, the setup was seamless. So when we were looking at this cloud space, we found that Google had a unique, refreshing philosophy towards cloud that really attracted us towards working with them. They had this approach of an open cloud based on open platforms, based on open source, recognizing that there will be multiple clouds out there, which was very similar to our philosophy. Google was the natural choice for us just in terms of the, the security and the enterprise commitments that they've made. Welcome back. That was a very great introspective look from the Key Bank. Now we're going to talk about day two's afternoon agenda. This is our last afternoon together. So firstly, we're starting with the Cisco design portfolio, right size and right price for small businesses. Then we're going to get to collaborative intelligence and future innovations, how Cisco CX accelerates customer success, and how Cisco CX uses machine learning and AI to reduce your operational risk. Then we'll begin to accelerating transformation, innovation, and growth with automation and apps. And that's with Suzy Wee. So up next, we have Small Business Solutions with Didi Dasgupta and Nick Chrysis. Now, we're going to hear from the VP of Marketing, Didi, and we're going to hear from Nick Chrysis, who covers uh, business development. And they're going to be talking about how small businesses has gone through a major shift over the past few months. Now, Cisco is committed to helping small businesses with their most pressing challenge. See you after the session. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cisco Live 2020. You've just tuned into the Small Business Solutions segment. I'm going to be your host for today. My name is DD. I head up product marketing for Cisco's Small Business Solutions. Well, one of the most common questions I get these days is about the new normal, as in the life we're all living. Is this going to become the new normal moving forward? Well, in this case, the new normal is you're sitting in your business suit, you've got a cat on your shoulder, and you're staring at that laptop or you're talking to your friends and family and colleagues all at the same time, and they're probably doing the same. Well, for me, the new normal is very different. I am sitting here, standing here in my living room and doing a Cisco live presentation where typically I would be doing this with about a thousand people in the room. And at the same time, you're probably watching this session in your pajamas, sitting in your bedroom. So there is nothing normal about what's going on here. But having said that, the new normal may not be so bad when I think about, I don't have to travel two and a half hours, sit in the Bay Area traffic just to go to office and come back home. I can totally get used to this new normal. And that's what this session is about. It is not to dwell on what's here and now, but to really explore the possibilities that this new normal enables for all of us. I wanna talk about two customer examples, two Cisco customers who looked at possibilities within their industry segment, but then had the vision and the courage to act on it. This first customer is a company called Lamarck Media. Turns out Lamarck was born in the middle of the economic recession of 2009. But the founders of Lamarck knew from day one that the business is moving forward. Every business is going to be a digital first business. And so what they did is they started by digitizing their business first so that they could help their customers provide the marketing solutions for their customers in a digital first manner. My next example is an absolutely fascinating story about a company called Matternet. Matternet is in the business of moving medical supplies, test samples from one location to other, but with a twist. They do this with America's first FAA approved drone airline. And in fact, as we speak, 
Matternet is in a partnership with UPS and CBS, and they are supplying critical medicines to senior residents in Florida. Talk about contactless delivery, especially with what the world is going through right now. It's absolutely incredible what Matternet is able to achieve. It gives me great pleasure to let you know that both of these customers will be in our session today. We're going to have Brian, who is the CEO and founder of Lamarck Media, and Paolo, who is the head of engineering, the vice president of engineering at Matternet. They're going to join me later in this presentation on the customer panel. So let's take a quick look at the rest of the agenda. I'm going to spend a few more minutes talking to you about Cisco's overall business and technology strategy when it comes to the small business segment. I'll then be joined by my partner in crime, Nick Krisos, who is going to co-host the rest of this event with me. And Nick, Nick is going to have a group of product experts, a group of engineers who are going to talk to you about specific examples of how we are bringing new technologies and innovation across networking, across cloud managed infrastructure, across collaboration and security. You'll get an in-depth look and some real demos. And then I'll come back in with our customers and do the customer panel. We'll ask them about their transformation, their journey, and then I'll close out the session. So let's take a quick look at the small business life cycle. And friends, before joining Cisco, I've been here for about five years. Now, before Cisco, I was in startup land for a few years. And so I've lived the life of a small business owner. And I remember those early days when you've got less than 50 employees. Guess what? There is nobody dedicated for IT. IT is somebody's night job, somebody's weekend job. I remember I was the chief marketing officer by day and then I was setting up the network, setting up the Amazon environment during those nights and weekends. The requirements for your company at this early stage is pretty straightforward. All you're looking for is secure connectivity. But then from there, your company grows. Your requirements evolve. Now it's all about delivering applications because applications is the face of every modern business, whether you're big or small, whether you're based in the US or you're based somewhere else in the world, applications equals modern businesses. But to enable these applications, you have maybe one or two people who are supporting all of the IT requirements. I call these folks the IT unicorns because it's the same person that's figuring out what whiteboard to use in the morning. They're figuring out your networking requirements, your security requirements. They're setting up your cloud requirements. All of this is being done by maybe one guy or one gal. But then from here, the company grows even bigger. And maybe now you're at about 300 employees. Now you have to think about dedicating resources, somebody that's looking at just networking because your entire operations may be stretched across three different physical locations, maybe even different continents. Your security requirements are much more sophisticated. You have grown bigger as a company. That also makes you more vulnerable as a company to the attackers, to the hackers. You are trying to deliver number one customer experience, not just with your products and services, but every touch point with your customers. And IT becomes the strategic asset which is going to allow you to do this. Friends, the reason I'm bringing this chart in front of you is because every stage of your evolution, you're going to have different business requirements, different IT requirements. And that's where Cisco is your friend. We want to earn your respect and your business to becoming that lifetime partner as you grow from small all the way to a mid-size to a large company where you have maybe you start with five employees to 50 to 500, someday 5,000 employees, we're the only vendor that has solutions for every stage of your growth. And we're doing this with a maniacal focus on the top five areas you've told us where you need help from an IT perspective. Let me go through this real quick. Well, the first one is a no-brainer given everything that's going on in the world right now, which is how do you enable secure work from home 
for your employees. Not just the collaboration equipment and video endpoints, but is this everything secure? Is the networking reliable? Which brings me to my next point around cybercrime protection. And it's really sad that just in the last two months since we've had the pandemic, FBI tells us that the number of cyber attacks have quadrupled. And so what our customers, what you are telling us that you need is multi-layer of protection. How you protect your data, your people, your devices, the identity, the applications that run your business. And we've got that end-to-end -end solution. Well, pandemic or not, your business can never go down. And so we're committed in keeping your business up and running no matter what is going on. And to do that, we have brought a lot more of cloud innovations and cloud technologies. Because guess what? During the pandemic, we didn't have people or on-site IT that would go to your homes, that would go to your offices. Everything had to be done from the cloud. And a lot of IT jobs were being or have to do by yourself. And so that's how we enable the always on business. Let's look at workplace monitoring, because even when things open up, we're still going to have to keep the safe social distance between employees, between customers, between guests at your physical locations, whether it's an office, a store, a restaurant, a hospital, a coffee shop, so on and so forth. And that's what we're enabling with workplace monitoring solutions, both for equipment as well as for humans. And last but not least, the future of the office. What's going to happen to the future of these physical spaces? Well, first off, we know there will be a lot fewer physical spaces, but they'll also be a lot more shared, where employees and companies even will be sharing the same office space, sharing the same collaboration equipment. And the one thing you need to make that possible is very simple IT solutions and very high security with things like segmentation and identification, which is going to be a lot more important. All right, so we've got a jam-packed agenda in front of us, but let's go and watch a quick video about how we're enabling secure work-from-home solutions for our small business customers. Working from home is the new normal. That's good news because workplace flexibility can improve employee productivity and reduce costs for your business and your employees like it too. In fact, 80% of workers say they would turn down a job that didn't offer flexible working. To attract and retain top talent, remote work is a benefit you simply can't ignore. But you've got to do it right. Data needs to be safe and protected from cyber attacks, and your employees shouldn't feel isolated or out of touch with the rest of the team. You don't have to be an IT expert to set up remote work capabilities. You just need reliable, secure solutions that are easy to set up and simple to manage. Cisco has years of experience supporting remote workers, including our own. Our collaboration tools seamlessly integrate with existing Wi-Fi and Internet equipment and can be deployed within minutes. Cisco Security verifies employee identities and encrypts communications for added protection. And you can manage it all from the cloud without the need for on-site IT personnel. Now your employees have everything they need to stay productive and secure from their homes, in the office, and on the move. Let's get started. Our Cisco-designed portfolio of products can help you deliver a great, secure experience for your remote workers so you can focus on what matters most, growing your business. Ladies and gentlemen, really happy to be here. My name is Nick Rissus and I'm the global CTO for small and commercial segments. Um, the perception of Cisco technology in small business has always been that Cisco is maybe too complicated, maybe too big, maybe too expensive for small business. And this is the reason that we wanted to create the Cisco design portfolio. Everything starts from the user trying to access the network. And this is where most of the security issues happen. 81% of all the network bridges, bridges is, is due to a poor password, to a weak password. 
and uh, and not a good uh, password control management policy is responsible for all this. So we introduce the Cisco Duo, a multi-factor authentication process which creates uh, which which really addresses the problem of the poor pure password of the of the weak password, but at the same time it really creates the ability to certify and authenticate the user using multiple devices. The first requirement in a small business is the wireless access. And that's why we had to offer really the, the, the right product at the right size and the offer of the deployment into the, to offer the choice in the deployment if they wanted on premises or actually cloud managed. From the Cisco business access points, the small form factor, the full extended uh, feature set, but at the right price, starting only from $120 list price, to the Meraki access points with the extensive, uh, extensive range, but also extremely easily to install, manage, and support. And for the customers, the really small customers that they're really looking for the, for the, for the right price point, we introduced a few months ago the Meraki Go, getting the, the, uh, the simplicity of installation and the right price point for our really small customers. Behind our access points, we have our switches that they provide the connectivity, but also the power distribution. And again, from the cloud management uh, um, of Meraki with an extensive range of switches to the, uh, to the Cisco business switches that they are providing the on-premise solution. And they scale up to our catalyst range for our customers with more, with more switching demands. To connect to the internet and to connect to the outside world, we actually need routers. And again, we start from our Cisco business RV range of, of, of routers that they combine switching and routing and security features. And then we go into our Meraki portfolio with the MX series that they combine routing and security features all in a single box managed from the cloud. But security is not only just on the router. Uh, when we are actually trying to go to the outside world, it's critical that we have safety in what we access. And Umbrella is designed exactly for that. It's designed to vet every single website that we're accessing and is designed to really cover the needs of every business going outside to the internet. Combining this with our firewall capabilities and something like PowerPoint 1010 really can provide the, the protection that we need for incoming and outgoing traffic. But don't forget also for the cloud managed kind of capabilities and the cloud managed deployment. The Meraki MX series is really providing all the security features that we need for a firewall. We add to that the advanced malware protection with uh, Cisco AMP and then we can really protect ourselves from, from, from malware that is hidden within files. Ideal for the latest kind of security threats that we, we are facing. And for remote workers, this is where we go to the AnyConnect uh, client. AnyConnect allows uh, to extend our network to home workers without really sacrificing any of the security features. And it pairs with our FivePower 1010 and of course, with our RV uh, routers in our Cisco business, uh, uh, Cisco business range. On top of all this, overarching our security products is Talos. And, and Talos is this, this amazing intelligence engine that uses all our products as sources of knowledge to build intelligence for the latest security threats. Talos is responsible for 20 billion uh, thread uh, blocking every day and then it passes this intelligence back down into our products, making even a small business with a firepower 1010 at, at its edge as secure as the Bank of America. And then smart cameras, Meraki Vision. Um, a lot of people will, will say that Meraki cameras are just CCTV cameras. They are so much more than that. On top of being cloud managed, on top of not need any on-premise storage, Meraki cameras have intelligence inside to count people, count products, and then they have APIs to interface to any application out there open, we're using open standards. Being able to create uh, solutions for managing queues to social distancing. And then we go into compute. 
we have to look into compute. And although we do understand that the small business customers will not build their own data centers, there is always a need for on-premises applications to run, and there is a need for on-premise data storage combined in this kind of uh, hybrid IT model with applications from the cloud. And for that reason, we introduced the Hyperflex Edge, really combining compute and storage onto a single blo uh, block, while actually we improved the Intersight uh, to provide the intelligence to be able to manage our applications. And if our applications extend beyond our premises, App Dynamics really provide the solution to be able to monitor and to be able to control the applications that are critical for our business. Adding to this our collaboration portfolio with, uh, with, uh, from soft clients to hardware clients, with our video endpoints to our room endpoints. And I don't want to spoil the surprise, but you will see also how we are bringing our collaboration portfolio inside the small business. And looking at it all together, this is what the Cisco design portfolio is all about, providing this extensive kind of uh, portfolio uh, product set to provide solutions for all the small business needs. Let me now bring Chantan. Chantan for our Cisco business, uh, Cisco business portfolio to give us uh, a bit of insight of what's new and what is coming. Thank you very much, Nick. I think that was certainly uh, really valuable for our customers to watch. Uh, let me go through in detail as to what we have been doing as part of the Cisco design in Cisco business. So as, as Nick, you mentioned, we, we started investing in this portfolio starting way back in November with the whole small business strategy focus of what the portfolio needs to look like. Uh, in March, we actually launched and now orderable all the Cisco business wireless access points, mesh extenders and mesh bundles along with industry leading Cisco business wireless app. What we are here for and very pleased to announce and launch today is the Cisco business switches and Cisco business dashboard product portfolio that is helping us complete a journey for the Cisco small focus customers. And as you can go now into detail of Cisco business dashboard that gives our customers a single place to visualize everything running from a network perspective. It could be run by the customer in their choice of infrastructure, could be in their on-prem or could run in their cloud choice. So it gives them flexibility. It is a single interface for everything to do with network lifecycle, including discovery, monitoring, configuration, and operations of the infrastructure, including Cisco business switches and routers and APs. It provides lifecycle management, which is very important for these customers uh, and allows uh, zero touch deployment. We will go through dashboard in a bit more detail as well, but let me also unveil a particular product line called Cisco Business Switches here for our customers. Uh, we build these switches with a focus on starting from how can we provide a very, very interesting and awesome experience starting out of the box from Switches perspective itself. Started with the packaging, which is eco-friendly uh, and allows for a quick start guide for a person that is doing IT job and a CFO job and a customer to actually set up these switches themselves. When you look at the switches, they're the most beautiful switches on the planet today. They are built with the perspective of that these switches are not going to be just kept in the closet, but they could be kept even on your desk, depending because most small businesses are agile. They don't have, like enterprises, everything to be kept in a certain closet or MDF and everything else. The other part, from a painting perspective, from the icons on the switch, we have, we have given a lot more attention on what would be a lot more visually appealing and insightful for our customers when they look at the switches. The next slide goes a little bit more detail into one of the industry leading managed switches for this small segment. These are easy to use CBS 350 CDs with industry leading features for a future proof deployment. All of our switches have capabilities with respect to the 350 CDs from a layer three perspective. So you could set up a layer three routing function if you need. Uh, they come with web UI or a full CLI support if you want to go and configure. Each of these switch have an embedded probe uh, for connecting to the dashboard. What that means is that you don't need to put another VM or another desktop to only be acting as a network probe, which is what some of our competition needs. So you can now save that cost. Uh, all of these switches support what we call a sample flow. Uh, that means that you can get into a lot more insights and analytics. And you, you can look at the price here right now, which is, you know, we have made it very sure that it is actually in the range 
where our customers would like to deploy it. Uh, these switches come up with PoE and PoE Plus. One key feature that I want to highlight is where we are more sensitive about the business operations for our customers is advanced replacement program. Cisco business switches of 350 series come with advanced replacement program. What that means is that should a switch fail, we will, without waiting for you to ship the older gear, we will be able to ship a new product to you while your, your failed switch is in transit. That way we are a lot more cognizant of it to be from a business continuity perspective. The next slide talks about CBS 250 series, which is our smart series range, starting at $235. These switches provide the best layer two connectivity that you can think of. Everything supports PoE Plus, so you could actually power your IT OT devices. They have capability of auto detecting a collab device, the ones that you mentioned uh, just in, in your session, as well as Wi-Fi APs. So you can now connect all of those things and the switch can do auto configuration. They provide the market leading price performance and have uplinks up to 10 gigabit if you need that bandwidth. These switches also support uh, the um, return to factory uh, replacement warranty that allows our customers to make sure that they have peace of mind in case the switch fails, we could give them that capability. Uh, both of these switch lines support a little bit more detail on the energy efficient ethernet here. We follow a standard called 802.3az uh, that supports to lower your power during low uh, traffic quiet periods. So, John, I mean, I mean, this is this is really really excellent. But where does this fit into the rest of the portfolio? And you talked about the dashboard at the beginning. How does this really fit to the dashboard? And how does the dashboard then cover the other products in the same range? Um, absolutely. I think that's that's a pretty important question for our customers. So when, when you see on this particular uh, slide here where we want to highlight some of those capabilities, uh, so the Cisco Business Dashboard, uh, which is the one place to visualize everything related to network infrastructure, provides access to not only CBS switches, but also our gear that is SG series of switches, which has been in the field for about 10 plus years now. Uh, and the dashboard actually allows for everything to do with zero touch deployment using PNP. Uh, all the devices have what we call as embedded CBD pro uh, probing, uh, Cisco Business Dashboard probe. Um, these dashboard access gives you uh, reporting for life cycle of the product line. Is it end of life? Is there a warranty challenge? Are there any vulnerabilities that I should be worried about? All of those things at your fingertips. And this dashboard gives you operations for backup and restoration of the configs. You can do any of those things. And, and finally, on this slide, I just want to highlight this is such a beautiful network that comes totally in place for a small business network. This is a, a network view of what you had in your initial slide. Nick, if you, if you kind of visualize from that angle, you have a desktop or a client coming in from the left. They could come in from a switch or could come in from a mesh extender or an AP. They could be powered using PoE like a, a IP camera. All of these connected with the RV, which is the Cisco business router capability here, connecting those customers to their SaaS application. All of this possible with just one portfolio that can give them access to everything at the price points and the Cisco committed brand to help them go through the small business transition. Chantan, this is, this is brilliant. Thank you, really. Thank you very much. Um, let's now move to Jivan uh, from our Meraki product marketing team. Jivan, welcome. Nick, thank you again for inviting me. This is an incredible opportunity for me to talk about Meraki portfolio and the latest innovations in this again. In 2006, Meraki was founded with a single mission to simplify networking. And today, I'm going to tell you how Meraki is going to simplify troubleshooting. So here is a problem statement. Networks are mission critical. You might be a small business owner who wants to get point of sale uh, turned on so your customer can walk in, you know, buy a cup of coffee using a credit card. For that, your network cannot go down. Now, if you think about the problems of an IT administrator, you know, you've got um, client devices from one vendor, you've got access points from somebody else, switches from somebody else, you know, routers from somebody else trying to patch them together. There are too many screens. They don't talk to each other. There's no continuous information exchange. And the last part is you don't know why the point of sale application actually went down. By the way, if it worked great yesterday, why is it not working now? So with Meraki, we've actually taken our millions of devices and hundreds of millions of clients. And first and foremost, we have a single dashboard to show you everything. 
and we've taken our data to do application based learning i'm here to introduce two new products for you meraki health which gives you end to end view from your client to your ap to your switch to your mx product line and on the right hand side you've got meraki insight meraki insight gives you application based learning it tells you why is your office 365 you know not working well in this second when it worked great yesterday this this looks amazing why don't you just show us let's make it real let's go to the demo what are we looking at nick uh, thanks again for giving me this opportunity to give a quick demo firstly we have a college which is sweet briar college that's actually located on the east coast of the united states that has given us permission to show their network so you're looking at a real live network now imagine if uh, pmin gave you the call and you are managing the network for a small business uh, this person said i'm having all sorts of network connectivity you're going to say wait a minute let me go and search for this particular user this particular client and then very quickly first thing you can see you can see a view from the client to the access point connected to another access point connected to you know another access point as you can see this is actually up, you know going over a mesh network you might be a small business that's actually the point three access points connected by a mesh you should be able to understand where does the problem lie now you can actually see this very clearly that the problem actually happened during a uh, client to the access point using you know while at the phase of 802.1x authentication this means when you enter the username password that's where the problem is lying so you can understand um you know now if you scroll down you can understand where are most of the issues happening with this particular client the most of the problems are happening during the phase of authentication so if the first authentication is where you're failing then you can actually understand that beyond that the performance and latency and so on they are almost sort of a secondary in nature another cool so thing you can yeah go ahead yeah. so so jivan just just to ask so this is somebody called said that i have problems to connect to my network and then immediately you can go and see into that detail for the specific client that these 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 are the issues Exactly. You can actually uh, firstly do a quick reactive debugging, but you as a network administrator can also look at it at a much more, uh, you know, advanced level at an access point level, for example. So if you start scrolling up into this particular access point, you can actually start understanding how many clients are actually connected. Now, at this particular point, there's only one client connected on the AP. but if you could see many clients are getting disconnected you can quickly isolate that the problem may be actually happening at the access point level you could zoom up and go one more step up and you could understand is the problem happening at the network level so you can actually go at every layer of your network and start debugging troubleshooting start understanding is it a performance problem is it a connectivity problem you know all the different phases all the real time data performance this is actually happening right now this is a real person that's connected on the network in this school and this is what we are monitoring at this moment and, and jivan this is this is available through the dashboard for even a small business that they just bought a few access points they will be able from anywhere in the world to see what is the problem for a user connecting to their network even if it's a it's a micro business Absolutely. Um, you might be a customer that is bought from Meraki five years ago, seven years ago. Any Wi-Fi access point, you know, any kind of switching gear, you know, you should be able to get advantage of this. This is the power of the cloud. This is the power of the simplicity. We are making it so that we'll help you understand what is the problem and what do you do to solve it. Brilliant. So that's really the interesting thing. You could actually click on connections, performance. history and learn a lot more details about about uh, meraki health but i just wanted to give you a quick teaser so is now the insight so is the meraki insight because that sounded also really impressive yeah absolutely so we were looking at the network view with meraki health now let's look at meraki insight just like the example that i gave you last time 
you might be a small business that's actually monitoring your email using Gmail. Now, uh, all the new Meraki Insight is a thing called as Smart Threshold. Once you toggle this particular Smart Threshold and turn it on, you click on Gmail, you start looking at the trends. You can understand how is Gmail performing over a period of time. Now, look, uh, if you're a small business owner, you don't even know what is good performance, what is poor performance. So at this point of time, you know, what we've done for you is we have drawn this dotted line for you to give you an idea of what is a good baseline. So you know that Gmail should get at least a certain amounts of megabits per second. If the performance is going below that, we will quickly mark it as red. So as you can see, this gray line is turning red. And you can understand that, Nick, you know, if you were the user at this point and your Gmail is not refreshing, you are not getting the new customer order that you are really waiting to get. And this is where your end user is going to be upset with you. So that's and, the and power just, of Meraki just to Insight. Understand, just to understand, because I think this is, this is, this is very critical. The dotted yeah. line that you described there, the baseline, is, is not designed by me. I didn't decide that I want this baseline. It's actually Meraki knowing what is the best baseline for that application out of thousands of other customers deciding for me that this is the best baseline that I could have for my business. Millions of customers with hundreds of millions of clients, Nick. I mean, this is the power of the cloud and the big data. We know what's a good baseline, but we are optimizing it for your network, for your small business. And we draw this special dotted line for you per application. So you can basically monitor it and say, is it good or is it bad? And Quickly, if you know that for your end user, you can actually debug and troubleshoot it. Jivan, thank you very much. This was uh, this was really, uh, really, really exciting and really uh, amazing to see the changes in our Meraki uh, portfolio, the enhancements in our Meraki portfolio. But let me now go to John. John from our security security uh, product marketing. Um, John, welcome. Hey Nick, thanks for having me today. Um, so today we're going to talk about a new product offering that's coming out of the Cisco Secure email product family. We're announcing it today at Cisco Live. And this new product offering is Cloud Mailbox Defense, which will protect your Office 365 deployments. You know, as you know, email is the number one attack vector, right? And so the whole world is basically moving their email platforms from on-prem to the cloud. So as folks migrate to the cloud, they're finding that their Office 365 deployments aren't as secure as they thought they were. And so, you know, they're getting hit with all sorts of cyber threats, right? They're getting hit with business email compromise, phishing attacks, spoofing attacks, account takeovers. And so this is all happening and small businesses are feeling, you know, that they're putting so much time and money into mitigating these issues. What we're offering today with Cloud Mailbox Defense is the ability to protect your Office 365 deployments. And so this is a cloud native product. It protects, again, against all of these cyber threats that come in through the number one attack vector being email. And it is great for a variety of market segments from small, mid to large. But we're finding in particularly that this is a great product for small business deployments. And so, so John, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. Uh, Didi yeah. earlier talked about the five top use cases based on the on the top uh, challenges that small businesses are facing today. And if you mm -hmm. notice, uh, you know, uh, the the number two one was cybercrime protection. Really focusing in what our portfolio can do into uh, into protecting the small businesses from cybercrime. Where does uh, cloud mailbox defense? fit in our total portfolio of security products uh, for small businesses. Yep, this fits beautifully in the cybersecurity protection for small business use case. So, and uh, there's a few reasons why we think that in particularly that that fits very well. So this is a simple to deploy cloud managed product, right? That again is um, integrated with your Office 365 deployment. Um, where, what we also see is that this is competitively priced. 
uh, in which you know the the seat counts go down to 25 uh, seats and above. So the idea is that this is really great for those small businesses that you know want to grow over time. They have the ability to grow their license packages, and and ideally, you know, this is something that we know that small businesses like. It's like I said, easy to manage, simple to deploy, is competitively um, priced. And honestly, you know, small businesses want to move quick, they want to move fast, they don't have time to manage product on site. This is all cloud managed. And so it really gives them that speed and agility that they look for in order for them to be successful and focus on their core competency. That sounds brilliant. And rapidly deployed. I mean, one of the of the issues that small businesses are facing today is really how fast they can deploy the product that they just purchased. And and having as a cloud architecture and delivered from the cloud sounds sounds brilliant. And this new product offering is Cloud Mailbox Defense, which will protect your Office 365 deployments. John, thank you very much. This was really, uh, really, really, really brilliant to see uh, this new enhancement in our security portfolio. And now let's move to Rachel. Rachel from our uh, collaboration marketing team, uh, really going to talk to us about the enhancement to our collaboration portfolio. Thank Rachel? you for okay. having me on, Nick. I really appreciate it. And this collaboration offering really blends in nicely what, what Javon and John was talking about. So this bundle is available now. Um, it is called the WebEx Work Bundle, and what's included is all cloud solutions for calling, so it's WebEx calling, WebEx meetings, and WebEx messaging. Um, it's all delivered through one app, um, and it is a complete cloud solution specifically designed um, and bundled together for a small business. And so we are giving the small businesses a starting price of $19.99 per user per month. Um, which is a discounted rate from what our enterprise solution is, but you are getting the same exact uh, service, just like Javon said for the Meraki um, offerings. It's the same service, no matter if you're one person or hundreds of thousands, you get the same exact bundle. And it's it's this is designed um, with calling, messaging, meeting to work throughout your entire day. So you've got, um, the world has suddenly gone remote. So you need a collaboration solution that has built in to the way you work from anywhere, any time of the day. So messaging is um, part of your uh, persistent conversation all day long. If you want to weave in your workflows, whether it's uh, Trello or Office 365 or anything else that you want to integrate with your day to day conversations, you can do that. Calling works on any device, and um, so that will mask your personal phone number. So if you have a team that you want them to use their own devices, uh, but not uh, they don't want to share their phone number with your potential clients, calling helps sort of mask that over. So it's really a nice piece of uh, piece of the the product we've got there. And then WebEx meetings is like what we're in right now, um, uh, and you can use that for it's not just for formal meetings, but also for like one to one sessions. Um, and so that these three solutions are really meant to build in your whole entire day. And all of this is developed and delivered within one single app. Um, so that makes it really nice uh, that it's any device. So we do have Cisco devices, of course, we would love for you to use for that uh, optimal experience, but it works on laptops, smartphones, anything you've got. So it just it works with your current investment today, which makes it nice. Um, and like uh, Javon was saying that Meraki had the Meraki Health, we have the uh, Cisco Control Hub. And so what this does, it allows you, again, you, like just like uh, was said before, you don't need any special training to get started. It has everything out of you, simple, plain language, easily to navigate UI. So you can do, um, you can provision your users, you can uh, check troubleshooting, you can run analytics. And what's also nice is that, um, the provisioning of those licenses are done right here through Control Hub. So whether you have a, um, a business of one or a business of 20, 30, um, this is all working together within Control Hub so you can deploy those seats. And then all of this is built on a the security that you know and love from Cisco. So whether you are on a Cisco network or on your home network or at a Starbucks, there is security built in to this collaboration solution that um, that has Cisco's name on it. So you know that we are we are committed to your privacy of your data 
Um, we are secure by design and we are transparent about any kind of security um, issues that may come up or new regulations that come up so you know that we, we've got your back. Um, and then uh, what's also nice is you can add these devices. So we have targeted the uh, small business uh, sector for hardware as a service. So you can try, once you guys get back into the office and you want to try our hardware, we have um, special monthly pricing for several pieces of our uh, portfolio for WebEx rooms or the phone. So you can add that to that $19.95 per month. Uh, this is available in three-year commitments uh, for the U.S. So that makes it uh, really nice to bundle those two together. So Rachel, I mean this is brilliant. One one thing that I, I think it's it's worth to really mentioning here is that the security that you talked about is on top of all the security that I was talking up to now about, you know, the security of our network. We're talking about another layer of security within our collaboration platform. And and this is this is on top of what we already have to secure the network. But I do have one question. You mentioned this amazing offer, 1995, and then you put the, the WebEx meetings, the WebEx calling, which really can replace any, any kind of uh, communication system today, and, uh, and of course, the, the WebEx messaging. But, but how small? I mean, we're talking here about a small business. What is the smallest size that we can actually get this offer to? So we will sell to a business of one. Um, so if you are just one person, and what's nice about provisioning this is, say you are a, uh, you have seasonal uh, ups and downs of your business. So like a, a tax, uh, tax accountant, for example, during tax season, you may want to hire 20 employees. And when tax season is over, uh, it's just back down to that one person. So within Control Hub, you can increase the number of users and decrease at month over month. So that is flexible. There is not a long term commitment there. So as long as you have one seat, you get access to that price. Rachel, thank you very much. This is uh, this is this is this is uh, this is this is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It gives me a great honor and privilege to welcome our first customer from Lamarck Media. Please welcome Brian, who is the CEO of Lamarck Media. Brian, welcome to the show. And let me start by asking you a question around how did you digitize your own business? I know you're helping customers digitize their business, but it's got to start with digitizing your own business. So tell us a little bit about how you went about doing that. Absolutely. And, and first, uh, thanks for having me on today. Uh, I'd love to tell you a bit more about our business and, and how we've taken the digital first uh, mentality to the next level. I started the business 11 years ago, and the goal was to be a digital first uh, performance marketing company. So we were born in digital, uh, but that also required you know understanding what the right technologies were to be able to deliver our, our multi-channel offering to our clients. So our business model is, is goals-oriented. We believe businesses should leverage marketing to create business outcomes, not the other way around. And everything we do is measurable, uh, trackable, and reportable. So technology was a very important piece that we touched early on, looking at the three kind of main pillars of a service-based business, which is people, process, and technology, and being able to lever those things to create uh, very measurable outcomes for our clients. So our business is a full-service marketing partnership for our clients. We look at the world holistically, understanding that marketing is a driver to business goals. And so we build these programs out, whether it's leveraging the creative side and web development through all the different paid media and strategic media programs from SEO to SEM to social media, uh, programmatic, all the way through some digital versions of traditional media, and then ultimately analytics, BI, and business intelligence. Um, technology ties all those things together so that we can understand what's working, what's not, and move those dollars across that system agnostically, really leverage portfolio theory type approach to a marketing business, which is really a unique piece of our business and our story. That's awesome, Brian. That's awesome. So you've got all of these different lines of businesses and you've got the underlying IT that stitches them all together. That's phenomenal. So let me ask you the next question. I can see you're working from home and I'm guessing a lot of your employees are working from home as well. Tell us a little bit about how you might have had to reconsider things like security and reliability as you and your employees and your customers are probably all working from home with what is going on in the world right now. Yeah, absolutely. We actually been remote for two months, so uh, this hasn't been new for us. Um, you know, a couple of things. One, as a performance driven uh, marketing partner, our clients need us more than ever. You know, we really consider ourselves a partner, not a vendor. And I told our team before going remote, this is when we prove who we are. This is how we show the world 
that we really are partners and we're here to help our clients get through this pandemic uh, and, and make sure we get out the other side. So the performance is key and performance is predicated on our ability to do our job. So our ability to perform really relies on technology now more than ever since we are remote, we needed to be able to transition quickly. I think we moved from offices, we have an office in South Florida and Austin, Texas, to a fully remote workspace, uh, so to speak, within about three to four days. Um, so we really moved a lot of our technology over. We already had uh, quite a bit on uh, the cloud, on the Azure cloud system um, with the Cisco umbrella, but we were able to really extend that through that process um, and get remote quickly. I think within that week, that work week, we said, okay, we can go remote without any productivity loss. Um, and the, is the issues are, can we still hit goals? Can we still be on top of communication? Can we provide the real-time reporting? And so we need our tech stack to be able to do that. Um, so that we could go to our clients and our partners and say, we're here for you, nothing will change, we're responsive, and all of our tech is operating in the office at full efficiency. And that's what we had to ensure to make sure that we could bring the value that we bring to our to our partnerships. Great, so you're using Cisco for, for securing as you're working from home, you're using it for the networking, which you know is, was in the office, but now extend all the way to home, and then all of our collaboration tools, that's, that's phenomenal. And so it all kind of comes together. Excellent. Brian, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for your business. Wishing you all the best. Thanks for having me and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our next customer is Matternet. And I'm so excited to have Paulo, who is the Vice President of Engineering for Matternet. Paulo, welcome to Cisco Live. And I tried my best to articulate your company's vision earlier in this presentation, but you do such a better job. So tell us about the vision for Matternet and maybe some of the technical hurdles you've had to overcome to implement that vision. Sure, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me on, Didi. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, so Matternet's mission is to make access to physical goods as seamless and equitable as the internet has made access to data. Uh, our primary focus is on the urban B2B healthcare logistics sector. But just last week, we did our first direct-to-customer deliveries uh, in partnership with UPS and CVS to service a senior community of 100, 130,000 people in Florida uh, to deliver urgent pharmaceutical prescriptions. So we're extremely proud to be supporting the COVID uh, response in the US. Um, we do this through a small autonomous aircraft, an autonomous ground station, and then, of course, the cloud infrastructure that connects all of these systems together. Uh, so safety, security, and reliability are kind of our primary concerns, our highest priorities in our business. Of course, we're flying autonomous robots over the public. Um, so finding a partner and, and technology infrastructure that allow us to fulfill those three primary requirements was fundamental to uh, the success of our product. That's awesome. So you, you've got a few moving parts. You've got these, you know, drones that are flying around. They need to land safely. Um, what what technologies are you using from Cisco? Because I also have to imagine all of this has to be simple, right? It has to work just first time, right out of the box. Absolutely. So so Cisco really helps us with our one of our primary pieces of the product, which is the ground infrastructure. So. Uh, the drones fly around and then they land on these autonomous robots that actually the, the drone will land on it and then will pass the payload into these boxes. Kind of think of them as kiosks. Um, and like you said, security and reliability are very important, but simplicity is key as well. Uh, we're deploying this grounded infrastructure to outdoor environments. They're not inside of a building. So our IT folks are not going to be there when, when this ground infrastructure is installed. So remote access and remote management of that ground infrastructure is huge. So we're using the Cisco Meraki systems for our security appliances. This allows for secure communication to our mission control centers, but it also allows kind of a plug and play, flip on a switch, and then we can configure that infrastructure remotely from our mission control center. So that was absolutely key. And you're using a lot of cloud technologies like Meraki. And I can see, unlike Brian, you're in the office, uh, but you're still using a lot of cloud technologies to keep your business up and running, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So Cisco is, is powering our entire office. We're, we're a little bit lucky that um, uh, because we're in the healthcare space and we're doing healthcare logistics, Santa Clara County has deemed us an essential business. So although uh, some of us are here because we have manufacturing, 
a significant percentage of our of our workforce is still working remote. Anybody that can do that effectively is working remote. Um, and again, the the infrastructure that we have through Cisco allows our team remotely to get in. You know, built-in VPN is a is a beautiful thing, and it makes it so simple with Meraki. We don't. We're a very small company. There's 65 of us. We don't have a huge IT team, and uh, it's great that we can power our entire IT network infrastructure with one person plus myself on the side helping configure all this stuff. So it really is simple, simple equipment to work with. Paul, all the best to you and to Matternet. You guys are, are doing some phenomenal work, not just in the technology space, but like literally saving lives every day. So uh, really appreciate what you guys are doing and thank you again for your business. All the best. Thanks, D.D. So you've just moved to a new office. There's probably a long list of things you need to tackle from the furniture to the shade of paint to the office supplies. But to get your business up and running quickly, you need a new network, one that securely connects you to your suppliers, your employees, and of course, your customers. And it's got to be easy to set up because you have little or no IT expertise. With a thousand things to do, you don't want to spend too much time with complex configurations or worry about low performance and security. It's got to work perfectly right out of the box with plug-and-play Wi-Fi access for your employees and secure internet connectivity for your customers. Your business depends on it. One bad customer experience can impact your reputation and a single security breach can put you out of business. Cisco can help. The largest businesses on the planet run on Cisco networks. Now we're bringing the same solution to you. It sets up in minutes and it comes with bulletproof security right out of the box. Ready for any device, any application, any user. You can manage it yourself with your mobile device or opt for the cloud and have someone manage it for you. Either way, our pricing and licensing are straightforward. And since you don't have time to worry about IT issues, we've also included 24-7 support. Cisco designed new office setup, right-sized, right-priced, and designed to expand as your business does. Let's talk. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So in conclusion, I want to go back to the question I asked at the top of this session, which is about the new normal, what the new normal is going to look like. So let's start with the most basic aspect of working, which is the office. And in the past, the office would be a physical location, but now we know an office is wherever we work from. So our house becomes our office. In fact, the picture that you're seeing, it's got several members of my team and we're high-fiving each other after the completion of a successful project, all sitting in our homes with our pets right next to us, with a baby, some of us holding a baby in our, in our laps. But this is what the modern definition of the office or the, of, or the workplace is going to look like. And it's beyond just the collaboration equipment like WebEx. You need Duo, you need Umbrella, you need AMP, you need solutions like Meraki and Cisco Business to give you that end-to-end -end experience of that secure remote work experience. Let's talk a second about competition. And yes, you will still have competition, but the unfortunate truth is we're all going to be competing with the bad guys, with the hackers. Turns out 60% of small businesses that get attacked with a cyber crime do not make it past six months. They have to shut down. And so with multiple layers of defense where technologies, again, like Duo and AMP, firewalls, Meraki MX, all working together, will keep your environment, will keep your data safe. Let's look at what's gonna happen to shopping. Well, in the past, shopping was about bringing more foot traffic into your physical location. And while we still want a lot of customers, but it, it's going to change in terms of maintaining safe social distancing between all of the shoppers in your store. And that's where you need technologies like the Meraki Vision Camera that are counting the number of people in your store, the number of people on aisle five, and how close they are to each other. And if they are not maintaining social safe distance, you get alerted and you can take some corrective action. And finally, let's look at the future of IT. And I believe you will see a lot more do-it-yourself IT. 
Solutions that are simple to deploy, simple to install, simple to troubleshoot. Because as we went through this pandemic, all of us, a lot of us, had to take on the functions of IT because we couldn't have on-site IT support helping us out. So you're looking for solutions that can be managed with the simplicity of a mobile application. Sitting in your bedroom, you're managing your infrastructure that's in the cloud. And so that's what the new normal is going to look like. All right, so this is what I want you to do next. Go to Google and type Cisco COVID and click on the first link. And you're going to get a wealth of information about limited time offers, free offers that we're enabling for our small business customers, for WebEx, for security, for Meraki, for networking. Please do take advantage of some of these offers that are available right now. There's a lot of resources for customers like yourselves. If you've got a question, there's a large community that can help you. Chances are, if you're running into a problem, somebody else has already run into the problem. There are tips about secure work from home or remote work that we'd love for you to go take a look, learn from some of the other customers that are also going through what you're going through. And for all of you partners out there, there are tons of resources around certification, around training, and around the partner community that you can take advantage of. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you for your business. Stay safe, stay healthy. You never know what to expect when running a small business. And even though you can't see the challenges ahead, you can be prepared for the future with a partner that puts your goals first. Your technology should be working as hard as you do, using simple, flexible, and secure solutions so you can worry less about what's to come and refocus on what's important now. By keeping it simple, we remove the complicated approaches to tech so you can have more time with your customers. By being flexible, with a full portfolio of adjustable features that can change as you grow. And by staying secure, we protect you from cybercrime so you can confidently keep your business online. The potential for your small business is endless, and we look forward to seeing where the future takes you because we're here to keep you prepared, smartly and safely, so your business can always keep moving forward. In the last session, we discussed the top five IT challenges for small businesses, which include working from home, cybercrime protection, always on business, keeping your business on throughout this pandemic, workplace monitoring, and how the future of the new office is about creating productivity and security in shared workplaces and physical locations. So we just want to remind you guys that there are surveys available after each session. We want to hear what you think, so please complete the surveys. Please check out the WebEx Teams room for Q&A. And Stephanie, could you tell us what's coming up next? Yes, you guys are in for a treat. Up next is all about customer experience. It's called Collaborative Intelligence and Future Innovations, How Cisco CX Accelerates Customer Success. So you'll be hearing from SVP of CX Engineering, Tony Cologne, and VP of CX Experience Design, Pat Tudorananda. They're going to chat about speeding up transformation for customers by powering people, fueling ideas, and developing new ways of working. As always, get involved in the live Q&A, also on the WebEx team space after the session is over. We're going to throw it over now to Cisco TV's own Steve Moulter to tell us more. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. We have got such a great 50 or so minutes ahead of us. We're going to look at Cisco CX now, how we are accelerating customer success. We're going to bring this piece to you in two different segments. We're going to begin with Tony Cologne and Pat Titarananda, who are going to look at collaborative intelligence and future innovations. Then for the second part, We'll bring in Chris Rittler and we'll take a look at how CX is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to reduce your operational risk. Cisco is really uniquely positioned right now to support you, to support your transformation goals, your investment with us, with Cisco. It comes with over 35 years of innovative leadership. We have got more support for more devices than any brand out there in the world, more expert ability to gather and assess the data from all of those new devices. 
And then we give you total life cycle support on every front. All right, so as I said, part one, collaborative intelligence. This is one of our most exciting new announcements here at Cisco Live. Collaborative intelligence is really core to the CX mission of accelerating your path to business value. We're talking everything from powering your people to fueling new ideas, new ways of working. So Tony and Pat, they're going to show how your insights inspired our CX team to create a compelling new experience. We listen to you. We learn from you how to best serve you at every stage of your technology journey. So we'll kick this off with Tony. Tony is going to focus on how the collaborative intelligence approach and our suite of CX success tracks solutions are speeding up your transformation. He's also going to show you our plans for a marketplace to extend the value of rich data analytics embedded in the platform. Tony is really excited to bring up Pat. She's going to demonstrate CX Cloud. This is our personalized portal that connects you to the right expertise, the right learning, the right insights, always at the right time. If you use CX Cloud, you move really quickly from onboarding new products to delivering the value that you need for your business continuity and agility. All right, you've heard plenty from me. We need to get this underway. Tony, if you're all set, let's send this over to you. Thank you, Steve. My name is Tony Colon. I'm calling in from my home office in Chicago, Illinois. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about collaborative intelligence. This is my third Cisco Live, and it's been about a year since I joined Cisco. While we're not able to meet in person, I'm really excited to introduce you to our new service offerings here at from CX. I lead the engineering and product incubation teams here at Cisco. And as Steve said, we've been on a journey listening, learning, and really innovating side by side with you, our customers and partners on this new innovation. The last few months, we can all agree, it's a new way of working. Some people may call it the new normal. I'm just calling it, you know, digital disruption. It's really changing how we work. You know, when I think about what happened during 9-11, that changed the way we traveled. Now, if you think about the, what's happening now, this is gonna change the way we work. It's a big disruption that's requiring us to be more agile and forcing us as a company, as a community, to really focus on things that matter and the critical needs around the world. We're acting on your priorities, not ours. The Cisco investment that you're asking us to do as a service and cloud models so we can better align with the shifting demands of this new normal. And from talking with you, our customers and our partners, you're really fueling our development process. As Steve said, we have a rich history of innovation. Cisco built the internet. This innovation was all based on your insights. Now, not only are we gonna have the insights, we're gonna have them personalized. We're gonna focus on use cases. Use cases for Cisco really means the language of the customer. How can we align the whole company around terms like network onboarding, software image management? These are all things that you've asked us to focus on, not a DNA appliance or a Cat 9K. That's Cisco's language, and we'll continue to create new names and, and brands. But how does it apply to your outcomes? We're also focused on faster onboarding. We're going to really be focused on measuring every second, every minute, that it takes to deploy and adopt our products. And what that's gonna allow us to do is provide more insight to our amazing support organization called the TAC to do better problem solving. And then how can that feed into a digital experience where you don't have to always call Cisco or a partner to get that level of support. Now, how are we doing that? I'd like to introduce you to our success portfolio. Many of you may have seen a similar slide, maybe if you're at Cisco Barcelona, or Cisco Live US, we've definitely started to talk about this in a different way. Essentially what CX is, is combining all the resources that we have within the company that's driving your success and adoption post sales. All of that is scaled via our partners. So if you look at these five uh, pillars, we've got support, we provide guidance, we provide enablement, we provide assistance, and we also have a service that we, we will operate your network for you. What this means is you have five pillars to choose. Some customers choose one, some customers choose three, 
and then other customers choose all five. That is completely your preference. What has been missing in our portfolio is the CX Cloud. The CX Cloud is really tapping into all of this intelligence that I've talked about. It's tapped into 35 years of intellectual property that we have within the company, and it's providing in a digital way. And how is that going to be delivered? It's going to all be delivered in the concept of success tracks. Success tracks, if you think of them, are a container of use cases. So if I'm deploying a new branch, what are the five or six things I need to do? If I'm deploying a campus, what are the four to six things I need to do? If I'm worried about security, how do I protect my network from the edge all the way through internal attacks? All of this is going to be delivered and driven by our success tracks. The other thing I'd like to talk about is sort of what's next. Everything that I've shown you here is what's available uh, soon, and I'll talk about dates at the end. But essentially what I really want to highlight is also what next. Not only are we an engineering team, we're an incubation team. So what's next is really this new DevNet marketplace. Many of you know and love our DevNet portfolio. We've got developer.cisco.com, we've got the code exchange, and we have the automation exchange. Depending on where you're at as a developer on Cisco, you may go to different places within DevNet. What we're now introducing is this marketplace. That marketplace is your repository for code and APIs. And all of this is meant to complement the CX Cloud, which is really tapping into that data and intelligence that we will have. Here, you'll be able to review APIs if you are a success track user. You'll also be able to see some of the applications that have been developed over the last 35 years by Cisco, and also some of the tools we have in place. Many of you have asked for, allow me to integrate to my ServiceNow or ITSM instance, and that will be available here. And then the flexibility will be that this will be available to Cisco, our partners, and our customers to be able to create, modify, and upload new apps and APIs. But I don't want to forget the, the real star of this show is going to be CX Cloud. CX Cloud is our one-stop shop for everything Cisco. It is our unified digital experience that we're launching today. I could not be more excited about this launch. It has required every single person at Cisco to really drive the future. And with that, I'd like to welcome Pat Titrananda, who's going to talk through and give a demo, a live experience of our CX Cloud. As Tony mentioned, my name is Pat Titrananda, and I am currently leading the experience design team. For the purpose of this demo, I am going to assume the role of a network engineer. As a network engineer, CX Cloud is my go-to destination, giving me the knowledge, the training, the support, and also insights that I need to be successful in my job. When I log into CX Portal, I see the screen. I can navigate um, using the success track dropdown from campus network to collaboration, to data center, and also to security. In this case, because I just purchased campus network, I'm gonna go ahead and pick that option. For the adopt cycle tile, what I see is my checklist. The checklist contains a series of steps that guide me through how to be successful at onboarding this new product, Campus Network. Now, if I get stuck at any point, I can leverage a wealth of um, learning resources and information on the right-hand side. I can take advantage of the communities such as Success Track Community or Cisco Community and post my questions and get answers very quickly there. I can decide to watch a video from um, Ask the Expert section. I can even register for multiple sections of, of webinars that will become available to me. There are also success trips, learning, and um, learning labs that I can leverage. I can even sign up um, for a one-on-one -on -one session with a Cisco expert through the accelerators. Now, once I've completed all the steps that are required to onboard my new product, the system will forward me to the next phase in the life cycle, which is implement. When I am moved to the implement phase, 
all of the data on the right hand side of the screen gets updated and the information is updated specifically to be relevant to the phase that I'm in. So I'm always presented with information in the context what I, of what I need to do. Now let's go to the asset and coverage tile. This is where I get to see all of the assets that I have purchased in one place, whether it be a tabular format or a map view. And you can also view your assets on the map itself. Clicking on one of the sites, you will get a list of all the assets that you manage for that site. Now for each site, there is 360 degree information about this asset itself, starting with OS version, support contract, the physical location of this asset, as well as the logical location, which shows a simple topology of how the asset is connected. There's also information about end of life and any advisories that have been reported against the asset. Here, you can also run a scan or open a case if you're having some problems with this device. Now let's take a look at the next tile, which is advisories. For advisories, I only will not get the information about security advisories alone. I also would get information about field notices and also bugs. Here, for the first time, I get a view of how my network will be impacted, as well as all of the assets that are most at risk. Now, what about all the existing cases and RMAs? By using problem less solution tile, I see a snapshot of all the cases that have been open. Now, I can use the visual filter in the middle of the screen to further narrow this list down to the assets that I care about the most. So for example, I can use the filter on the left-hand side, which is status, to click particularly on customer pending with severity S1. By doing this, the system helps narrow it down to the most important assets that I have to take action on very quickly and very easily. Now, if I want to create a new case, what I can do is to use the global search on the top. I can simply start typing in the serial number then I would get more summary detail information right away about that particular asset. I can click get help with device and start typing the issue description. As I start typing, CX Cloud would immediately provide me with recommendations. Now what's cool about this is the recommendations are based on advanced AI and ML suggestions, bringing data from multiple sources, including TAC cases, community threads, and also product documentation. Now, if I can't find the resolutions that I'm looking for, I can still go ahead and open a case. Now, with this case open action, not only will the steps that have been taken so far and all the information that I've entered be included in the case automatically, the available log files here also will be attached automatically to the case, making it very easy and very efficient for me to get my problems resolved. Let's go back to the main um, CX Cloud screen. In this screen, let's go over the last tile, which is the insights tile. Here, if I were to click on one of the software groups, which is profile one, I will have an opportunity to select from the comparison table the software recommended software version that I should be upgrading to. This comparison table is again using AI and ML to present me with different attributes that are relevant to me. Some of the attributes include the risk scores, which I can compare, the number of bugs for each of the um, software versions, and also security advisories. Based on all these different attributes and information, 
I can simply click accept to select the version that I want to move forward with. By doing so, the software recommended version will then be saved as a golden image, which is then automatically pushed to the controller. That easy step is gonna save me quite a bit of time. So these are some of the features that we are going to make available as part of CX Cloud release. There will be many, many more features to come and we're really interested in hearing your feedback. And that is um, the end of our demo. Thank you for listening and back to you, Tony. Thank you, Pat. As you've seen with CX Cloud powered by the collaborative intelligence, everything you need to onboard and drive and accelerate your success is right at your fingertips. We could not be more excited to actually launch this today with a general availability date of June 19th. Now we have all the success tracks that you've seen. We're gonna tie those back to the use cases and all the individual intellectual property that we have. Through success tracks, you'll be able to drive your own journey across your Cisco adoption lifecycle. From your partners to Cisco, and account managers, we're all bringing this to life in this new digital experience that we're calling CX Cloud. I could not be ex more excited to launch this today with all of you virtually. And we are now gonna make this generally available, as I said, later this month. And with that, we're also working on our DevNet Marketplace. So any of you that have feedback or interest, feel free to reach out to our feedback team. And with that, I'd like to hand it back All right, welcome back everyone. Let's continue our discussion on Cisco Collaborative Intelligence and look at how we've evolved Cisco technical support. We're gonna hear from Ronnie Ray, VP of CX Product Management. He's gonna walk us through Cisco solution support. And after that, VP Chris Rittler will talk about machine learning and AI and how it can reduce your operational risk. So as always, get involved in the Q&A. You can go to the WebEx teams afterwards. Enjoy, and we will see you right afterwards. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you around the world. I'm Ronnie Ray, VP of Product Management and the Customer Experience Division in Cisco. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about how technology has evolved and why your technical support should evolve with it too. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about Cisco solution support. Perhaps you'll agree with me that the network today is light years from its origins. Gone are the days when you had a single product networking solution like a live stack of switches in your closet or your data center rack, and you are accessing that with CLI and managing it box to box. Today's network is much more complex. It's not only distributed in terms of infrastructure, there are multiple layers in the stack today. Hardware is just one of them. So if I look at the picture on the right, and if you look at the bottom layer, clearly your network is transcending your switches, your routers, your wireless controllers, you have IoT devices that might be within the enterprise or outside the enterprise, and of course security and meshed into that. All of this hardware infrastructure is then interacting with the software layer, which includes your network controllers, your orchestration software that's managing across domains. It could be monitoring and visibility software, and of course dashboards that you might be using to manage this complex set of infrastructure. And finally, none of this works on its own. It's all connected back to your entire IT environment and IT ecosystem, which might have other third-party hardware and software. It might have a ticketing system or IT service management system. It might have analytic software. And of course, pieces of management layers that are working in your environment, in the private cloud, in the, pri in the public cloud, and all of them interconnected and operating in unison to give, give your network uh, the capability it has. Now, the question that comes up is, how do you support troubleshoot such a multi-product and multi-vendor solution? Clearly, the situation that you find yourself today might be that you are the customer in the middle trying to do the isolation and doing the triage in this process. For example, let's say there's a problem that comes up in your network. The first question that comes up is where is the problem located? So you might be getting together your team, getting into a war room, and trying to triage, you know, where is, what's the root cause? What's the primary cause? 
And if you make the determination to some degree of confidence, you might be calling a technology provider to check with them and get their help. They might look into the stack and say, yep, I mean, this might be, there might be some issues, but this doesn't solve the whole issue. And you might need, need, need to call a second vendor or a third vendor. As you start doing this, you encounter engineers on those product uh, support teams that know their individual product very well. But they don't know the big idea of the whole solution or the big picture, if you will. And as you're also doing this, you are then pulled into the coordination of across multiple teams, trying to transfer information from one to the other, and in the middle, trying to look at and work out the interoperability of a very complex system. Because no single product support team is accountable for managing this multi-vendor, multi-product situation. Clearly, this is a lot of time and a lot of effort that you put into it. And maybe this is not what you want your team to do because they have other high priority issues to attend to. So if you were looking at that situation and if you wanted to get to a much better situation yourself, what we want to propose to you is that there's a new kind of support that's now available that can get this headache off your mind. And that is Cisco solution support. So the first thing that you will notice in this picture is not you in the center that's trying to triage all of the issues, understand all the interconnected pieces, but it is Cisco that kind of takes on the kind of centralized support across your solution. Cisco brings together the hardware expertise, your solution and architecture expertise, the software expertise, not just in our capabilities and our products and our offerings, but also across our Solution Support Alliance partner vendor chain, so that we can now understand the interoperability and bring in our extra expertise to kind of look at and troubleshoot various parts of the stack all together in, in the, within the same support sessions. So essentially the transference that happens is you being in the middle to now Cisco being in the middle, and you're able to now call Cisco as your primary point of contact. And Cisco is able to give you a priority response so that you can stay focused on your business and leave the complex issues to us and stay with your peace of mind and focus on the things that you need to work on. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. Solution support is actually faster than product support at an individual level at every step. For example, case openings, there's no triage required when you when you start looking at solution support. In terms of case handling, instead of looking at and waiting at, you know, for a longer length of time and going product by product, when you call in with solution support, you get prioritized over single product cases. You also, we also have a much higher level of SLA with a 30 minute objective for solution support and multi-vendor issue management is taken care of through a formalized process. So what happens when you call Cisco? Essentially, solution support frees up the staff time that is spent in doing additional work outside of a specific issue and increases your team's productivity. And this is from a customer directly talking to IDC as they did the study for us in a getting customer input and how they were getting benefited with solution support. So how does the picture get transformed? If you have any of these concerns, which support team do I call in a complex scenario where there are multiple layers of the stack that could be interacting with each other, and you, do, you might not know where to start with to get an issue resolved. When you have multi-vendor solutions that requires greater levels of internal expertise that you might have in your, in, a, uh, in your environment, and you need more experts to kind of work with you, uh, clearly there is a need for that that could be uh, fulfilled from that perspective. When you don't have enough resources that are available to address these problems. They might have the expertise, but they don't have the time. Uh, certainly, that could be an area of concern for you. And finally, if you are looking at contacting all of these multiple vendors and multiple products, uh, you would probably go through a support process that's pretty varied. And therefore, think about you know, trying to come up with the contracts and the serial numbers and everything else, the licenses that you need to share with all these vendors who have all different intake processes and spending the amount of time that's required there instead of being able to you know, do this in a much more harmonious fashion. So how might this work in a Cisco solution support environment? So first off, instead of having to decide which support team do I call, you would call Cisco as the primary point of contact. You wouldn't have to worry about the triage process. You wouldn't have to think about uh, where is this problem located? 
But you could, if, if you have a hunch, that's a good place, good, good, enough, good enough place to start. You could call Cisco and Cisco starts to do the triage for you. Second, even though if you, if you don't have the expertise in, in your organization in understanding these complex interactions across these multiple layers of infrastructure elements, both hardware and software, Cisco brings together the deep architecture expertise and understanding of the overall big picture of your solution so that we can triage for you and coordinate for you across those multiple vendors. Third, you might not have enough resources as we talked about. They might be expert resources available, but they have other tasks on their priority list. So in this case, Cisco takes on the harder work of product support and team coordination across these multiple vendors and offloads it from your team. And finally, instead of having to go through this inconsistent support experience, you can leave it to Cisco with who takes on accountability for multi-product case resolution and multi-vendor case resolution. Now, all of this sounds good, but let's apply it to the real world use case and let's see how that works. For example, if I look at the data center today, the data center has moved from that bare metal uh, on-prem data center to a much more everywhere data center world. Parts of the application today live in your data center. Parts of it might live in the private cloud. Parts of it might live in the public cloud. And you, of course, have multiple points of observability. You might have different ADCs. You might have different workload management software. And of course, management software that's part of that entire infrastructure chain. So in this multi-product, multi-vendor world, it becomes much more imperative that you have a good sense of how to go solve the problem because obviously the problem can be across any of these different layers or different points of failure. So let's say, to make it more real, that there is a problem that comes up where a user calls in and says, hey, there's a I cannot access this application and that is going slow. Now, that could be because there's an issue with the database, but that might not be the only issue. And you know that the session from the application to the database is going through multiple layers. It's going through a network, it's going through Cisco UCS servers, it is of course in a storing data in the storage layer, it is making use of the virtualization layer, and all of this is part of the entire system that is coming together to deliver that application experience. What happens in Cisco solution support is essentially in, from that scenario where you know, you're kind of looking at uh, a lot of pressure in the environment because you know, end users are calling, they are surging, the productivity is slowing down, it's causing delays in business, or maybe there's e-commerce carts that are not being able to be loaded and therefore there's a direct impact on revenue that's happening. From that situation where you know, the issue is obviously escalating, you go to a point where you call Cisco solution support and we are able to take action almost immediately. As the primary point of contact, we could then Get, get the input from you in terms of the initial case that comes in and start looking at all layers of the stack. So for example, we could look into the UCS hardware and might see that there's not a problem that we can see in the hardware itself. But in the OS layer, maybe there's a VLAN tagging that is misconfigured and which is why it's not being able to point to the database correctly. So that misconfiguration once it's taken care of, it definitely improves performance. Now while we do that, we also look at what's happening in the storage layer. We call the storage vendor. And they might look at the problem and say, mm, this is not a problem that comes from the storage layer, but maybe there's some optimizations that can happen in the application parameters uh, that improve the application experience. Similarly, we'll also call the virtualization software vendor that you have. And working with them, they might also realize that there could be configurations that could be done for the virtual CPU usage or the queue length or the storage that could improve the application experience along with in all of the improvements that have been made in the database. As a result as a, of working with all of these multiple vendors, Cisco finally delivers to you something which is a much more improved application experience and not only solving the initial issue, which was in the database, but also being able to optimize across various layers of the stack to get to a point where the ROI is much greater. So put it all in perspective, you know, let's look at some data. So IDC also went out and talked to multiple customers and they came back with these results. And these are telling. Cisco solution support is, provides you 44% faster complex issue resolution versus single product support. And the average ROI, the return on investment to you as a customer was noted to be 213%.
And that's definitely a very good ROI. So if I look at you know, where does solution support apply, it applies across all Cisco domains. So not only are you taking care of your data center, you're taking care of your campus, you're taking care of your, all of your IoT connected devices, all of the security layers that could be on the edge, that could be on the uh, edge of your campus, edge of your cloud. It could be lateral movements that, that are happening within your network. It could be also in the handoff that's happening to a service provider. And of course, network applications like collaboration, and all of those are covered today with Cisco solution support. So a single services offer that covers all of them and really gives you peace of mind in managing your IT infrastructure. So what does solution support contain? Just to take a, in a deeper view. First, silicon solution support is incremental value. So not only are you getting the benefits of typical SmartNet total care that you get with your hardware or your software support, which is included with your software, but it adds all the capabilities of primary point of contact, of the ability to get priority support, of the ability of, uh, to get connected to architecture experts that are looking at the whole solution and bringing it all together, not just across your own owned product sets in a, from Cisco, but also across multiple vendors and all in a way that with a very fast response time. And if you put all of those together, so that is Cisco solution support. So clearly it's a very powerful support medium, right sized and absolutely able to help you as your IT partner in the complex environment that we face today in, in, in our networks, in a, wherever it be in the enterprise or in the handoffs that you do to your partners in the extra net or your service provider or the entire stack as we talked about across multiple architectures. So now that you know a little bit about solution support from uh, this session, I would encourage you to go to Cisco.com go solution support to learn more and let's go. We're going to dive even further into the CX story now. We're going to bring in Chris Rittler. Chris is our VP of Business Critical Services. And Chris is going to show us how Cisco CX is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to reduce your operational risk. Chris has some brand new, really exciting introductions for us here at Cisco Live. Before we welcome Chris, though, we're going to run a short video right now that highlights some of the powerful values that are headed your way. Check out this video. We will be right back with Chris in just 90 seconds. In IT operations, you can't preempt or fix what you can't see. But what if you could gain visibility into the unknown of your network? At Cisco, we understand business continuity. We prevent tens of thousands of disruptions every year. With Cisco Business Critical Services, our experts harness the power of machine learning and predictive analytics to help you see deeper into your organization so you can mitigate risk to optimize your IT infrastructure, maximize the value of existing IT investments, and address IT operations challenges and change planning along the adoption lifecycle, resulting in higher availability, stronger security, and more efficient IT. We deliver business critical services so you can preempt, protect, and defend against the unknown. Find out more today. Cisco Business Critical Services is dedicated to helping customers perform and transform their networks with expertise powered by analytics, insight, and automation. We've got Chris with us to talk about our new Cisco CX success portfolio. This is about the customer experience, so you can accelerate your business outcomes at every step of your lifecycle journey. Chris, we're so glad to have you with us today. Over to you. Hi, my name is Chris Rittler. I'm the Vice President of Business Critical Services here at Cisco CX, and I'm excited that you're joining me for this session today. I'm here to share with you a little bit about how CX uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to reduce your operational risk. 
Recently, I was looking at a survey that indicated what are the real challenges that happen during incidents that create and contribute to operational risk. The first one was data accuracy, really making certain that you had the data that you need at that time to make the right decisions. The second is root cause determination. Really, what are the methods I'm going to use to determine can it, what, what really happened here? And then the third is around the elimination of routine tasks. Routine tasks are a major distractor that end up being part of the cause of incidents. So that data is very interesting because it maps really well to how we experience operational risk and how we handle it here within Cisco CX. You know, we've spent many years supporting our customers, both through our support services as well as our advanced professional services. And over that time, we've developed our own methods, you know, and our own technology in Cisco CX to deal with that. So the first area is around data and benchmarking. Data is the most important component of this. When you have really good data sets, you could do some very interesting analysis and have some very interesting benchmarks. Insights developed by AI and machine learning are at the core of what we do. And then finally, automation and remediation. Adding those steps so that once you have the insights, you can automatically deal with those and remediate the risk is very important. So I'm gonna share more on each one of those. So let's start with data and industry benchmarking. First step is, you know, we need to have access to the data. Who's ever creating these machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms needs access to data. With Cisco, you can be certain that your data is going to be treated securely that it's going to be handled securely for the duration that we have that data. Now, that's an important part. Another important part though, is really when we get that data, what do we do with it? Well, we're always doing data conditioning. Data conditioning is very important to set up all the other good things we do around insights and automation. So this data conditioning gets that data into a state that we can use it in other ways. And one of the ways we use it is industry benchmarking. So benchmarking is taking data sets from similar devices in similar configured networks from similar industries and giving you insights based on that. When you have high quality data and lots of it, you can start doing some very interesting benchmarking. So let's talk about data sets. Anyone who has been involved in AI and machine learning knows that some of the biggest challenge is getting good reference data. The thing that's really exciting about Cisco CX is that we've been working for over 35 years supporting our customers and providing them with professional guidance. And from that, we've collected very complete data sets. This means we have data sets for millions of supported network devices. And we've worked with over thousands of customers on this. When you look at the number of TAC cases that are handled annually by Cisco, you know, it's in the millions. So when you combine all of this data, we have an incredible reference data set, a data set that is unmatched and very difficult for anyone to create on their own. But by working with a partner like Cisco, you can have access to that and the insights that it unveils. So let's give an example of, you know, data and benchmarking. So this chart here is a screen that actually shows PCER and your, and your status on PCER um, maturity and handling. So what we've done is we've actually taken from the same industry data from many customers and we benchmark that for specific devices across this customer's network. What we show on these graphs in the bottom left-hand corner where it says you are here, we're showing where this customer's network compares to other customers 
within the same industry, same industry. So this is like to like. It shows where they stand. They appear to be above average, right? But in security world, being above average, well, that's pretty good, but not good enough. You know, you really want to be best in class when it comes to security. So, you know, they have some ways to go here. You know, this, this also shows them just where they stand relative to their own network, right? So when you think about this now, not only are you looking at the work that you need to do and you think that's important, but you also get to see where I stand up against my industry peers. You know, that's motivating, right? That gets you thinking about how you can drive improvements proactively into your systems. So let's go to the next set. And it's really about insights. This is, this is where AI and machine learning are at the heart of what we do at, at CX. And we really think about it in terms of how can we maximize performance and minimize downtime for our customers. If you think about it over these 35 years, right? The, you know, the Cisco professionals have been working with customers to do exactly that, you know, human to human. They've augmented it with a set of tools we've now integrated into AI and machine learning. What this does now is you can get automatic insights, really based on our algorithms, so that you can see quicker than any human could detect what's going on with the network and much, much deeper than you could, right? We're going so deep into the data to find these insights and to help you with your job. This is how we're helping on the proactive side. It all, our algorithms also provide recommendations, right, on how to remediate any of those actions that are needed. And then finally, you know, it's all about predict, prediction to prevent downtime. So we've built these algorithms using not only the data sets and these great algorithms, but these algorithms are effectively trained by our experts who can bring that, that human capital to bear as well. So let's, let's look at an example of that, right? In this case of, of supervised machine learning, we've taken those fingerprints that, you know, we've accumulated. And these fingerprints are deep data sets where we can see from our TAP cases and from our advanced services work with customers. And we start modeling this, this fingerprint does not have a crash associated with it. This fingerprint does have a crash associated with it, right? When we start doing that, we can now go device by device in your network and start to really lay out what are the crash probabilities. We can also go look, are there other devices in your network that are similarly configured that may be vulnerable as well, right? Our patented technology gives you a device risk score, not only for the devices in your network, but for devices globally. So you can see where you stack up. So you can imagine if one of your devices really stacks up globally as high risk, that's an area where you want to spend time. And this helps you really optimize the time that you are spending addressing some of, your, some of the issues in your network so that you're avoiding incidents. So really the third component is around automation and automation and remediation. And the idea here is the concept of um, taking care of routine operational tasks. So when you're getting these insights, a lot of these insights might not be urgent, right? They might be, they might be activities that are important, you know, that you put in the queue and you're there to work on and when it's convenient, but that consumes time. So what we've really done is we've combined machine learning and our human expertise to automate those repetitive tasks. And this way, when you automatically receive a warning of a probable issue, right, you now can preempt those incidents. And you can even go and start to automatically notify, you know, our attack via via opening cases. This is the type of activity that you can use AI and machine learning based on great data to start to drive automation of your more routine tasks. So a specific example of this is a capability we call automated fault management. 
fairly straightforward. We have the real-time detection happening, right, through our AI and machine learning, but now we put automation in place so that we can open those TAC cases. We could even automate an RMA or a return merchandise authorization. All of that with no human intervention. So now your teams can be off working on the proactive side of the day rather than spending time on routine tasks on the reactive side of their day. So how do we do this? It, again, at the core is the machine learning, but our domain experts who have had to do this task probably millions of times themselves have said, this is how we automate it. Let's, let's automate it and they validate it and they, and they create the signatures around it. They make it so it's very predictive, but it can also be reactive because some tasks are still gonna be reactive and you need to get to them quickly. And via humans being able to program a complex sequence of events, you now can create more sophisticated automation that you might not have been able to do just via machine learning algorithms. Looking at a customer case, a US service provider customer of ours actually used this. And you know, it's it's the classic challenges that that you imagine you can run into every day. You know, they they did not have good network visibility, right? So they needed to get deeper into the network and see what was going on. You know, they were running into downtime and it was a risk that was over their head all the time and it, not only a distraction, but something they had to invest in. And that was leading to operational inefficiencies. And then, you know, they just they they had a delay and a backlog built up, you know, to address issues like RMAs. So they put in automated fault management, which is a combination of the AI and the machine learning plus automation to get the real time detection and to get to that faster remediation. They even automatically opened attack cases all with no human intervention. So they went and implemented this in a complex system with a very large team. The benefits are off to the right here. Improved performance, 80% less time to detect and troubleshoot because somebody's off busy doing something. This made it quicker to get to. They reduced their workload by automating the processes. That made their team happier by getting rid of those mundane tasks. And it turned out to be 30% less effort for case management, which means they had that much more time available to do proactive activities like network optimization or working on an exciting new transformation project. So you've learned about how we look at, you know, data, insights, automation, you know, but, but how do you get this, right? We talk about, we use it here in Cisco CX. Well, we actually make this available to you. You know, at the core of what we do at CX, we have CX Cloud, which is powered by our collaborative intelligence. This is the accumulation of human capital and intellectual capital and IP brought together into a great platform. All of our capabilities support, guide, enable, assist, operate, have access to that platform, CX Cloud. I want to talk about Guide. It happens to be my favorite because it's business critical services. So I'm going to double click on that. So what is business critical services? Business critical services is insights powered by human expertise, right? So our insights come in through our analytics, which we've been talking about, AI and machine learning powered by data, backed by automation, and with our human experts involved. We've created three tiers to make this available to all of our customers. Our essentials tier is meant to help you optimize performance and de-risk your IT team. You know, our Vantage package starts to get more into accelerating technology adoption and transformation. And our Premier package really gives customers the ability to address their changing priorities across all their Cisco solutions. So our goal here was to take really that AI and machine learning that I've been talking about throughout this session and our human expertise and make it available to all of our customers. Key to this is we make it available via our partners. 
So all of this is available from Cisco or our partners. We have a set of capabilities we call add-ons. If you want to do more than those three packages, which are designed to give you those insights on a regular basis, you can add on by adding experts. And those experts could be Cisco experts, or they could be experts from CX specialized partners. These are made up of specialized teams that you can come in and have you help you work on a specific program that you're working on, but they're also agile and flexible. So they can work with you to build your backlog and knock out your backlog so that you can continue to proactively improve your networks. The other point I wanna make here is that these services have been available from Cisco for quite a while. They've honestly been available to our largest customers um, predominantly. By creating these three tiers, we're now making them available to all size customers and they are available across all of our technologies and architectures. So you can benefit from these today. They're available now. So to wrap up the, the session, I want to go back to how we look at lowering operational risk here at Cisco CX. So we focus on the data first and foremost. We build up great data sets. We continue to improve those data sets and we're constantly doing industry benchmarking, which we share with you through our insights generated through AI and ML. And then we've layered on top of that automation capabilities to help further free up your resources. We think these three ways of operating are the best way to de-risk your operations. And we've learned this just by decades of experience. So this presentation hopefully is just the beginning of your journey with me and with the Cisco CX team. We want it to be a collaborative journey, which you can continue online or with a Cisco representative. Go online to cisco.com slash go slash BCS to learn more about business critical services. And let's bring the energy from Cisco Live and continue this collaborative journey together. Plan, explore, connect. Let's go. Thanks for joining my session. Wow, so much great content in this segment. Great inspiration as well. Thank you again to Chris, to Pat, to Tony for helping to bring our Cisco CX story to life so beautifully. Cisco customer experience is here to optimize your solutions at every stage of your life cycle. We have got the right expertise. We've got the right insights. It's all powered by collaborative intelligence and it's designed to deliver your business outcomes faster than ever for enterprise networking and data center and cloud security, collaboration, service provider, everything in between. Cisco CX accelerates your success. We wanna make sure that you check out cisco.com slash CX so you can get all of the details. We'll look forward to talking with you as soon as you are ready to make some amazing things happen. For the entire CX team, I'm Steve Moulter. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you guys are having a great Cisco Live digital experience. It was 4 a.m. on March 17th when my phone rang. It was Honeywell. They made it clear and simple. We need your help. A world in crisis. Health workers and the businesses supporting them were under incredible pressure. That included Honeywell, producers of life-saving N95 masks. So in mid-March, we made the decision at Honeywell, which is a global company, to actually begin to allow our employees to work from home. This was over 110,000 employees working in 83 countries that we had to go fast. So we called Cisco. With business continuity critical, Kimbray called Jim. Hey, Jim. He's a member of Cisco's customer experience team. Hi, Kimbray. Let's pull Lyle in. Their only mission? Customer success. Lyle's a Cisco Global Solutions architect who connects to Santosh, Honeywell's specialist in India. Hey, guys. I can't thank you enough. Within 24 hours, Cisco CX had set up a global team of specialists. As one Cisco team went to sleep, the next team woke up, building Honeywell's next generation work from home platform, literally 
around the clock. And as Cisco finished a piece of work, Honeywell deployed it across their network. Eight days later, 110,000 employees connected, collaborating safely. So then after, once we've enabled the 110,000 employees to be online, our next challenge was to make sure the performance of the network was as good as you'd get in the office. Cisco's security overlay not only protected the system, but knew what traffic was moving in what direction. With split tunneling, Honeywell was able to let business traffic in and keep personal traffic out. Combine that with data center upgrades, and you have global transformation. So if you think about it, if we could do this together in eight days, just think of what we could do together in a year. Between change and transformation, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Awesome. Welcome back, everyone. If you join us in your last session, you just heard from Tony Cologne, Pat Titarananda, Ronnie Ray, and Chris Rittler. We hope you guys are having an amazing day, too. I know that we are, whether you guys are watching, interacting on the, social, the Cisco Live site or on social media. Reggie, I know we're going to be hearing from DevNet Susie Wee pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, what do you love about DevNet? Well, I love how DevNet is our own cooking school. So uh, stay, with, stay with me on this one. So when you think about a cooking school, it's usually a school where chefs come in, they learn about different recipes, they learn how to cook better, uh, how to get their technique going. DevNet's the same thing. We have this school, we have all these recipes, all these great teachers that could teach them how to make what they have better, how to create new things on top of that, new uh, desserts, new, oh my God, I'm getting hungry right now. But they make all these amazing things from DevNet. And DevNet's all about creating a platform for our creators to make applications and innovations for our network. So we're a cooking school. I love that about DevNet. And up next, we have Susie Wee from DevNet. And they're going to be talking about empowering communities and how they are the key to transformation right now. And all the experts in the Cisco ecosystem are so important to the world because they're providing the solutions that we need in businesses today. Like Steph was saying, please don't forget about the surveys. Check out the WebEx Teams room. Please continue to put your tweets and your posts on Instagram, hashtag Cisco Live, and we will see you after the session. Hi there. I'm Susie Wee. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Cisco DevNet and CX Ecosystem Success Group. And today I'm going to talk about accelerating transformation, innovation, and growth using automation and applications. We're clearly at a time in the industry where the technologies that we collectively, as Cisco, as the Cisco ecosystem, including our partners and our customers, the technology that we have is more critical in the world than ever before. And what we know is that these technologies of connectivity, networking, security, collaboration, as you bring all of these things together, it is a time when we can serve the world with the problems that we're having with the pandemic, as we're ensuring business continuity, business growth, and as we're taking a look at just the industry transformation that's taking place now. Let's take a look at what's going on in various industries because it is an entirely new world and this entirely new wor world presents both challenges as well as opportunities for all of us. If we take a look at the world of healthcare, healthcare has changed immediately overnight as hospitals are working together and healthcare professionals are working together to see how do we treat our patients? How can we plan for the load? How can we just support everything that's going on? And as they're doing this, then all of a sudden, the acceptance in the community as well as in business in terms of you know how is insurance refunding doctors and everything like that it's all shifted suddenly telehealth is becoming not only a nice to have but a must have suddenly patients don't want to go to the hospital as much as possible so all of a sudden home health care means so much more and what that represents is a fundamental business shift as well as a fundamental technology opportunity to really provide these types of services like home health care, 
uh, like having hospitals put up pop-up clinics to be able to serve and create temporary healthcare sites to help deal with the loads that we have in front of us. Another area that's going tremendous change is education. What schools had to do in universities was send students home overnight, and then all of a sudden switch their teaching to online teaching. And as they were facing their students in different locations, how can they provide equal access in a great education to all? And with the rush of getting everybody home in the spring, and then now they're going over planning to say, what are we gonna do in the fall? What are we gonna do in the new school year? So there is still certain uncertainty that's behind everybody. But once again, a key is we have technologies that enable the world of hybrid education, You know, whether you're online as well as in the classroom, ways, technologies that'll keep students safe and to keep professionals safe as we're going forward. And this is what the world needs today. It's all the technologies that our Cisco ecosystem uh, has control over. And then the next is the change in retail. So with retail, you can't go into stores as much. And now all of a sudden the online delivery and curbside pickup becomes of tremendous importance. And then the questions that retailers have is how do I keep that customer engagement? How do I keep my close, close ties and the great customer service that I've always had as everybody is figuring out how to navigate this new world? So what happens is underlying all of this are opportunities for how to better serve customers, how to better serve patients, how to better serve students. And as we take a look at the industries together, the key is the underlying connectivity, the networking, security, collaboration, all of these come together in an important way. And what all of you do in our community to serve these areas is really of utmost opportunity. And something that Cisco has done is put together services, so new services that are very focused on our customers, a very customer experience centric service in which we're looking at the problems that our customers are facing. And these are services that can be offered by Cisco or offered by our partners. And what they are are things like virtual education offered by WebEx. So not only are we giving people and letting them have the opportunity to use WebEx, but helping them actually learn to use it in the right way. For secure remote worker, as businesses are working to have a remote workforce, VPN becomes very important. And so how can we quickly help people set up and then handle the loads that are needed to keep business continuity going? And as we look at temporary field hospitals to again, set up those pop-up clinics and those temporary hospitals, which requires providing the connectivity, the networking, the communications, the wireless, everything that the mobile healthcare workers need and the patients need to communicate is really key. And then also, if you look at things like contact center to where you are trying to keep that close relationship with customers, and these all involve combinations of Cisco products together with third party products and software solutions. And much of it requires services delivered by our partners or by Cisco so that the customers, all of you can concentrate on the day job of your business and then having the IT help you get it done. So what happens is this situation shows that now more than ever before, the products and the technology and the services that we offer are now delivering business outcomes even more than before. So as we go to cloud centric worlds, cloud technologies are even more important as we're tying business applications to let people work from home. Once again, super important and how you do this securely. So all of the technology that all of you are involved in is really driving those business outcomes. So now let's take an example of the places where this is really happening. So one area is to take a look at optimizing VPN for remote work at scale. Never did I think VPN was going to become a household word, at least a household word for the different you know, people who are trying to work from home. So people in different industries, whether they're in banking or retail or others, you know, they're trying to do their work from home. And what matters most is their connection into their company's applications. And then what has happened is this VPN has also become an executive conversation. So as the pandemic first hit, Chuck Robbins, our CEO, and his executive leadership team were actually taking a look at daily dashboards of our VPN utilization to make sure that people were home, people were able to get access to the work that they needed, and then looking at the usage to make sure that they were able to uh, have the productivity and have the tools that they need to do their work. And so all of a sudden, 
you have the CEO and executive leadership team looking at IT dashboards for the sake of business continuity. And that's what that tie from the technology to the business that really matters there. And then what happens is a key issue there in VPN is how do you use it most effectively, right? And all of a sudden we know that proving VPN performance is a business enabler. Um, being able sh to be sure that we're doing this securely is really key. And then optimizing the performance to make sure you're not unnecessarily loading your VPN with applications that uh, don't need it is key. So then comes together a technology that we call split tunneling, where what you can do is say, hey, some of the applications that we use are actually cloud applications. They don't need the VPN. So even if someone's connected, you can actually split off that traffic and make that go straight to the cloud and not have that load down your VPN and build that into your system. And that's the example of a technology that enables business. And let me show you a demo of that now. The way we work has changed. More people than ever are working remotely, and they need the same secure, trusted access to their data from remote that they would get in the office. Therefore, fast and reliable VPN access is a must. But what happens when everyone is working remotely? When so much traffic is tunneled over the VPN, capacity is strained, and user experience and productivity begin to suffer. The solution is dynamic split tunneling. Dynamic split tunneling allows you to locally route traffic for services like WebEx, while still tunneling traffic for other secure corporate resources over the VPN. The result is more VPN capacity and better overall user experience. Before we make changes to our production network though, we want to test them. Cisco Modeling Labs provides us a virtual testbed to simulate our production network and safely test proposed changes. Let's see a demo of automating the testing and deployment of dynamic split tunneling for our network. This solution automates the testing, validation, and production deployment of dynamic split tunneling configuration, all with an infrastructure as code-like feel using Cisco Modeling Labs, Python, Ansible, and Docker. All you need to do is edit this YAML file, specify the domains that you would like to exclude from the VPN, as well as some hosts to test the traffic is flowing correctly, and optionally your production firewall configuration if you want that to be deployed into production. Then you fire off the docker.sh script with the dash deploy option, again, to deploy if all the tests succeed, and the script will do the rest. It'll automate the deployment of the topology in Cisco Modeling Labs. And when that topology is running, it will use Ansible to configure the virtual ASA with the desired dynamic split tunneling configuration. When ready, it will prompt us to connect in with any connect so that the tests can begin. We can log in as our home user into any connect into the virtual topology, and then the script will conduct tests will do trace routes to confirm that the traffic is flowing correctly. Some hosts we want to make sure are not VPN tunneled, that they go directly to the host, while others we want to make sure are tunneled. When all the tests have passed, the script will clean up after itself in CML, and then if desired, push that same configuration into production so you get all the benefits of dynamic split tunneling. Check out this use case and more by visiting us developer.cisco.com slash automation. Thanks. So as you can see from that, what we're doing is enabling VPN utilization. We're actually also using the powers of programmability and automation and providing developer tools that are allowing you to model how is the performance going to happen as you implement split tunneling into your network? You know, what are going to be the implications and how well can it do? And you can use Cisco Modeling Labs as a tool to basically model it before you deploy it and then ensure that your deployments work well. So an important way to use the power of technology to enable those business outcomes. Now let's take a look at another area, which is once again, the importance of businesses to create that human connection with their customers, especially in this world where it's not as easy to get face to face. 
And so the business outcome is, of course, that, you know, retailers, for instance, as well as any business wants to keep a very close relationship with their customers, you know, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in anything else. And so what happens is to create that human connection, you know, as you log into a healthcare page and as you're trying to get advice, then you want to be able to have that intimacy, to be able to give that trust, to have that connection. And what happens is that we can look at technologies like WebEx, both WebEx Teams, as well as using WebEx Video, to be able to create that connection. And with that technology, what we have are WebEx widgets and WebEx APIs that can be embedded into a mobile application or into a web page so that you can create that connection, find an opportunity to chat, find an opportunity to have a business video call, face-to-face -face video call, as the customer is going about their journey and shopping for what they need. So let's take a look at a video that brings together this business outcome of creating that human connection together with the technology that's enabled with WebEx. As industries are changing, businesses have been using digital integrations to get things done from anywhere in the world. With Cisco WebEx Teams, you can use APIs and integrations to easily customize your existing processes and work streams. Connect with your customers directly by embedding video chat into your website, allowing customers to talk to a live representative with one click. Bring video calls and messaging natively into your applications with just a few lines of code. Create human connections for your business. Next, David Stout, who is a principal engineer on the DevNet team, is going to walk us through how to embed the code you need to enable these features for your applications. Hi there, this is David Stout talking to you today about embedding WebEx collaboration features into existing applications using the WebEx Teams widget SDK. What is a widget, you might ask? Good question. Essentially, it's an HTML element that hosts a portion of the WebEx Teams uh, browser client within its borders. This HTML element is easy to embed in existing websites um, in pretty much any way your web designers might like to do it. For example, take uh, this financial services site that would like to provide uh, high quality face-to-face -face collaboration features between customers and financial specialists uh, when clicking on these ask buttons here at the bottom. What we can do uh, is create a small pop-up page widget JWT uh, and paste in our widget HTML code. We just need a couple pieces of information uh, to make this video call happen. Uh, essentially a WebEx Teams API access token for the person making the call uh, and simply the WebEx Teams ID of the person that will be receiving it. Using the WebEx Teams guest issuer feature, applications can dynamically create these guest issuer tokens. Uh, so that uh, end users don't have to sign up for WebEx, have a WebEx account, uh, or even know they're using the WebEx cloud. With a few lines of code on the server side, uh, using JSON web tokens, uh, you can embed a unique piece of information about the customer, for example, their user ID or account number, uh, into the JWT, securely sign it with your guest issuer token, and then inject that token back into the uh, HTML dynamically uh, using our web framework. That way, when Jane Doe logs into our site uh, and clicks on the button for Ask John, it can pop up that HTML page window, uh, download and instantiate the collaboration features, and start a web call. Hi there. Pretty cool. And that's it. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing ways that you can embed WebEx collaboration into your applications. So as you can see from that video, that's really a way to just naturally embed a, a customer engagement tool, a face-to-face -face, as well as a chat-based customer engagement together as the customer is in the middle of their journey and as they need your help. 
So great tools by using technology, using programmability and APIs to be able to create the experience that your customers need. And for both of those examples, we have them on DevNet, we have learning labs around them, we have the sandbox, we have code. So you can actually get to Automation Exchange and start to use the code to do these things and learn how to do them quickly. So next, the other thing that's really important is that as all of us collectively are working to improve the customer experience for the businesses, whether you work in a business as a customer and you're trying to serve your customers, whether you're a partner who's really trying to help your customers in the industry that they're in. What happens is, of course, it's important to look at what IT and what our technology enables, but also to have that vertically relevant solution that really solves the business problem at hand is key. And so what we have is a way to create those vertical solutions by looking at and working with our DevNet Solutions Plus partners. And what these are are software vendors that have created solutions using APIs into Cisco technology to create a solution that's very relevant to a particular domain uh, for a particular industry. So now let's take a look at how we're accelerating skills. So there are new skills that are needed in programmability, automation, and application development that come to bear in how we can then go and help your businesses, how you can help your businesses, how partners can help your customers, their customers with their businesses. And really, if we take a look at what we were talking about initially, is accelerating innovation, transformation, and growth. I know it seems like a hard time to be thinking about that. On the other hand, transformation and innovation, now is the time to do it. There's just not a better time to do it. And what we're finding is that the companies that have started a digital transformation journey have certainly been in better situations to deal with the agility, with all the changes that are needed as they dealt with the pandemic. And so those who already started in a digital transformation journey were able to reap the rewards of that and then be agile enough to serve their customers. So now if we take a look forward, then even if you haven't started your digital transformation journey, now is a great time to start. And in order to do all of it, whether you're starting or whether you're advanced in it, is that we have DevNet that's been helping you to the skills that you need, help you develop the skills that you need, as well as certify them. And let's talk now more about this. So we were really excited to, in January, announce the DevNet 500 that would go along with the new DevNet certifications that were gonna be launched on February 24th. And what we said is that, you know, we have the new DevNet certifications, the DevNet Associate, DevNet Specialist, and the DevNet Professional. And we said in January that the first 500 people to get certified, we would name as being in the DevNet 500. And we didn't know how long it was going to take. We didn't know how many people would be ready to get their certifications. And we we're very excited because after that February 24th release, within 16 days, our community came forward and hit the DevNet 500. So people ran out and got certified on the very first day that the certification was available. And then they kept on going and going. They're still going through today. And so what happened is that, you know, we were very excited you know, very relieved to see the excitement in the community for these certifications. And we built them because our community asked for them. They said, we're learning about automation. We're learning about programmability. Give us credit. And they certainly showed up. And by thank you all, because you certainly achieved your DevNet 500. Now, if we take a look at what's going on in the industry, what happens is what's so important is this combination of skills and this combination of expertise that makes us be able to handle the demands of business today. So if we take a look at the engineering skills that are needed, you know, again, how do I build out my network? How, how do I do this in a, in a great way that can scale and be mission critical? And then how do I have the software skills so that I can automate, so that I can add applications, so that I can you know, use DevOps workflows and really tie applications into the infrastructure in a reliable way. And another part that's really important is security. So how can I ensure that I am safe from cyber threats? How can I ensure that we're creating a secure security from the infrastructure ground level going forward? And what we know is that we have certifications, engineering certifications ranging up to the CCIE. We have the new DevNet certifications, which are showing the software side. 
and I'm happy to present the new Cisco certified CyberOps certifications. And this is really for security operations teams so that they can prevent, detect, and respond to cybersecurity threats. And so the Cisco uh, certified CyberOps, the Cis uh, associate certification is available now and the CyberOps professional will be available in the next few months. So we're happy to present both the CyberOps Associate and the CyberOps Professional certifications for all of you. And uh, we believe that this combination of engineering, software, and security are really critical for moving forward in the industry. The other thing that we've created is the brand new DevNet specialization for partners. And what we recognize is that there is an entirely new skill set that's needed to be able to deliver and fully utilize the capabilities of the network and the programmability and the automation and the APIs at hand. And there are a set of partners that have been investing in this and building up these skills so that they can deliver these solutions to our customers. And many of them are already delivering these solutions, and then some are training up to be able to do it. And so the new DevNet specialization recognizes those partners that are able to show their capabilities in the software automation and programmable world. So the DevNet specialization, in order to meet the criteria, it, it has some work. So, uh, and we intended it to be that way because it has meaning. And so what happens is there's three parts to earning the DevNet specialization. First, you need to show an amount of uh, software capability within your people. So we want to ensure that there's a number of DevNet certified people within uh, the partner itself. And then there's a number of processes to be able to show that you have a network automation or an automation practice in your field to make sure that you can deliver software in these different areas. And then there's actually tests to use the DevNet sandbox to show that you're able to you know, use code and operate in these different domains as needed. So that validation is happening. In addition, we're also requiring that they show some that these DevNet specialized partners show some customer wins and already have experience in delivering these types of solutions with their customers. There's two levels, a DevNet specialized as well as a DevNet advanced level of partner specialization. And this indicates whether your specialization is in one domain or crosses multiple domains. Once again, both are very important to our customers. So we're very excited about the partners who have asked us to create the DevNet specialization and those who are jumping in to now earn it. And let me show you uh, two of our first DevNet specialized partners and some quotes that have come from people in their area. So let me show you Brad Haas from Presidio as he talks about the value of the DevNet specialization to Presidio. He says, the new DevNet specialized designation has increased awareness in the community as well as given us validation of our software and automation practice. Automation brings us better consistency and standardized configurations for customer engagements, and with consistency comes better reliability as a whole. I wanna thank Brad and the Presidio team because they've been investing in automation and programmability and building up their skills together with the community, and they have jumped in to earn that DevNet partner specialization. And now a word from Marcus Lind from Miradot, so the CEO of Miradot, and what he says is being a DevNet specialized partner proves we have the right automation focused skills and processes in place to build a foundation for gaining new customers trust. By getting this designation, we're also able to attract talent in a world where talent is sought after. Congratulations to Marcus and the Miradot team. And when I look at this quote, what it reminds me of and just shows is the fact that we know that there's people out there who want to work for software companies. DevNet specialized partners are software companies. They have the capabilities, they deliver the solutions, they get to fully use the tools of the automation and programmability of Cisco's products and deliver that to our customers. So now let's say, how can we all continue our journey? And I'm pleased to present that we have put together our digital learning assets together online to help you further advance your careers and be successful in your businesses. So again, I'm just really thankful for everything that all of you in our community have done and how we together have worked as a community, as part of the Cisco ecosystem to really solve our customers' problems, 
to really solve business problems and make the most using the technology and the knowledge and expertise that we all have. My ask for you is to really make today about learning, to be able to really be bold, and I know it's hard, but really be bold to accelerate transformation, accelerate innovation, and accelerate growth, even during these uncertain times. It's those who really accelerate and ride out of this in a most positive way who are gonna be most successful. I want you to continue to build your skills and build your team skills at advanced.cisco.com. We work really hard to make sure that you have access to these resources in a digital way so that you can continue to learn at the pace and at the speed and scale that you need. And we want you to register for DevNet Day. So on Thursday, we are offering DevNet Day, a day specific to make sure that we have the new APIs, that we have the new platforms, that we're bringing our community together to celebrate, to learn, and to see everything that's new so that once again, we can work together to accelerate our digital transformation journeys. Thank you for everything that you've done. I really look forward to continuing our work together, continuing to meet your needs, and continuing to grow together and be successful as a community together. Thank you. Welcome back, you guys. I am sad to say that we are already at the end of our day two, but thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure for me and I'm sure for Reggie as well. Don't forget, session surveys are in the app. DevNet Day is tomorrow and On Demand Library is tomorrow as well. That's a wrap for our programming on the Innovation Channel, but the show's not over, not by a long shot. Head over to the Possibilities Channel right now to catch a couple of big performances dedicated to you, our IT heroes. Bye, guys. Bye.